Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku possessed a chainsaw quirk part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. A nauseating cacophony cleaves through her tympanum, shredding the eardrum. It's a sensory phenomena of chaotic sound that pierces her ears. The visceral noise is so jarring that it continues to ring in her ears even after they've been ruptured. She'll never forget the obstreperous fortissimo for as long as she lives. She'll always remember the wet warmth of a liquid touch when she tries cupping her ears in a futile attempt to muffle the pandemony. She will forever see the crimson color of blood on her hands after holding them out in front of her to see why they had become so damp. The poor girl shall know better than anyone else what hell's gates sound like when they screech open for the devil to come out and play. Born with a quirk that grants her organic ear jacks, Kyo Kajiru earned her placement as one of UA's entrance examinees. The hero school candidate had rushed into the physical portion of the test filled with mim vigor. There had been a level of confidence only defined as young nativity. She was all ears when listening to the rules, so she had expected taking out mechanical faux villains to be a cakewalk. It wasn't so easy. Suddenly, the earth shattered, fracturing her valor at the same time. Plates began to shift. Whatever didn't break apart had bent so that a colossal robot constructed to ward off testers could rise out of the ground. Applicants fled immediately. Kyoka was about to join them. But then she saw the brunette girl pinned under rubble from where the monstrous mechanism had excavated itself. The rumbling robot was about to roll over the collapsed contender with its treaded chain track. Kyoka closed her eyes, instinctively turning her head to look away so as not to witness the inbound gruesome accident. And then, and then she heard it. The abrasive roar of a chainsaw that came before the scything rip of chattering steel. A grating rip of metal sheeting reverberated as the sharp piercing sound also stabbed into the gigantic goal. A shrill shriek of steel rang out as it was torn apart in a tumultuous frenzy. And even now, the cataclysmic caterwauling continues. There's no escape from the rampaging raucous that decimates the droid. The behemoth buckles as it's torn apart at the base, metallic fibers creaking and wires sparking with popping embers from where the steel shielding gets maul. Screeching comes from the machine as though it's wailing in torment. Never had Kyoka in her entire life heard something so awful. Never had she seen something so awful either. When she opens her eyes, she sees it. Elongated saw blades slicked black with oil protrude from what looks like something straight out of hell. Metal teeth tipped a dark shade of red. It takes Kyoka a moment to realize the blood came from the source of the chainsaw bars, not from the robot. Dried and crusted scarlet specks dot the bare chest of a boy's fit physique, a ripcord made of copper swaying from his stern. The grotesque figure has a green motor for a head, engine parted at the mouth where fangs are bared, indicator lights glow a bright yellow hue, eyes fueled just as much as the chainsaw, attached to the base of his head. Arms split down the middle allow for additional chainsaw bars that are being swung haphazardly at the automaton that he down. Parts get thrashed around. The robot's innards coming loose from the consistent, strident strikes of the saw blades. Steel squeals as the chainsaw's teeth grate against it, carving in downwards and then upwards. The malformed boy relentlessly hacks at the opposing metal, harsh noises and shrill sounds sending shockwaves through the beaten bot. Weakened whines escape the machine as it's chopped to its core. When the slasher severs anything remaining between him and the faux villain's power source, he skewers the apparatus heart. The chainsaws protruding from each of his arms stay embedded as he raises the core reactor out from its circuitry. In one fluid motion that serves as a fatal finishing move, he hoists the robot's key component over his head and begins dragging the chainsaw attached there downwards through the hard wiring. Despite how excruciating the devastating din was to her heightened sense of hearing and how hysterically horrified she was to watch the vicious slaying of the massive machine, Kyoka has to admit that it was a pretty fucking hardcore takedown. No matter the terrifying chainsaw visage and the savagery of the droid's disfigurement, the malformed boy had rescued the brunette girl that would have otherwise been crushed. Kyoka can't help but admire the heavy metal approach. She finds herself studying the stranger's appearance, blown away by how gnarly the destructive blades are. When her eyes roam to the boy's bare chest, a blush the same shade as the blood there begins to fade in. Kyoka's onyx eyes widen and the heat in her face subsides. She realizes there's blood. A lot more than before. Last time she checked, machines don't contain DNA in them. Which can only mean, a feverish feeling of queasiness overwhelms the girl. Nearly making her double over with the urge to vomit. The major spillage of blood came from the boy. The severed parts of his arms and exposure of his head ripping flesh and skin tissue for the chainsaws to function. In order for the cutting mechanisms to operate. They constantly shred his own muscle fibers. The blood leakage is an extreme side effect of the liquid's utilization as fuel. It's no wonder that the boy's pigmentation has become pallid. He's lost a major amount of the vital body fluid. 
Kayoka studies him closer, seeing now that his body is trembling. Noticing the way that the fatigued figure wobbles on his shaky legs, Kayoka turns to call out for help. Her ear jacks sway with the pivotal motion of her head. It's hard to judge how loud she's shouting with her hearing still wounded. Hey, somebody. But she doesn't need to worry about anyone not coming to her call since someone has already arrived. Onyx eyes landing on a short-statured woman wearing a white coat that billows in the wind like a cape. If not made evident by the large syringe that the lady is using as a cane or the regular-sized needle poking out of a netted bun like a hairpin, Kayoka is confident that the senior is the school's nurse judging by the way that she hands vitamin gummies to examine. Relief settles through the girl's system when she sees her elder getting near. Her violet hair swishes with her ear jacks as she turns her head back towards the boy. Much to her awe, the demonic face is gone and the chainsaws have retracted. She figures a transformation must have taken place while she was looking away. In place of motorized metal is an unruly mess of green curls. Instead of yellow lights, there's an emerald glow to the boy's eyes. An otherwise plain face holds two sets of freckles that make up a diamond formation on each cheek. At first glance, the basic facial features would have her giving no second thought to the fellow teenager. However, she's been giving him more than a simple surreptitious peek. The girl may as well be ogling him, captivated by the shift in appearance from predatory ferocity to docile innocence. Staring at him for as long as she has, she has to admit that she finds him kinda cute actually. A blush dusts Kayoka's cheeks, applying more pink than her makeup. The girl's stare isn't just drawn to the shirtless boy's face, but also his well-defined muscles. Her onyx eyes are bound to pop out of their sockets at the rate that they've been broadening. She realizes as the school nurse walks past her. Oh, no. He's hot. Kayoka only registers that she voiced her thoughts aloud when the nurse casts her a sidelong sly smile. The girl's ear jacks tangle themselves as she becomes flustered, worried that she may have also been heard by the boy himself. However, that doesn't seem to be a problem, considering he's fallen flat on his face, having passed out from blood loss and rendering himself unconscious. Kayoka winces, hoping he didn't land too hard and bruise his face. Yue's nurse tuts with each disapproving shake of her head. The elder woman prods the boy's body with her specialized cane, taking in his sorry state and formulating a diagnosis based on the mess. Another reckless kid with too much spunk. She sighs before crouching down to his level. Looks like I've found this year's Tashinori Kayoka silently wonders which hero with that name could the experienced elder be referring to. The medical practitioner rolls the bloody body over before she plants a kiss on the unconscious boy's forehead. Through lip contact, the elder woman's quirk is able to heal people's injuries and illnesses. Kayoka catches on upon witnessing the ability in action. The lady was able to land her role as Yue's nurse by being a heroine of her own. Kayoka finally recognizes the woman as Recovery Girl. But Recovery Girl is still much too occupied with tending to the boy who overexerted himself to notice Kayoka's starstruck stare. The old heroine uses her cane as a crutch to stand back up while medbots lift her patient up onto a gurney. She watches with censorious care as the boy stirs in his state of unconsciousness. What is it that man is always calling them? But upon closer examination, her gaze turns tender, problem child, sharing recovery girl's line of sight. Kayoka can't help but agree with the woman. This boy is going to cause a lot of problems. A strange chance occurrence. A peculiar behavioral habit. Or, for lack of a better term than those words, a quirk. Humans and animals alike began developing odd characteristics unique to them long ago. Superpowers. Abilities. It started in King King City of China where a baby manifested the astonishing meta capability to radiate light from its body. Now, a boy can sprout a tail. A girl could develop a pink skin pigmentation. As such, the orange dog the size of a bread loaf may as well have a chainsaw protruding from its cute little face. The dog's tail is much thinner than any other dog's, and yet, it wags just the same. It's without fur. A wire wrapped in leather that creates a swishing sound every time it takes a swipe at the air. Left, and then right. Back and forth, at the end of its tail is a handle too small for a hand to grab. It is, however, the right size for a child's pinky finger to slide through. It fits just like a ring on Izuku Midoriya's stubby appendage. It's not unnatural for animals to have quirks. After all, the principal of Yua is an animal with above-average human intelligence, and that's the most prestigious hero school in all of Japan. So, Izuku isn't afraid when he comes across the pastel orange dog with a chainsaw sticking out of its head. He's more so amazed by the prospect of a creature having a quirk, especially when it's as interactive as using its tail like a pulley system to activate the chainsaw's movement. What is far more peculiar in this world is that the young boy is without a quirk. Even the boy's appearance is rather plain, completed with a face full of freckles. The duality of the creature and Izuku Midoriya is evident so long as they're beside one another. That's what makes Izuku love the stray he's stumbled upon even more. The dog to him is a discovery unlike any other. Luckily for the freckled child, the equally little critter has taken a liking to him as well. 
Curiosity twinkles in each of their eyes as they study each other. The bond between boy and dog begins just like every other. Izuku takes the stray home, hoping to convince his mother to allow him to keep it. He carries the orange mud in his arms, presenting it like a piece of treasure. When Inko Midoriya sees the animal that her son has brought to her, she can't help but be wary of it, as a concerned mother, and an overprotective one at that. She already has ramifications about how dangerous it is having a literal chainsaw mounted to its head, not to mention it's a wild animal, undomesticated for all she knows, with or without the chainsaw. Oh, Izuku, sweetie. She softens her tone to be as delicate as she can. She knows it'll be disappointing for him to hear that he can't keep it, so she plans to let him down easily, at the very least. Seeing how bright the green shimmers in his pleading puppy eyes though, Inko hesitates. Izuku hardly asks for anything. He's such a sweet boy, always kind to her and everyone he meets. Doesn't every boy deserve a pet? She wonders. Her reconsideration will have to be a carefully thought out one though. The last thing she wants is for her little Izuku to get hurt. Inko's eyes settle on the dog that her son is clutching tightly to his chest. Izuku clings to the animal like a lifeline, hugging it closely to his heart. The strange colored critter gazes up at her, meeting her stare with as equally innocent eyes as her son. Its thin wire for a tail flicks back and forth, wagging happily in the Midoriya's company. Izuku did manage to carry the animal all the way home without harming himself. If the creature were truly dangerous as she fears, it would have likely already bitten or scratched him when being picked up. The chainsaw is pointed away from her son, the way he handles the dog extremely cautious. It's so difficult saying no to the combination of such a cute duo tag teaming her with puppy eyes, one literally from a puppy, in Ko's eyes, unable to refuse her son's happiness by denying the welcoming of a new family member. That being said, she still has to keep her boy safe as his mother. If she's going to allow the animal to stay with them, there comes a small caveat. You can keep it. She pauses to let Izuku finish cheering before adding, but Izuku cocks his head. Ear catching the word before his brain registers that there's more. Only if it stays in the backyard. At least until we're able to bring it to a vet. And Ko settles on the condition she's presented. She's still uncertain of how safe the stray is and would like to proceed with caution. Izuku nods along. Well-mannered and understanding, he accepts the compromise. Deal. He celebrates with a little hop before twirling the dog around in a giddy display of affection for it already. The small canine yaps along to his laughter, creating a happy symphony that has Inko giggling with them before long. Thanks, Mom. Izuku flashes a smile so bright that it'd be blinding to anyone unaccustomed to seeing it so often. And Ko feels her cheeks lifting into an equally large smile. All right, all right. She places a gentle hand on his head to hold him in place. It's tough raising a boy alone at such a rambunctious age. Go wash up now. Dinner will be ready soon. She steers him towards the bathroom and he sets the new family member down before running off. She suddenly realizes that their new pet will also need food. Kibble goes on the shopping list for tomorrow. But in the meantime, she heard that rice and eggs is perfectly edible for dogs. She prepares some to feed the canine her son brought home. Ah, uh, Inko sighs to herself before adding to the list that she'll also need to pick up dog dishes. She supposes they'll also need to give it a dog collar and a name so she can call it something other than it. Inko will wait for her son to get back for that one. He's the one that brought the dog home in the first place. He should be the one to name it. Inko glances at the dog from her peripheral vision. It curled itself up in a small ball right where Izuku left it, waiting patiently for his return. At least it's well-mannered. She wonders if it happened to have a previous owner who had perhaps trained it to be. Inko tuts to herself as she clicks the pen to write another thing to add to her shopping list. The poor thing will need a doggy bed to lay in instead of on the floor. She glances out the window. The weather is warm enough that it should be fine sleeping outside just for tonight, though she does feel bad making it do so. Inko adds a note to get a few chew toys and bones to make up for it. The rice cooker beeps to let her know that it's finished. Eggs don't take very long to scramble either, so the dog is served its meal long before the Midorias have theirs. When Inko squats down to set the bowl of food down, she takes the chance to get a closer look at the animal. Even with a chainsaw jutting out of its skull, it really is quite cute. The tiny creature timidly starts to eat its mixture of rice and eggs, drawing closer to the woman. Inko tilts her head to the side, green hair leaning with gravity. Studying the strange colored critter, she reaches out a hand to pet its fur. The dog doesn't flinch, growl, or snap. It allows her to run her fingers through its coat. So soft and sweet, it reminds her of her little Izuku and his fluffy hair. Oh, oh crap. She's starting to love the animal just as much as her son. Inko chuckles, realizing that the decision to keep the dog as their pet was inevitable. When Izuku trots back to the kitchen, Inko stands up straight, trying to hide the fact that she was getting close to the dog. She clears her throat with a feigned cough while facing away from him, returning to the oven. So, Izuku. She hears him slide out a chair to sit down. What should we name our new little friend? 
Izuku hums as he tries to think of an answer, so loud that one might consider the noise obnoxious, but Inko knows better. How about dog might? He shouts his suggestion with childish pride. Inko tries to hold back a laugh, not sure how to help him cope with his hero worship or how she'll explain that such a ridiculous name is unsuitable. But she fortunately doesn't have to. Izuku looks down at the dog to see it looking up at him, meeting his gaze. He gauges the animal's reaction. Neither he or Inko are expecting the mutt to make a deadpan expression, complete with a sweat drop and all. Oh, you don't like that, boy. Izuku second guesses the name he's going to pick out. Inko pauses, realizing that her son has figured out the animal's gender somehow. She shakes her head. He's probably just guessing. Before Izuku can come up with another All Might-themed name, Inko blurts out her own suggestion. How about Pachai? It's a pretty common dog name, like Spot. Perhaps, even a bit plain. People have often called Izuku rather plain, so maybe Panchai is fitting for his pet. It'd be better than dog might at the very least. Panchai. Izuku tests the name on his tongue. His face scrunches a little like the taste in his mouth is sour. He does a little reinventing of the kanji, Pachu. Pakia. Pashio. Before finally settling on, how about? Pachita. The dog perks up a bit, yapping in acknowledgement. Izuku's mouth goes agape in awe, eyes sparkling at the sight of his pet agreeing with his name's suggestion. You like Pachita? Izuku asks. The dog barks as though in confirmation. Pachita. Pachita. P-O-C-H-I-T-A. Izuku cheers the name like a chant and the dog now deemed Pachita continues to bark in equal elation. And that's how the dog's name was decided. Pachita became a member of the Midoriya family that day. And the thing about Midoriya is, is that they all have big affectionate hearts. So when Pachita is left outside to sleep in the backyard, Izuku for the first time goes against his mother's wishes. After he's sure that she has fallen asleep, he sneaks out of his room to let the dog in. SSSHH. His hushed whisper warns the dog not to bark as he tries not to get caught. Izuku's heart hammers in his chest. He's never been a rebellious child. Not like Kakan. He'd never broken the rules. Whatever his mom says, he respectfully does. But poor Pachita. Izuku couldn't just leave him outside to sleep all alone. Izuku lets the dog up onto his bed. From the higher vantage point, Pachita gets a good view of all the superhero merchandise that adorns the walls. The number one hero, All Might, smiles from all possible angles. D don't judge me. Izuku squirms in embarrassment once he gets beneath his All Might-themed blankets. After Pachita does that dog thing where he spins in a few circles first, he settles into the bed with Izuku. The boy smiles as he closes his eyes, happy to be sharing the bed with his new friend. He's excited to introduce Kakin to the dog the next day. Hoping his childhood friend will be as impressed as he is by the animal's quirk. Eventually, the two drift to sleep, their slumber silent with very little snores. They would have not gotten caught if not for Inko being such a concerned mother. The protective mom pokes her head into the room to check on her son. She finds him nuzzled up against Pachita, the two of them sleeping with smiles. She sighs, not wanting to ruin the tender moment by waking them up. She figures she'll reprimand Izuku in the morning for going against the rules, but for now, she'll let the two bond. After all, this is only the start of the bond between a boy and his dog. Scarlet sneakers scuff solid concrete, the shabby shoes planting themselves firmly on the grounds of Yua beneath the outsoles as a mess of petal confetti, the after-party of the school's entrance exam leaving a boy left in its wake. He lingers under the billowing cherry blossoms until a stronger breeze blows, the wind ruffling his green curls and knocking more of the Sakura tree's corolla loose. Izuku Midoriya's viridescent gaze glimmers under the glow of a salmon sky as he's showered by the flower petals. Some of the fuchsia specks land on his t-shirt, their gentle descent coming to a sudden halt. It's one of the spare articles of clothing his mother made him pack in the flaxen knapsack that he has hoisted over his shoulder by a single strap. Izuku's grip on the band tightens when he recalls the reason for needing another set of attire in the first place. His transformation during the physical portion of the hero school's exam comes to mind. His quirk's ability having shredded through his first outfit. The moppy mess called hair that resides atop of the boy's head sways when he tries shaking the memory of his metamorphosis from his mind. It helps him to forget when his green gaze settles on the familiar vehicle that's slowly pulling up to the school's gate. A soft smile stretches his freckled cheeks and he begins walking towards the car. Smoke wafts from the Nissan Versus exhaust pipe. The engine's thrumming reminding Izuku of a familiar sound and forcing his smile down. He places a hand over the left side of his chest, feeling the wire underneath his shirt. The back and forth of introspection versus assuagement resettles on the person in the vehicle once she steps out. Inko Midoriya exits the car to greet her son at the school gate, worry written all over her expression. The greenette mother hurries over to her kid, wrapping him in a hug that puts the bear strength in Mama Bear. Izuku wheezes as he gasps for air, his lungs crushed so long as he's caught in her grasp. My baby, they told me what happened. Are you okay? 
She ironically frets over his well-being despite being the cause of his current breathing problems. Once released from her embrace, Izuku finally manages to inhale enough oxygen so that he can speak. I am fine, mom. Recovery girl said that I'm fine. He stands up straight to show her that he's still completely intact as though that's proof of his good health. She critically eyes him up and down, searching for any scars or scrapes. When Inko is seemingly satisfied with her own diagnosis, she nods. If you say so. Though she remains wary about the final verdict, she steps aside so that Izuku can throw his bag in the car's trunk. As the Greenette ventures around the grill to return to the driver's side, she sneaks a glance at the prestigious hero school that her son applied to. You met recovery girl, huh? I wish it had been under better circumstances, but that must have been neat, and smiles while thinking how excited the hero Otaku must have been to meet one of his idols. Izuku climbs into the passenger side, relishing in how soft the cushion is once his body sinks into the seat. The door slamming shut jars his memory of the eventful day he had so that he mimics her smile. Yeah, and present Mike was the one who read us all the rules, and cement us was our proctor for the written part. That's great, Zuku, but... And Ko interrupts her son to literally point out his lack of a safety strap by a gesturing with her index finger. When he looks down at his lap, she feigns clearing her throat before correcting him to look up by flicking forward, seatbelt. Izuku jostles himself to sit up straight, grabbing onto the strap's clip fastener so that he can pull it down. Oh, right. He begins to tug on the line to make it work. Once it reaches across his chest, he locks it in place with a click. Sorry. He gives his mother an apologetic look before readjusting himself to get comfortable again. So, you were telling me about your day. Inko locks her own seatbelt into place before turning her keys in the car's ignition slot to switch on the engine. She gives her son a quick glance to let him know that she's still listening as she shifts the vehicle into gear. Izuku practically jumps in his seat with excitement upon being reminded of his glimpse at UOO. Yeah. He recalls how amazing the massive estate is with not just its main building's theater auditorium but also the entire mock city the school created just for the physical exam. He continues with his recollection of the time spent there vehemently. I met recovery girl last after I helped save a girl that was. A girl. He doesn't expect his mother to slam roughly on the brakes. The car jolts to a stop before it even begins to move. Safety strap tightening to hold him in place so that he doesn't go flying out the windshield. Izuku is suddenly very grateful that his mother told him to wear the seatbelt. Startled by the sudden halt of the vehicle, he glances at the car's driver with wide eyes. Mom, he verbally expresses his mixture of shock and confusion when he sees that she's sobbing. Sorry, sorry. Inko apologizes in a quavering voice while trying to wipe away her tears with the back of her hands. She sniffles as snot hangs from her nose, the crying becoming overwhelmingly hysterical. Izuku knows from experience that the waterworks are about to flood the car and drown him like a dam bursting. She can hardly get any words out, it's just. Inko watches through blurred vision as her son searches frantically in the glove compartment for a box of tissues. When Izuku finds nothing to dry her tears, his panic escalates and he fumbles with the door handle, realizing that the child lock is in place. He has no choice but to resort to begging her not to turn the car into a death trap. Oh no, mom, don't, my little Zuzu is growing up. But her wailing is like an alarm ringing to warn everyone on a ship that the boat is sinking. There's nothing to plug the leak as water starts to fill up the car's interior. Inko's delirious weeping threatens both of their lives until he manages to roll down the window. At the last second, he saves them from a flooded enclosed space. M-O-O-M-M. Izuku groans in exhausted exasperation. His fatigue turns him languid, his body sliding down the seat. He shakes his head with what little energy he has left to muster for the motion. It's not like that. After I rescued her is when I passed out. Inko pauses her dramatic sniveling. Sinuses suddenly cleared. She has some sort of backlash reaction before doing a double take. Wait, this girl never thanked you. One of her eyebrows raises scrutinously and her tone changes tune. Izuku fidgets in place, his mother's hard gaze suddenly making him feel as though he's being watched closely under a microscope. He avoids her stare while trying to come up with an answer that'll keep both him and the girl that he saved off his mom's chopping block. Well, you're telling me that you never even got her name. Inko's obtrusive outburst startles Izuku just as much as when she slammed on the car's brakes, seeing that his mother is on the verge of crying yet again. Albeit for a different reason over her son's interaction with a girl this time, he's quick to shout over her too. Mom, would you just let me finish what I'm saying? He tries not to sound too desperate to get a sentence in but his plea comes out as a whine anyways. The sudden cry surprises Inko just the right amount that it manages to snap her out of her delusional state of mind. You're right, you're right. She nods as she acknowledges how crazy she was acting. Inko shifts the car back into gear, mirroring her headspace returning to normal. As she starts to pull forward, she prompts her son to explain further. Sorry, Izuku. Continue. Izuku falters, partially because he hadn't expected her to actually let him talk and slightly due to the next part of his story. 
My, um, he anxiously fiddles with the cord under his shirt. When he finally settles on the right word, my quirk, he quells his nerves enough to say, I only passed out because I exceeded my runtime with my chainsaws while using it. And Co stiffens in her seat. As soon as she does, she tries hiding the discomposure by pretending to slouch. Oh, I see. She mulls over what her response will be very carefully. She knows that her son is watching her closely just as much as he's listening. Internally, the woman doesn't know whether to be relieved or not. She wasn't sure what she had thought when she heard her son had saved someone but the usage of his quirk hadn't come to mind for whatever reason. Ultimately, her boy made a choice and it's up to her to support him should he choose to stand by it for the proper cause. You made the right decision, Izuku. Never doubt that. She spares him a quick glance so that he knows the matter is important enough for her to risk taking her eyes off the road for a moment. Izuku looks away, his gaze breaking contact from her and falling into his lap. I just moved on my own. His fingers curl around the fabric of his shorts until he has handfuls of the material bunched up in his palms. Whatever he's feeling transfers over to the touch of his chest. He raises one arm, placing a hand over his sternum where a wire resides. I didn't think. I just pulled on my cord. He feels a heartbeat as though it's still active. And Co pulls up to a red light, utilizing the opportunity as a chance to look over at her son and gauge his expression. If her motherly instinct weren't enough, she can see as clear as the day being lit by sunbeams with her eyes that he has a lot on his mind. You know, Izuku, I understand that kids stop caring about their parents at a certain age. But it's still rude not to ask your mother about her day too. She thinks that the best course of action is to change the subject. Once Izuku registers the drastic change in conversational topic, he's none the wiser to her strategy, mistaking the switch up for a revival of his mother's moodiness. Uh, sorry, mom. He stammers out an apology and awkwardly forces out a fake chuckle, so, how was your day? Inko rolls her eyes over her son's dramatics, not realizing that he takes after her. She knows better than to bore him with details about how she did laundry and cleaned the house all morning. So she decides now is as good a time as any to mention the supper situation? Well, I didn't really have the chance to start cooking dinner since the school called around that time she notes her son's surprised reaction from her peripheral vision. Do you want to pick something up at the store? then makes a turn with the steering wheel to head downtown. Izuku blinks as he processes the information coupled with her question. Oh, um, it takes him a moment for his brain to catch up with his words when he has a great epiphany of a solution. Oh, can I get one of those pre-made katsudans? Inko casts her son a withering look through the reflection of the rearview mirror. You know those aren't healthy, though her tutting tone doesn't quite match her expression in the sense of sounding serious. Izuku takes it seriously anyways. Come on, Plios. Serious enough that he puts his hands together in a begging gesture to go along with his whining. Inko has a difficult time stifling her laugh over how ridiculous he's being. Fine. She gives in to the pleading puppy eyes that haven't changed since he was a baby. But just because this is a special occasion... His victorious smile is contagious and she thinks his spirits have been lifted high enough to venture back on topic to UA. How well do you think you did on the exam? Oh, I'm… But she reconsiders that thought when she hears him hesitate. She worries for the worst until he says, I'm not so sure. He scratches the back of his head as though he'll find the answer buried in his thick curls of hair. I guess we'll find out. She shoots him a sidelong stare, seeing that he's taken to watching other cars whiz by outside the window. I mean, you have to have some idea of how you did. She tests her luck by attempting to pry a little more in case he's trying to hold out on her for some reason. Good, I guess. But his demeanor continues to droop the more that she persists. Probably the same as anyone else he shrugs noncommittally before reaching over to turn up the volume dial on the system head unit. Can we turn on the radio? Present Mike's podcast is starting soon. Inko opens her mouth to say something more, but closes it just as quickly. Her son has already raised the audio too loud for them to continue talking. So, she relents and whispers more so to herself, yeah, okay, sure. Like the continuous spin of the car's tires, Inko's mind does loops as it tries to figure out why her child has become so despondent. The gentle rise and fall of the road beneath the vehicle does little to soothe her as she overthinks. Part of her hopes that present Mike will mention UA's entrance exam. But the other side of her knows that she needs the radio as a distraction just as much as Izuku does. A hero's podcast usually consists of jokes that are good for easing any sort of tension. With how increasingly frustrated she's becoming due to so many people cutting into her lane without turn signals, and Co figures she could use a wisecrack or two. Yesterday, I caught the sinister villain Bomber Bear and couldn't help thinking to myself. Present Mike's voice transmits through the radio and already captivates Izuku's interest at the mention of hero work. And Co can't help but listen closely as well, intrigued getting the better of her, past experience from tuning into the podcasts leaving her in anticipation of a punchline. 
What do you call a bear without ears? B. The joke's landing is a bit rough at first but both Midoriyas wind up howling with laughter once they comprehend the humor behind it. And Ko is grateful for the dumb gag, her stress already alleviated. Suddenly, exams and quirks seem like less of a hassle than they originally were. If her son who's on the direct receiving end has already forgotten about those issues, then she can too, for his sake if not her own. And Ko instead focuses on her first and foremost priority, which is being a mother, and that means feeding her boy. The woman turns into the parking lot of a grocer with the idea that they can quickly run in. It's hard for her to find a space at this hour, so she pulls alongside the front entrance. I'll be right behind you if somebody pulls out of a spot. But wait right here if you finish first. And Ko reaches over the headrest of her chair to grab the purple purse she keeps in the backseat. There's just enough yen in her pocketbook to afford a frozen meal. Go to self-checkout and only buy your katsudan. No candy or treats, young man. The boy's mother withholds the money from his reach until she finishes giving him instruction. Once he stops rolling his eyes and nods in agreement with her laying of ground rules, only then does she allow him to have it. What about you? He pauses halfway out the door to look back when he realizes his mom didn't request anything for herself. The yen that the boy is holding suddenly feels light in his very heavy hand. And Ko closes her eyes with her smile, concealing the chagrin of not being able to afford something for herself. I'll just have leftovers, sweetie. She then tries shooing him out of the car before he can see through the facade. Now hurry along. Izuku turns his face away hiding his rueful expression from her as he gets out of the vehicle. He's seen the overdue bills piled up on the kitchen counter to know his father's checks haven't been covering their finances anymore. He's well aware of her monetary problems, though his mother doesn't know that. He knows better than to say anything to her should he spare her the shame. And yet, he still feels guilty as he goes to spend her hard-earned yen for himself. As Izuku's threadbare and sneakers slap the store's tiled floor, he begins weighing his options with the money in his hand. The boy figures there may be some yen left over if he buys the cheaper stuff. Grocers sometimes keep expiring meals at the back of the shopi with marked down prices. Each aisle he passes has something different. There's fruit, veggies, bread, canned goods. And finally at the end is when he reaches the discounted stock. Shelves with different microwavable meals give him his own variety of food to select from. Izuku looks out and breathes a sigh of relief when he finds a box of katsudan. Except, when the boy reaches for it, someone's hand brushes up against his own. He realizes when he sees nails painted in a coat of purple polish that it's a soft, yet firm, feminine hand. Retracting his own hand like the girl's fingers were the fangs of a serpent that tried to bite him, Izuku yelps in disconcertment. He feels his face heating up in embarrassment, turning as bright red as his shoes by now. The boy's mild case of gynophobia really takes hold when he sees the rest of the girl. The hand that touched his own is connected to a fair-skinned teenager that must share his age. She's so petite that it's cute, her violet hair short the same as her height and he can't help but be captivated by her triangular eye shape. What really amazes him about the girl is how cables hang from her lobes like earrings. He places his hand over his chest, feeling his own cord extension from his body and sensing a kindred spirit in that odd sense. He also feels the rapid rhythm of his heart trying not to explode from pumping so much blood all at once. As for how the girl responds to the accidental contact, her initial instinct is to apologize for startling him so badly. However, she too feels an extreme amount of shock when she sees how the boy looks. She recognizes him from the entrance exam and blurts out, Chainsaw Boy, before she can stop herself. The hand that touched said Chainsaw Boy's flies over her mouth to stifle the words that already came out. A blush of her own, though not as extreme as Izuku's, fades in as a pink hue to shadow her cheeks. Izuku sobers up when he hears the way that she referred to him. Wait, he does a double take before making sure he heard her correctly. What did you call me? And that reaction from him only embarrasses the girl even more, her blush darkening. Hesitantly, a muffled whisper comes from behind her hand, Chainsaw Boy. After a moment of blinking at one another, both failing to gauge the other, the girl bows and shouts, I'm sorry. Izuku jumps in place, startled by her a second time. She winces before toning her voice down. That's not your name, and remains tentative about what she says, is it? Izuku stands there staring at her dumbfounded like a fool blinking a few more times for extra measure to make sure the girl is real and that this is actually happening. When he realizes that the gradually growing silence between them is becoming awkward, he shakes his head to both answer her question and jumpstart his mouth. No, it's not. A weak laugh slips out on its own before he introduces himself with a small bow, I'm Izuku Midori. I'm Kayoka Jiru. The girl returns the gesture as she laughs along. Now that the strange tension between them has subsided, she loosens up a little. Sorry again, for the whole chainsaw boy thing. And startling you, Kayoka twirls one of her ear jacks so that it wraps around her finger the same way one would normally play with their hair. No, no, it's fine. Izuku fans away her apology with each of his frantically flapping hands. 
but still lingers on the matter to an extent, rubbing the nape of his neck nervously while wondering aloud, just, how do you know about? Kyoka raises an eyebrow when he doesn't finish his sentence. The chainsaws. She tries concluding it for him when she realizes that he doesn't plan on saying the rest. He sheepishly nods in response. Dude, we were at the same test site during the Yua entrance exam. It was literally today. You didn't notice me. Her hands go on her noticeably curvaceous hips and Izuku can't help but follow the motion with his eyes. I don't know how I could have missed you. His mouth moves on its own to convey his thoughts. He realizes after the matter of speaking that he's being lewd and diverts his gaze to the ceiling in an attempt to cover his tracks. The tomato-faced blush returns full swing. Fortunately for him, Kyoka misinterprets his response as a regular reply. Well, you were pretty occupied with taking down the zero-pointer and saving that other girl. She recalls his shirtless rescue and blushes while thinking of her own semi-lewd thoughts. Ah, oh, anybody would have done the same in my position. Izuku tries brushing away her praise with one hand while bashfully running the other hand through his bushy green mess of hair. Are you kidding? Kayoka looks at him incredulously. Everyone else ran off like a bunch of pansies. She shocks Izuku with her terminology and zeal. You were the only one rockin' enough to actually be a hero like we're trying to become. He worries that he'll faint in front of her again due to how much blood keeps rushing up to his face. Though, thanks, I guess. Izuku tries staring down at the floor to avoid facing the influx of emotions that he's feeling. He's not used to such praise. And from a girl no less. Heck, he's surprised that he's even lasted this long talking to one in general. By the way, are you doing alright? Kayoka's question snaps him out of his musings and causes him to look back up at her with confusion. Huh? He tries not to scrunch up his face too much as he tries to figure out what she means. He does a poor job, seeing the boy's bewilderment. Kayoka elaborates a little, I was also in recovery girl's office afterwards and you didn't wake up the entire time that I was there. Oh, that. Izuku's eyes almost pop out of his head from how large his epiphany is. I'm fine. Just some quirk overuse backlash. He gestures towards his face with his hands as if she hadn't noticed the lack of bloody oil-soaked chainsaws until now. Then he thinks about what else she said and asks, Wait, what were you in there for? Kayoka wavers, suddenly self-conscious about herself the same way that he had been. Oh, I, bah, I have pretty sensitive ears, so. She shyly twists, and untwists the jacks hanging from her lobes before explaining, You kinda did a number on my hearing when you went all chainsaw massacre on the zero-pointer. Izuku feels like he's been struck across the face, or maybe stabbed in the chest. Both. He feels both. He holds his hands out in front of himself, unsure of what to do with them. Realizing that he's just standing there and hasn't apologized, he bends down to his waist to bow. Oh no, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to, I it's okay. I'm fine now too. Really, it's alright. But Kayoka interrupts him with a mimicry of Izuku's earlier frantic double hand wave. Just, keep that in mind the next time you decide to transform. She winces at the memory of the sound but tries to assure him with a delicate smile that it's okay anyways. Izuku looks up at her, confused yet again, next time. Do you not think you did well enough on the exam to get in? Kayoka tilts her head to the side in mutual miscommunication. She then tilts her head upwards as she thinks, I'm pretty sure I, at least, racked up about 30 of the three pointers. Realizing Kayoka is talking about the score required to get accepted into the hero school, Izuku's shoulders slump with sorrow. He hadn't told his mom why guessing the exam results was such a touchy topic for him during their drive to the store, but he supposes it doesn't hurt to discuss the matter with a fellow examinee. I didn't, um, transform, until the end. He unconsciously places a hand over the string that dangles from his sternum under his shirt. Both of Kayoka's brows raise in a mixture of surprise and confusion. Dude, really? Why not? She finds herself taking a step back in an attempt to better assess the boy's downtrodden demeanor. Izuku looks away, avoiding eye contact. His fingers trace the cord under the fabric of his shirt as he tries thinking of a good response for her. After a moment, he gives her a half-hearted shrug and mumbles, I dunno. Seeing how uncomfortable he is, Kayoka decides not to pry any further. Well, that's a bummer. She crosses her arms and tries cheering him up instead. I think you would have made a pretty hardcore hero. Th thanks. Izuku cracks a small smile after hearing her say that. The hand hovering over his chest falls away. Hanging in front of him next. Most people don't say that about my quirk. His fingers curl in to cover his open palm and form a fist before he looks up from it to return her sentiment. But you seem pretty rockin' too. Flabbergasted by the boy using her own terminology on her, Kayoka turns as stiff as a board painted red. Rockin', S.H. shut it. Her ear jacks start twisting around each other and the flush-faced girl has to struggle not to let them get tangled. Ah, uh, S. sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Izuku begins to match her state of panic minus her quirk's ear extensions intertwining. 
The blushing and stammering mess of a boy hides his face behind his hands, seeing that he's just as embarrassed. Kayoka spares him from getting jabbed by the jacks she finally manages to straighten out. To CH, whatever, she tries to play the moment off by holding out her cell phone for him to take. Here, surprised to see the gesture, Izuku spreads his hands just enough to peek out and look at the foreign object. The case is bedazzled with musical notes and has a glittery effect. Huh? He looks up from it to her with a perplexed stare. Kayoka shakes the hand holding the phone to urge him on. Your phone number. Put it in so we can keep chatting. But avoids meeting his gaze out of lingering embarrassment. Oh oh. Izuku realizes what she intended then and takes the phone from her to put in his contact. While he's at it, he inputs her phone number into his cell as well. While he's busy looking at the phone screens, Kayoka chances a glance in his direction to take in his appearance. Now that the boy isn't covered in blood and has his complexion back, he's even handsomer than he was before. He also has a cool sense of style. Kayoka stifles a giggle when she reads the small fonted kanji text that simply reads T-shirt. It really is just an otherwise normal white short sleeve top that he's got on. Nice shirt. She compliments him with a nod. Thanks. Izuku hands the girl her phone back as he returns the nod. I like yours too. Forgetting which outfit she picked out for that day. Kayoka looks down at herself to see how she dressed. The top she chose is a purple tee with bolded English text that says deep dope in yellow. But the catch is that the P on the end extends into an arrow that points down to her crotch. A blush so radical that it covers her entire face overwhelms her. Perv. And she snatches the box of katsudan off the shelf between them before hurrying away. Just as she's about to round the corner, she pauses to shout over her shoulder, you'd better text me. And poor Izuku is left discombobulated by the girl's sudden reaction. Not only did he receive mixed signals, but he had his dinner stolen from him. He stretches out an arm as though he's reaching for the girl and his food, W wait, what? But ultimately surrenders to common sense being that there is no sense to what just happened. Suddenly, an eerie aura starts to creep up behind the boy, who was that nice sweet kind gorgeous girl, Zuku. His mother materializes seemingly out of thin air behind him to be the world's biggest jump scare. Izuku screams, Mom, how long have you been standing there? He feels faint after a violent vertigo assault on his mind from how she just magically appeared. Long enough, Inko smirks as she folds her arms over one another. Now tell me how long until I get my grandchildren, Zuku. When do I get to meet her or her parents? The atmosphere becomes heavier as she somehow increases her aura's output. The overwhelming motherly force nearly crushes Izuku from how strong the amount of pressure is. The poor boy almost falls to his knees, legs wobbling as he struggles to remain standing in retaliation of the weight against him. She's just a friend. He cries out in a desperate Hail Mary attempt to stop his mom from smothering him in her emanating aura. Fortunately for him, the effort works and the dense fog lifts. He's able to breathe again, heavy intakes of air, as he bends forward with his hands on his knees. My little Zuzu is just friends with a J Earl. And Ko squeals with delight as she does a celebratory dance that has her wiggling in place. She's completely oblivious to her son's suffering as she commemorates the milestone in his life. Once Izuku has finally recovered enough oxygen to speak again, he forces himself to stand up straight and tries to stop her from embarrassing him any further. Muamam. But there's a small smile that graces his lips despite his protests to her happiness. He too feels like celebrating, even if he'd never admit it. After all, Kayoka Jiru is his first friend since he lost Pachita. Vivid vermilion permeates a hoary handkerchief, blood seeping through the chalky cotton. The brazenly palpable blemish spreads over the cloth with effervescence. When she hacks up more of the bright liquid, a spray of red specks the fabric, further staining the white material as it sinks in. Inko holds the malquire close to her mouth in order to hide the glaring results of her dry cough. Her hand carries a slight tremor as she tries to force down her raspy croaks of breath. Mommy, she hears her son's muffled voice traveling through the bathroom door, further attempting to hide her ill condition. She turns the knob on the sink faucet so that the sound of water running into the drain will drown her coughing fit out. Just a second more, Izuku, okay sweetie. She spits into the already sullied handkerchief before folding it over and disposing of it by flushing it down the toilet. Her saliva comes out as a sandy titian color, blood pooling with sputum as she splashes the cold faucet water on her lips. She swallows some of the liquid and gargles it in her mouth before spitting out a darker shade of claret, turning water into wine. Inko looks in the mirror, seeing how pale her face has become. She forces a smile that'll be enough to fool her child at the very least before shutting off the sink and gathering the courage to face him. He's waiting on the other side of the door when she opens it, his pet dog clutched close to his chest in each of his arms. A cheetah had earned a verdant green collar with a silver name tag dangling from it since his adoption, becoming an official member of the Midoriya family's household. The canine gazes up at her with eyes that seem to know of her illness. She hardens her stare as though she's silently telling the dog to keep quiet about it to Izuku. Inko crouches down a bit to match her son's height, broadening her phony smile. 
Yes, what is it, sweetheart? Her benign tone isn't the least bit fraudulent as she tries to sound as considerate as possible for her kid though. Izuku holds Pachita a little tighter, nuzzling his chin into the animal's fur as he looks down to avoid her line of sight. Um, are you okay? He tentatively asks. Inko's smile wavers, but she doesn't let it fall. Of course I am. What would make you ask that? She springs up like she has energy to spare while putting her hands on her hips with authority. She sometimes forgets how perceptive her son can be, especially ever since he'd picked up quirk analysis as a hobby. The crafty mother quickly brainstorms an excuse for the hacking sounds he must have heard. It's just seasonal allergies is all, and sells the lie with a faint sniffle before wiping her nose with the back of her hand. Oh, alright. Izuku accepts the fib without a second thought. Her son is so innocent that she feels guilty for deceiving him when he trusts her so much. He perks up, forgetting about his concerns for her health, and asks with an eager lean forward, Did you call Kaken yet? And Ko nods, happy to tell him the truth, you bet. Your Aunt Mitsuki said you can go over there while Mommy goes out she brushes past the boy so that she can grab her purse off her dresser. Yes, hear that, Pachita. Izuku celebrating in the background as she prepares herself for an outing turns her smile a bit more genuine. However, wait a minute, but where are you going? Her face falls flat when she realizes that she'll have to lie to her son again. Truthfully, she made a doctor's appointment, but she can't let Izuku know that. He'd be worried until he's sick himself. Oh, mommy just has a few errands to run. Nothing for you to fret about. She ties her long flow of hair up into a bun as she walks back into the bathroom to use the mirror. Again, Izuku believes her without a hint of doubt. Okay then. He sets Pachita down before asking, Does that mean I can be a big boy and make my own breakfast? Inko side eyes him, wondering where that one came from. As he's been getting older, he's oddly been requesting to do more and more for her around the house such as laundry or dishes. It's a relief on her part to catch a break thanks to some help, but she can't help but be suspicious. Though using the stove, she also can't resist her motherly concerns about the dangers or messes that he could make. I won't. Izuku feverishly shakes his head so hard that his entire body moves side to side with the motion. Sitting beside him, Pachita matches the movement, oscillating his own tiny head. Against Inko's better judgment, she decides to give it a try. Fine, she accedes to the cute proposal based on the agreed to terms and conditions. Then you can make yourself something to eat. Yeah, Izuku cheers with a happy hop. Pachita bounces with him as though he were a rabbit instead of a dog, yapping in equal elation. Inko shakes her head, humored by the pair. Don't get yourself into any trouble. And don't cause Mitsuki any problems either, she gives her son a semi-stern look so that he takes her seriously. He's a good kid, probably one of the best behaved in all of Japan, but children can still be mischievous little scamps from time to time that she has to make sure she keeps him disciplined. I'll be good, promise. He bends with the downward drop of his jump to fall into a full at the waist bow. It's hard to take him seriously at his age with a short stature and all might pajamas, but Inko hums with satisfaction knowing her son keeps his word. Then I'll be off. She grabs her coat and begins sliding her arms into the sleeves as she heads for the door. Izuku and Pachita trail behind, the small duo almost in sync with one another. As Inko grabs an umbrella just in case the weather changes, she casts them one last look over her shoulder, be back soon. Bye. Izuku waves as he bids her farewell out the door. Once it shuts and he's got the house to himself, the boy shares a look with his canine companion. His eyes peel upwards with an inclined curl of his lips, equal parts thinned as impish arches. Ha! <sighs> he's pleased with himself and can't help but have such a smug expression. Hey, Pachita, looks like it's a slice of bread for breakfast. The puckish pull of his mouth into such a thinly stretched smile remains as he shares his plan with his pet pal. The dog cocks his head to the side, befuddled by the boy's bathetic revelation. It's not until Izuku gets his grubby little mitts into the kitchen that Pachita sees why the bread breakfast is such a big deal. It's not just any slice from a loaf. It's the ultimate piece of toast. The boy's mother would never allow such an unhealthy disgusting meal to be consumed by her child. Izuku slathers the bread slice with everything his mom kept stocked in the fridge and cabinets. Strawberry jam, marmalade, honey, butter, grape jelly, cream cheese, peanut butter, and cinnamon are blended together in a thick spread of sugar. Pachita's mouth hangs open as he watches Izuku actually take a bite from the appalling and repulsive childish concoction. Droplets dribble down from the boy's chin, spilling across the kitchen counter that he's leaning over as he eats and joins all of the crumbs that broke off from the bite. Izuku moans in satisfaction, munching on the toast and savoring the explosion of flavor. When he sees Pachita watching him, he mistakens the ostrich stare and holds out the breakfast blend as an offering, you want some too, boy. Pachita simply turns around on the heels of his paws and goes over to the doggy dish filled with kibble, making a firm statement without saying anything at all. Izuku shrugs, unfazed as he chomps down on the toast again anyways. Suit yourself. The adolescent drops a few more morsels of grain as he travels from the kitchen to the home office. 
Whatever other residue that spills onto the carpet along the way goes unnoticed by the boy. Izuku's thoughts are too fixated on the computer that he slowly starts up, a one-track mind eager to begin the day properly. Almost ritual at this point, he types into the internet search engine the name of his favorite video. The title autofills and the page loads much to the boy's anticipation. All Might's boisterous guffaw as a resounding boom through the PC's speaker system, shaking the whole house as though the hero is actually present. The clip shows the symbol of peace making his public debut. A Herculean hero catches a crashed city transit bus that's about to fall off a bridge and pulls its passengers from the wreckage. The amazing rescue never fails to inspire awe from Izuku. The cheetah has to squint from how bright the boy's beaming smile is. Two distinct tufts of blonde hair atop the man's head match the peace sign All Might flashes towards the camera. Izuku recites what the hero says verbatim, it's all right now, I am here. The cheetah leans back, stunned by how spastic the otaku has become. The boy rocks back and forth so fast and hard that the extreme motion would cause whiplash if not for how young he is. In the kid's eyes, the reflection of the screen is a pish posh of color that acknowledges All Might's western-themed outfit. When Izuku breaks contact with the monitor, Pachita is shocked to see tears threatening to spill over. The dog's owner raises and points a shaky finger towards the frozen frame of All Might. Hey, Pachita, do you think I could one day be like him? His voice wobbles just as much as he retracts that same hand to dry his eyes. That's my dream. To become a hero, Pachita leans his head to the side as he studies the crying child. A sympathetic stare from the dog has the boy bending down to pick the mud up. At arm's width and at equal height as Izuku holds the canine up, the two maintain that contact. The gaze lingers, each of them simply relishing in the company of the other. The boy sniffles as his sorrow dissipates and his downturned mouth lifts into a smile. Izuku can't help but pull the dog in for a hug, holding the animal close in his arms and pressed against his chest. Pachita nuzzles into the warmth, closing his eyes with content as he listens to the boy's soothing heartbeat. The gentle embrace brings a feeling of shared solace. Izuku's dog nestles against him as he says, I wonder what your dream is, Pachita. They snuggle some more from that position before moving their cuddles to the desk chair. Izuku restarts the recording of All Might's debut, watching it again. Instead of cringing, Pachita watches along with him this time. They stay seated there together for what's practically a feature film's runtime as the video loops. All the while, Izuku pets Pachita as the dog burrows into his lap. The companionship brings a smile to each of their faces as they relish in the moment. Eventually, Izuku carries his pet over to the Bakugos. With Aunt Mitsuki and Kakan expecting him, he doesn't want to keep them waiting too long. Pachita squirms a little in his grip as he carries the dog up the steps to his childhood friend's house. Knock it off, he whispers in an attempt to mellow the animal's mood. Except, when he rings the doorbell, Pachita only struggles even more. Fine, Izuku groans as he crouches to let the dog slip his grip, I'll put you down. The door creaks open to reveal a pointy-haired blonde the same age as Izuku. He glowers at his childhood friend before redirecting the glare towards Pachita. The boy's lips curl into a snarl as he asks, What the fuck is that freak of nature doing here, Deku? Izuku flinches as though he's been struck across the cheek by the verbal jab. Pachita glances upwards at his owner, noting his keeper's downtrodden demeanor. It's not the first time that Kakan rearranged the kanji in Izuku's name to make it mean useless, but it still takes the boy by surprise. Izuku shakes it off with the rest of his body's trembling as he tries to respond within his wobbly voice. Aunt Mitsuki said I could see come over, s so I thought. But my mom did not say you could bring that damned misfit mud of yours with you. The sudden shout interrupts Izuku and nearly causes him to trip as he shrinks back from the sharp spike of tone. Izuku's shoe scrapes the brim of the stair step that he's backed against. The end of his sneaker leaning over the ledge. Diadishi, Kaken's second shout pushes Izuku the rest of the way so that he takes a step down. The blonde boy looks down on his green-haired neighbor from the higher ground. Izuku meets the eyes of his childhood friend, green melted down by the burning red glare. Izuku looks down, averting his gaze out of instinctive fear. He stammers as he tries to sound unaffected. And no, I, I just thought, figures a loser like you would get a pet just as shitty, but the insults keep pushing him down. Literally, Izuku is forced back another step on the staircase. Kaken sneers as he shakes his head with contempt. No wonder you don't have any fucking friends. Izuku clenches the part of his chest that covers his heart, hand grabbing a fistful of his All Might themed shirt. K. Kaken, I thought we were friends. His eyes shudder in shock as he tries not to cry from how deep the boy's words cut into his feeling. We're fucking not. The ashen blonde snaps viciously. Pachita winces back with Izuku before looking between each of the boys, deeply disturbed. The dog had been made acquainted with Kaken before that he knows there's a short fuse to the kid's temper, but this is a whole new level from their meeting. When are you gonna get it through your thick stupid skull that I only let you come over because of our moms? The pointy-haired blonde lets off a few sparks from the palms of his hands via the usage of his quirk, and don't call me Kaken. 
Biba, Izuku whimpers in response to the display of power as an intimidation tactic. A quirkless kid fares no chance against someone with such a strong ability like Kaken's explosive quirk. As such, Pachita defends his owner, growling as a warning to match the brash blonde's threat. Oi, you got a fucking problem. Kaken pivots to face Pachita and growls in return. More miniature detonations come from the boy's palms as he stomps towards the tiny animal. Looks like your dumb dog is trying to protect you, shitty Deku. A vein bulges from the blonde's forehead when Pachita doesn't back down from the bully. Izuku's mouth drops agape as he looks between his pet and his childhood friend challenging one another. The boy forces himself to form words from his parted lips. Pee Pachita, don't. Worried about them getting hurt. The small dog obeys, looking away from the blonde to his owner with uncertainty. The blonde bully, however, doesn't back down. Izuku sees his childhood friend winding up for a kick and shouts, Kaken, no. The punt nails Izuku in the side as he dives in the way, scooping Pachita into his arms and taking the brunt of the damage. The boy falls down the rest of the stairs, landing hard on his back. Boy, you damned nerd. Kaken's eyes widen in shock as he's stunned momentarily by the sacrificial move. He stomps down the stairs to check on Izuku's well-being while casting a glance over his shoulder to make sure nobody saw the accident. That kick wasn't meant for you, it was meant for your dumb dog. When he reaches the bottom of the steps and he realizes there are no witnesses though, the blonde's frown morphs into a horribly wicked grin. But this one, he swings his leg right into the down boy's back. That one's just for you, damn Deku. Izuku grunts when more pain gets added to his already bruising body. He folds himself inwards, preserving Pachita's safety even more as he takes the next few hits as well. K Kaken, P please us stop. Izuku's desperate whine only urges the bully to continue his assault. I told you to stop calling me that. The blonde stomps on the other boy. He keeps his foot in place, grinding his shoe back and forth to really drive in the pain. We're not friends. A swift kick pounds against the defensive arm barrier Izuku put up between himself and Pachita. The only friend that you've got is that dumb dog of yours. Seeing that the simple beating is getting him nowhere, the bully pops a few bursts of flame from his hands with the intent to use his quirk. Before Izuku can receive burns to add to his misery though, his luck bails him out. The blonde boy's mother bellows from the house. What are you yelling about, you brat? Mitsuki's son stops short, startled by the interruptive shout. He checks around him, hoping that she isn't around the corner and that there isn't anyone else watching. When he sees that there are no witnesses to his bullying, he yells back at her, Nothing, you old hack. Izuku peeks through half-lidded eyes when he hears his aunt Mitsuki ask, Who's at the door? What he sees instead of the woman is her son's menacing scowl that tells him without words not to let her know he's there. Nobody. The young Bekugo barks back. Then, at a lower decibel that only Izuku can hear, he says it again. Nobody Izuku feels spat on as the blonde turns on his heel and heads up the staircase to leave him behind at the bottom. Only after his childhood friend is gone with a slam of the door does Izuku dare to uncurl from his balled-up protective form. Despite being the one covered in bruises and speaking through a busted lip, Pee Pachita, are you alright? The boy's concern is for his completely unharmed dog. Pachita mules as he licks the blood oozing from Izuku's mouth in response. Van's best friend is the boy's only friend as the dog also licks the rest of his owner's wounds. No matter the amount of pressure that she applies, the handkerchief soaks itself red, an all too familiar incarnadine and rank liquid gushing through the fabric to get between her fingers so that it may ooze under her hand. Inko hacks into the cloth that she's using to cover her mouth, fighting back a gag reflex as the white material shades red. The violent cough momentarily puts her mind in a fog that she nearly forgets she's driving. She eases on the brake so that the car will come to a slow and steady stop. Another slew of blood spills out of her mouth and onto the malquire. The woman feels lightheaded as she rests the top of her skull against the steering wheel. Inko almost closes her eyes to rest but her lids snap open and she jumps to sit up straight when she hears her son ask from the passenger seat. Allergies again, mom. The boy's mother hurriedly bunches up the napkin to hide her illness before flashing him a fake smile. Remembering that she's not alone in the vehicle, she sees the grounds of Yua behind him through the window, also recalling that she's dropping him off for his first day of hero school. She feigns wiping her nose, sniffling for added effect. It must be all those cherry blossoms. The same lie has somehow kept her disease hidden from her son all this time and she has yet to reveal the truth to him. To maintain the illusion, and Ko changes the subject with a dismissive wave of herself. But don't you worry about me, you need to focus on your big day. Izuku cocks his head to the side, staring at her closely almost with a hint of confusion. Inko shudders when his hand places itself over hers. For a moment, she thinks that he's finally figured her out and seen through the healthy facade. But the tender touch and moving expression is just that of an ordinary concern as he says, I'll always worry about you, mom. Inko stares at her son, stupefied. She nearly chokes on a wet sob as she tries not to become emotional. 
Silly boy. Her head shakes to Deidre the tears that threaten to spill over but she ultimately has to wipe them away with her hand. You're the one throwing themselves in danger to be a hero before she can reach over and give her boy a hug. The school bell rings to indicate classes are beginning. Oh, you should get going. You don't want to be late. And Ko realizes she has to cut their farewell short and urges him to go with a gesture. Right. Bye, mom. Izuku pushes open the passenger door and climbs out. He carries his bento box in one hand and hoists his backpack over a shoulder with the other before looking back, see you later. Inko waves and smiles one last time. Then, the door gets shut. It closes the space between her and her son. Bye, Izuku. The ill mother no longer suppresses her coughs as she watches her grown child head into the school building. Once inside, Izuku quickens his pace as he searches the long corridors. 1A, 1A. His classroom and number had been included on the acceptance letter he was sent in the mail but he can't find it. He passes a door labeled 1B right before turning a corner and bumping into someone. Oop, sorry. When Izuku takes a staggering step backwards, he sees an emaciated man in oversized clothes. Despite the skeletal figure's sickly appearance, the stranger chuckles heartedly and assures the boy, it's quite alright. Young man two wilted tufts of blonde hair hang over the guy's gaunt face as he tries waving away Izuku's concerns. It's my fault for not watching where I was going. But Izuku waves his hands faster while frantically bowing apologetically anyways. No, no. I insist. It's my fault. Concern is written all over the boy's face as he stares up at the haggard-looking man. Are you okay? He worriedly looks behind him and leans to check beyond the hall. Perfectly fine. The gangly blonde continues gesturing with his hands to assure Izuku before returning the boy's concerned expression. Are you okay? You look lost. Izuku bristles a bit at the reminder of his tardiness. He bashfully scratches the top of his head while glancing over his shoulder once more. Oh oh, yeah. You wouldn't happen to know where class 1 is. The blonde's smile looks oddly familiar to Izuku. You're on the right path. But he's much too locked into the details of finding his class to think deep about it. Just keep heading the way that you're going and you'll find it at the center of the hall. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Izuku returns the man's smile and bows a few more times to express his gratitude before jogging down the corridor. The blonde watches the boy go before continuing on his own way in the opposite direction. Izuku not too long afterwards finds the entrance to his classroom just as the man had said he would. The door is slightly slid open, left ajar so that the boy can hear the grumbled complaints from someone inside. You're a rowdy bunch, aren't you? It took you all eight minutes to quiet down. Izuku pushes the door the rest of the way so that he can enter, and he finds himself accidentally interrupting what must be his teacher. An unkempt man with a slender stature and stubble unshaven across his frowning face stands behind the front desk, turning his gaze to the room's newcomer. Um, sorry that I'm late. Izuku nervously waves when he sees his classmates have also all collectively taken to staring at him. The teacher closes his half-lidded eyes the rest of the way as he sighs. You'll fit right into this class. I can tell the man half-heartedly gestures with one of his lanky arms towards the desks. Grab a seat, motivating Izuku to hurriedly go for the remaining one at the back of the room. Izuku has to force back a gasp when he sees Kyoko across from him. I shouldn't be expecting any other last-minute students, should I? And the teacher takes that as a sign of some sort to not let him off the hook just yet. And no, sir. Izuku shrinks in on himself as he tries to hide his embarrassment. A few snickers break out from some of the other students. Good. The pedagogue shifts his focus off of Izuku to address everyone all at once. Because I'm only going to say this once everyone quiets down and listens intently to the man as he says, This is the hero course, not a playground. You should act like adults and not children while in this class. The teacher pauses to let the strict doctrine settle in. He then turns to face the chalkboard behind him and writes his name in big kanji. I'm your homeroom teacher, Shota Aizawa. I'd say pleasure to meet you. But you have yet to prove yourselves hero material to me. The class is taken aback by the statement but further surprised when Aizawa pulls out a set of UA's exercise uniforms. Change into your gym clothes and head out to the grounds if you want to change that. And do so quickly. Time is a valuable resource. Hey, what about the entrance ceremony? Or guidance lessons? Another girl that Izuku recognizes in his class raises her hand to object. She's the girl with a brunette bob that he saved from being crushed by the zero pointer. There's no use wasting time on that stuff if I deem you can't cut it in the hero course. Aizawa carelessly dismisses her before pointing an authoritative finger towards the door. Now, hurry along and get changed before I don't even bother giving you the chance to prove yourselves for making me impatient. His tone tightens just enough that the class gets going almost immediately after he gives the order. No running in the halls. A tall boy with blue hair and rectangular bifocals chops his arms as he tries to stop them all from trampling over one another, while a blonde boy with a tail anxiously tries to weave his way through the crowded doorway. 
Who knew this place was so competitive? Izuku lingers back with the few students that silently agreed it'd be smarter to wait for the traffic to mellow out first, one of which is the purple-haired girl he became friends with beforehand. Kayoka casually waves as she joins him at his side. Yo, Midoriya. Jay Jiru. Hey. Izuku exclaims with a mixture of relief and nerves. He's happy to see a familiar friendly face. But her close proximity makes him fidget more than usual. Kayoka smirks, happy to tease the boy that she's befriended. First day tardiness, huh? Not exactly the best impression to make. She feigns some sass with one hand rested on her hip. I didn't exactly plan on it. Izuku wrings his hands together while looking down at the floor in shame. Even now, he can still feel some stares lingering on him. When he looks up, he sees his teacher's hard glare and half expects the man's eyes to glow red. Seeing that he's taking her jesting to heart, Kayoka eases up on him. Nobody tries to be late, you just are. She gives him a light punch on the arm to let him know it's just a joke, but forget that, and then raises her ear jacks as a threatening display to shift his worries to her. I wanna know why you didn't tell me that you made it in or that we'd be in the same class. Izuku's eyes expand as wide as his mouth opens when he realizes that he's in danger. The boy may not have much experience with girls, but he knows enough from his mother to understand he made a mistake. I am sorry. He tries to calm her down with a panicked apology. But Kayoka shows zero mercy, Jack's jabbing him in the side of his neck to deliver a small shock. Not too far from the two, a boy with a lightning bolt in his blonde hair watches in envy. A shorter boy with purple balls atop his head shares the same sentiment. Aw oh man, first day and that guy's already got a girlfriend. The small member of the duo slouches in dismay. Dang, and I had my eyes set on her. The blonde looks away before he gets any more jealous and continues to follow the flow of the class to the locker rooms. I I didn't know we'd share the same class. Izuku slowly stands back up as he rubs the throbbing spot on his neck. Once he recovers, he looks up with a tentative gaze. Biba, Kayoka is caught off guard by how vibrant his eyes are compared to his smile as he says, I'm glad we are. SH shut it, and she impulsively zaps him with her ear jacks again. Izuku goes down a second time, shouting before his body thuds against the floor. A tall girl with her hair tied into a pointed ponytail casts them a troubled look. We should probably hasten ourselves so we don't upset our teacher. Her gaze goes from Izuku's corpse to the culprit. The bespeckled blue-haired boy nods behind her as he too takes in the scene. A girl whose skin is as pink as her hair shoves her way through them to get a look at the scene for herself. A massive grin stretches across her face. Or maybe you two lovebirds could get changed to the ear. She sings songs teasingly while tapping the tips of the horns atop her head. Awa, they're so cute together. Another voice comes seemingly out of nowhere. It takes everyone a moment to realize the empty space that spoke wasn't a ghost, but an invisible girl only visible by her floating school uniform. SH shut it. Kayoka's face burns bright red until she explodes with embarrassment and lashes out with her ear jacks a third time. The coils snake through the air and stab themselves into Izuku's neck on either side. The boy spasms from the shock as he screams. I didn't even say or do anything this time. The bespeckled boy reaches down and grabs Izuku by the back of his school blazer's collar. We shouldn't be idling in the halls. He reprimands his classmate and begins dragging Izuku like luggage. I didn't do anything. Izuku continues to moan in agony as he's pulled into the boy's locker room. Once inside, his carrier hoists him up to stand upright on his own. By the way, I am Tenya Ida from Sumi Private Academy. The boy adjusts his glasses as he takes a step back to introduce himself, and then bows at the waist. I look forward to being your classmate as prospective heroes. Oh oh, me too. Izuku jumps in surprise. He hadn't been expecting the boy to be so polite. Izuku hastily returns the bow with several. I I mean, I'm Izuku Midoriya and I'm happy to meet you too. When he realizes the others are also in the locker room changing, he turns to face them too and bow, all of you. Nice to meet you, Midoriya. A boy with his hair spiked downwards throws Izuku a broad smile to show his appreciation before introducing himself. I'm Hanta Siro on my Jiro Kirishima. It wasn't very manly to show up late, but you seem like a cool guy, and the boy beside him with red hair pointed upwards also returns the greeting. Izuku blinks once he's finished pulling his shirt over his head. Oh oh. Th thanks. Confused by that last part from my Jiro about being manly. But the macho boy moves on from introductions to invading Izuku's personal space before Izuku can have the time to dwell on it. Whoa, what's with that little thing? Is that your quirk? Ajiro is roped in by the small cord dangling from Izuku's sternum. TCH, Izuku's childhood friend scoffs from a nearby bench to make matters worse. The blonde finishes zipping up his PE jacket before shoving his hands in his pants pockets and storming off. Izuku opens his mouth to call after the boy, but swallows whatever words he could have said instead. He hadn't noticed Katsuki Bakugo in his class roster until now somehow, but he figures he shouldn't be surprised. Izuku's gaze returns to Ijiro when he turns his head back to attention and he places a hand over the wire exposed upon his bare chest. Oh, um, why yeah. 
It's suddenly hard to speak to anyone at all. Beat. What's it do? But Ijiro's energetic attitude doesn't seem to notice Izuku's reluctance. The redhead flashes an encouraging shark-toothed grin. Can we pull it? The blonde with a lightning streak perks up at the mention of Izuku's quirk and shares some of his own curiosity with a leering lean forward. Is it a kinky thing? The short ball-headed boy that hangs out with the blonde chimes in from beside him. And Izuku soon finds himself backing away from nearly all the boys in his class as they all yearn to know about his quirk. He holds up his hands in an attempt to passively ward them off. Gee guys, I'm not very comfortable. Please provide Midoriya with space. But Tenya comes to his rescue by stepping in between him and the other boys so that he doesn't have to do anything else. If he doesn't wish to disclose his quirk's details, then it is not our place to push him. The bespeckled boy adjusts his glasses before glaring at everyone through them that dared to upset Izuku. Ajiro leans back before realizing his mistake and slumping his shoulders despondently. Oh. Right. Sorry. Midoribro his apology is sincere as he looks into Izuku's eyes. Yeah, I know what it's like to get teased for having a mutation type quirk, so I'm sorry if I pressured you or anything. Hunter raises his elbows to show his quirk morphed them into the shape of cylindrical tape dispensers. As an attempt to empathize with Izuku, nobody should feel embarrassed for something they can't control. A boy with a raven's head chimes in to show his support as well. It helps when more mutation types nod along in agreement like a boy with six arms or another boy with an unevenly shaped head. I, I appreciate it, guys. But it's nothing like that. Izuku lowers his defensive hand stance to assure them before reaching around the back of his head with one to prod at his hair. I just, I'll show you when the time is right. Hanta gives Izuku a thumbs up and another one of what must be his own trademark grins. Good enough for me. The boy finishes pulling on his gym jacket before standing up to leave. Behind him, the blonde boy with a tail awkwardly scratches his head. I mean, we did just meet, so that makes sense. He shrugs before following Hanta out. We must not dally anymore anyways. Tenya chops at the air like it had also offended Izuku somehow before gesturing for everyone to hurry. Aizawa sensei is waiting. Oh crud. You're right. Izuku bristles when he remembers the stern teacher and rushes to finish getting dressed. He nearly trips as he slides a leg into his sweatpants. The blonde with the lighting bolt laughs as he passes by. Looks like your tardiness is rubbing off on us, Midoriya. Oh no, I'm so sorry. Which only causes Izuku to panic even more. He tries bowing apologetically while still sliding his foot through the other leg hole of his pants. Ajiro laughs along as he claps Izuku on the shoulder. The boy stumbles but catches himself as the redhead exits. See you out there, man. The slow steps from the only other remaining boy in the locker room barely make an audible tap on the floor's tile as he approaches Izuku. Heterochromic eyes peer out through multicolored hair that split down the middle as he says, Your quirk. If you. Izuku waits patiently after the boy's voice trails off. Never mind. The tone turns cold before the boy pushes past. Izuku is left standing alone in the changing room completely dumbfounded by the interaction. He exhales heavily before throwing on the last of his gym uniform and jogging after everyone. By the time that he catches up to his class, they're all already heading outside. Hey, Kayoka sidles up next to Izuku before matching his pace. What took you so long? And nothing, just took my time getting changed is all. Izuku tries not to glance in the direction of the bi-colored boy as the class congregates. Unbeknownst to him, the boy doesn't share that same sentiment and shamelessly stares at Izuku. You sure it has nothing to do with why that guy over there has been giving you the evil eye ever since you got here? But Kayoka notices another boy staring instead. Izuku follows her gaze to a familiar blonde. Crimson eyes meet emerald green. Izuku looks away. Oh oh, that's just Ka, and falters when he thinks about the falling out that he had with his childhood friend. Back you go. He and I grew up together, so we have a bit of a history. Izuku tries focusing on Kayoka rather than the blonde as he explains the delicate relationship as briefly as possible. Drama. Do tell. But Kayoka's curiosity urges Izuku to continue explaining. Before he can, the two get split apart by the girl with a brunette bob as she tries to get in between them. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I've been meaning to say ever since I saw you. She turns away from Kayoka to face Izuku in order to give him a bright and bubbly smile. You're that boy that saved me from the zero pointer, right? Whoa, you took down the zero pointer. Baby you are manly. Ajiro perks up when he overhears what she said and speaks loud enough for everyone else to know the same thing he heard. And you did it saving a girl. The shortest of the class whines just as audibly while clutching the balls atop his head like stress relievers. That's hot. The girl with horns and a pink pigmentation bites the bottom of her lip while sizing Izuku up and down. She sneaks a glance towards Kayoka to make sure the girl doesn't notice her evaluation of the boy before returning to her ogling. Remarkable. Tenya admires Izuku along with everyone else. The sun gleams off his glasses as he pushes them up from the brim of his nose. Impressive. A girl with green hair presses a finger to her mouth as she studies Izuku with her own stare. She also adds a small, ribbit, that somehow sounds just as respectful. 
Perhaps I misjudged you. The girl with the pointy ponytail tilts her head to the side as she tries to see whatever everyone else is seeing in Izuku. Beside her, Katsuki grumbles while rolling his eyes. Overwhelmed by all their praise, Izuku fumbles with his hands as he tries figuring out how to respond. Unable to meet their gazes, he looks upwards at the sky. Ah, uh, everyone just, I see you're all still stuck on socializing and causing a ruckus, but his sight gets drawn back down to the ground when he hears the arrival of his teacher. Aizawa's eyelids still sag so that they're half shut. His voice sounds just as exhausted as he looks as he says, You're not a very rational bunch, are you? The class collectively bows and apologizes, sorry, sensei. That was a rhetorical question. Aizawa pinches the skin between his eyes as he closes them. After sighing and shaking his head, whatever. Just be quiet and listen. He gestures to the marked training grounds and begins explaining their presence there. Softball throwing, the 50-meter dash, the standing long jump. Any of those exercises ring some bells. They are your standard no-quirk-allowed gym tests in middle school. Well, you'll now do them again with your quirks as an apprehension test. The sights markers and equipment suddenly looks familiar to the class. Someone is so thrilled about getting to use their quirk that they exclaim, Whoa, awesome. Awesome, which results in a harsh glare from their teacher. Did you not hear me say this is a test? Whoever lands last on the placement chart will be deemed not worthy of hero material and will face expulsion. Aizawa suddenly looks like a villain when his face stretches into a malicious grin. How's that for awesome? What? No way. The pink girl box and becomes so pale that she loses her unique pigmentation. See can he really do that? Hanta nervously scratches at the curved edge of an elbow while glancing around at the others. And the brunette girl tries raising her hand to object like she had in the classroom. But it's only the first day. Even if it weren't, that's totally unfair. Natural disasters, highway pileups, rampaging villains. I'd say the types of challenges you'll be facing should you follow the career path of a hero is also unfair. Aizawa shuts her up with a logical response before flicking his focus to the rest of the class. Consider this crash course your first taste of what that'll be like. Starting with Tenya, they start to murmur in solemn agreement. So this is what it's like to strive for the top, as expected of Yue. He flexes his fingers to make his hand into a fist as he gets himself into the right mental state for the challenge. If we have no other choice but to overcome our obstacles. The girl with her hair tied back nods so that her ponytail bobs up and down with the motion. Izuku watches as everyone but himself comes to accept the teacher's terms. Hey, Midoriya, you gonna be okay? I mean, your quirk anxiety and all. Only when Kayoka places a hand on his shoulder does he get drawn out of his internal panic. He's relieved to see her consoling expression when he turns to look at her. Quirk anxiety. The brunette girl pipes in as she flicks her focus from Kayoka to Izuku for an answer. Kayoka shifts her hand to grab the brunette's shoulder next, a bit more roughly than she had with Izuku. Yeah, so keep your trap shut about what you saw when he saved you, alright. Her voice takes a sharp tone that surprises both the girl and Izuku before it levels out. For his sake, you'll do it if you're truly grateful. Oh okay, the brunette responds with a shaky nod. Then she stiffens straighter and nods with more resolve. I won't say anything. I promise. There's a commitment that time for her affirmation. Th thanks. Izuku looks between both girls before turning his gaze downwards. He finds himself staring at his chest, placing a hand over his heart. But I'll have to use it eventually. And then there'll be no hiding. Izuku's voice catches in his throat before he can finish what he's saying. Back you go. Aizawa singles out the blonde boy but his shout gains everybody's attention. Izuku is especially drawn to the mention of his former friend. How far could you throw in middle school? Aizawa waves Katsuki over from the rest of the class. 67 meters. Katsuki mumbles his answer while kicking a pebble that's in his path to the teacher. Try now with your quirk. Aizawa holds out a softball for the boy to take. After Katsuki grabs it, the teacher produces a handheld device that will track the distance the ball gets thrown. Give it all that you've got. He nods for the blonde to go ahead and perform to the best of his abilities. Katsuki looks between the ball in his hand and the teacher as he registers the permission to use his quirk. Heh. You want me to add some boom to my pitch, eh? He tosses the ball up and down to catch a few times as a wicked grin spreads across his face. Then, Katsuki winds up for the pitch, and he lets loose. Die. A massive explosion erupts from his palm that launches the softball into the stratosphere. Die. Izuku questions the brash boy's war cry under the cheering chorus of oohs and ahs. Manly. Ajiro shouts through his shark-toothed smile. Izuku swears that he sees stars in the redhead's eyes. The applause diminishes when Aizawa starts speaking again. 
It's important for us to know our limits the teacher's voice demands everyone's undivided attention as he explains the purpose of the physical exercises. That's the first rational step to figuring out what must be done to surpass those limits he then shows them all the reading on the handheld device. 705 meters. Seriously? The invisible girl expresses her astonishment with a full body recoil and bounce. At least the boy with balls on his head takes notice of the emotive school uniform, her skirt flicking each way with her overly exaggerated motions. Whoa, a muscular boy with short spiked brown hair stares with wide eyes as he reads the number on the device alongside everyone else. Midoriya, Aizawa's shout startles Izuku so bad that the broccoli-headed boy almost falls from how hard he flinches. When Izuku looks around at his classmates and points towards himself for confirmation, his teacher nods. You're next. Aizawa raises his index finger to be aimed at the boy. Good luck. Kayoko winces sympathetically but tries to be as encouraging as possible for him. Izuku smiles to show his appreciation. Get up here and show me what you've got. Aizawa ushers the boy forward with his finger. Izuku takes a hesitant step towards his teacher. His shaky hand places itself over the cord beneath his gym jacket as he's asked. Or is being a hero not your dream? A crispy cool draft of wind whips over a bombora. That same air catching a fragrance once the wave breaks. From that gust comes a light mist of brine. The ocean breeze coating people on the pier with a salty scent. The cheetah catches a whiff of the smell while his owner's errant strands of hair are tossed as roughly as the sea beneath their feet. The rotting posts of the old pier creak with each step as they push through the rush of wind. Izuku holds an ice cream cone in one hand and his dog's leash in the other. He earns a few looks as Pachita trots ahead of him. Chainsaw mounted upon the mutt's head held high and proud like a unicorn's horn. The taste of a chocolate scoop is bittersweet as it melts and drips on the boy's hand. The sweltering sun beats down on them as much as it dries the wooden panels of the decking they walk on. A ferris wheel moves in slow dizzying spins ahead of the duo, marking the end of the pier. The cheetah yaps at a single seagull that pecks at scraps in a garbage can. The bird flies away frantically, disturbed by the noise. The fry that had been in the winged animal's beak falls onto the floorboards below, abandoned. The cheetah picks up the piece of food with his tongue and swallows it for himself, licking his chops with what must be self-satisfaction. The small dog's name tag sways with a jingle when he looks up at his owner for some sort of praise. Izuku just laughs and bends down to pat his pet on the back. The vending machines occupying the guardrails hum as the two pass by. An elderly couple whisper while they occupy the bench by the ferris wheel. Izuku sighs as he finishes his ice cream cone. He remembers a time at the beach when his mom had sat there and waited for him to finish riding the amusement ride, a canned coffee in hand that came from those automats. A napkin stained with ketchup blows past, slipping through one of the spaces in the planking after a few uptakes and downtakes. The cheetah whines, looking up at his owner with concern. Izuku looks down before lowering himself onto one knee. It's okay, boy. He pets behind one of the dog's ears. We'll see mama when we get home. The fur coat brushing along the boy's fingers is just as soothing to him as it is to the animal. Izuku's nose inhales the smell of buttered popcorn. The added salty touch unclear of whether that's the snack or the sea still. A smile glosses the boy's mouth as he stands back up. He just had ice cream, but he figures he can share another tasty treat with his loyal companion. There's just enough yen in his pocket for the small serving size. Before he can approach the vendor to buy himself a bag though, the bliss of the beach is disturbed by alarming yells. Izuku turns his head to see what all the commotion is about. Civilians flee from the back of the pier, racing past the boy and his dog. Izuku searches a bit with his gaze before spotting the reason why. The elderly couple from earlier are cowering under the long blade of what looks like a cephalopodic pirate. The child's eyes widen with shock. He knows what's happening thanks to watching so many videos on the internet but he's never seen a villain attack in person before, reacting without a second thought. Izuku's legs move on their own. He lets go of Pachita's leash and runs towards the danger without any sense of how to help despite the desire to do so. The criminal's head turns. Noticing him, the villain's face is the mantle of an octopus, tentacles trimming the bottom like a beard. The broad sword in one of the fiend's many suction-cupped hands flicks from the seniors to the minor. Back off, stupid kid. A gurgled threat comes from the villain's mouth as he does an intimidating prodding gesture with his cutlass. Izuku doesn't listen. He ducks under the blade and latches onto one of the pirate's high-booted legs. Though small and light, the boy's improvised plan is to hold the criminal in place long enough for the seniors to escape. Run, Izuku shouts as he interlocks his fingers to strengthen his hold on the villain. He closes his eyes as tight as his grip when the criminal tries shaking him off in protest. Get out of here. Izuku yells again in the hope that the elderly couple will listen and use his distraction as the chance they need to flee. When he hears the sound of feet pounding against wooden floorboards, he's relieved to know that he succeeded. But the boy forgot about his own safety. The pirate shoves the kid off, knocking Izuku on his butt. The villain growls as he swipes at the air with his sword, Brat. Now look at what you've done. 
The old pair that Izuku rescued ran far enough away that the criminal can no longer victimize them. They were going to be my payday. Izuku tries crawling backwards to also escape the villain's wrath but the pirate simply stomps after him. Izuku whimpers when the steel sword raised above him glints in the sun. The villain's shadow enveloping him in darkness to see its sharpness all the better. He fantasizes All Might coming to his rescue and defeating the fiend in one blow. He imagines some hero, any hero, swooping in to save the day. He thinks they should have been here by now. The police, at least, could come to his aid. The boy wishes for his mother to be there with him so that she can protect him. A cheetah. But Izuku instead finds his pet dog jumping in between him and the villain. The little orange animal snarls with as much intimidation as he can muster while protectively placing himself between the criminal and his owner. The cheetah plants his feet and barks between growls, baring his fangs. The pirate hesitates, taken aback by the tiny creature's ferocity, but quickly recovers his own tenacity. Why, you little mutt. The villain points his weapon downwards and thrusts it forward. The jab makes the blade spear Pachita, eliciting a yelp from the small canine. P-O-C-H-I-T-A. Izuku shrieks as he catches his wounded pet in his arms. Tears stream out in large sprays like the blood spewing from the dog's injury. Izuku rolls over to get on his hands and knees, one arm clutching Pachita close to his chest so that he can make an effort to crawl away. The next yowl of agony comes from the blade passing through the boy's back and out the other end, stabbing into Pachita a second time. Damn dogs and kids. The villain withdraws his sword and more blood leaks through the planks of the pier. He brings his blade back down so that it lances through Izuku's shoulder in order to express his rage. I can't stand them. Izuku howls in torment as he holds Pachita close to him, their life liquids mixing into a sopping mess of red. The dagger cuts through them both a few more times, chopping at the boy and his pet until their breaths turn as ragged as their bodies. The villain cocks his boot back, winding up, and then kicks Izuku in the side with his pointed foot. The boy barrels through the wood railing of the pier, splinters raining down with him into the water below. He takes his dog with him, blood splashing against the ocean. Red blends with blue, the dark shades trailing behind Izuku and Pachita as they sink into the black depths of the sea. Izuku's eyelids become too heavy for him to hold open. The boy's hands slacken as they become numb and he's no longer able to feel Pachita in his arms. He's colder than he's ever been before. The ocean swallows him and he succumbs to the void. Izuku opens his eyes, finding himself out in the forest instead of underwater. The sun still gleams down on him, making him squint until he diverts his gaze. The heavy pressure that had been pressing down on his chest remains. He sees that the weight is coming from Pachita, the dog seated atop him. Both of their injuries are gone. Izuku wonders if he somehow fell asleep and took a nap in the middle of the woods. Except, he begins to recognize the part of the wilderness that he's in. It's the spot that he found Pachita at. It's where they first met. I've always loved listening to you talk about your dreams. A soft voice comes from Pachita's mouth that astounds Izuku. The boy becomes slack-jawed, unable to form his own words to respond with. It seems that Pachita wants him to listen instead of speak anyways when he says more firmly. This is a contract Izuku's chest blooms with heat, and he remembers the freezing ocean that had been killing him. I'll give you my heart. Pachita leans in close and almost seems to sink into the boy's chest. In exchange, the bond between the boy and his dog grows exponentially. Their life forces merge together and bring them back from the verge of death. Izuku's eyes close and he's once again transported to a different location. He's back submerged in blood and water, being baptized and reborn. He hears Pachita's whisper in his ear, show me your dreams, and wakes up. A virulent transformation bursts forth from the ichor waves. The abrasive sound of chainsaws wailing upon startup. Blood oozes from deep gashes made by the chains of metallic teeth. But the lacerations from the villain's cutlass have miraculously healed. Jagged fangs bear themselves from within the demonic mechanical shape of a chainsaw for a head. Izuku's new form glowers at the pirate that cut him down through the harsh glow of amber eyes. What the foo, the villain gets cut off mid-sentence when Izuku swings one of his chainsaw-bladed arms. Literally, a tentacle appendage flops to the floorboards, writhing as it gushes blood out of the severed end. A harrowing howl escapes the criminal's throat as he clutches the dismembered part of his body. Red liquid oozes over the suction cups that cling to his ripped raw flesh. Be bastard. The pirate speaks with a tremor that matches his staggered steps away from the savage chainsaw child. The bumps of papillae covering the anthropomorphized octopus begin pulsating around the amputated area. Collagen fibers stretch over the torn tissue and begin regrowing skin around the epidermis. You're lucky that I can regenerate lost limbs. The pirate curses under his breath as the tentacle that was taken from him gets replaced. The new appendage is a duller shade of pink from the rest of his saracen body. Izuku primes the chainsaws protruding from his arms, revving them with the one attached to the base of his skull. Good. His voice sounds as demonically distorted as he appears. The villain feels his skin prickle from the chill of the ocean air as the monstrous mutation menaciously growls through the grating noise of chainsaws. 
Then I don't have to feel bad about chopping you into calamari. The villain turns his sword to block another haphazard swing of Izuku's bladed arm. The moving teeth grind into the steel, gradually chipping away at the metal. Exhaust fumes seed through the boy's sharpened teeth before he chops upwards with his other arm. The pirate's cutlass snaps in two from the combined sawing motions. The tip clatters against the pier's planking while the other half remains clasped in the criminal's suction cup grip. Izuku slashes at the villain with wild broad strokes, giving his target a chance to evade. That doesn't ease any of the pressure on the criminal though. Oi! Christ, kid! The trimming of a chainsaw nicks where the cephalopodic man's deltoid should be, ripping into flexible webbing instead. Blood splatters the deck, spilling from the wound. Izuku heaves forward to get another cut in, but misses when the criminal sidesteps. The villain kicks the crazed child away with a desperate shout. Are you trying to kill me? Izuku's feet slide across the pier's slick surface, only stopping when he stabs the boarding with his arm's saw blade. The boy's body bends inward but his modified head raises itself to glare at the villain. Spittle flies from the living engine's maw, fangs razor sharp and gnashing together. You killed Pachita. Izuku roars with the sound of his chainsaws, a grudge over a dog. The villain stares incredulously as the boy tears his saw blades free from the deck. Terrified and without a weapon to defend himself, the octopus hybrid spews a jet of black ink from his siphon-like mouth. The wall of darkness blinds Izuku momentarily, allowing the criminal to scramble out of the raving chainsaw's reach. Suddenly, a boat comes through the tide beneath the pier much to the villain's relief. The ship is steered by a fellow cephalopod criminal, Insmith. The octopus twin bellows to his partner from below. Brother, Insmith waves his arms high to signal for the boat to turn back around for him. Izuku manages to wipe away the ink covering his eyes just as the villain grins with newfound confidence. Dark rings smudge the green under the yellow orbs of the chainsaw mount as the boy watches the villain run for the railing. Pray we don't meet again, kid. Insmith hops off the pier and lands on his brother's boat below in order to escape. Izuku takes a step forwards to chase after Pachita's killer, but his leg gives out and he winds up falling forward onto his knees. All he can do is watch helplessly as the villain gets away. The chains on the saws stop running and he lets out a wet cough. The blades begin to retract. Izuku's baby teeth replace the elongated fangs and his face morphs back to its normally freckled state. He's left a sobbing mess in the middle of the blood-stained pier. Dangling from Izuku's sternum is the same pull cord that had been Pachita's tail, the only remaining part of his dog. Izuku stares down at the ball within his grasp. His fingers curl around its spherical shape, clenching tightly to not let it slip away. All of his classmates are watching with anticipation after Katsuki's fireworks show, expecting something of equal level. Though his teacher doesn't have any expression other than resting bitch face, Izuku is pretty sure that Aizawa is in a similar state of suspense. There's not much to be done should he transform right here and now but he knows that he can't just simply toss the ball normally either. Weighing his options, he shifts his hold on the ball. That's when he gets an idea. He opens his mouth to ask Aizawa about the rules of the throw, but something comes out other than words. Warm murky fluid bubbles up the boy's throat until it breaches the exit of his mouth. A jet of red liquid spills out, the copper taste making Izuku wretch. The firm grip he has on the soft ball suddenly becomes very weak, loosening and allowing it to slip free from his fingers. He hunches over when his sides ache and that pain blossoms into another wave of blood climbing out. Izuku's throat burns more than his ribcage as he coughs on his own bodily fluids. Midoriya, Kayoka moves forward to help her friend as soon as she notices his extreme nausea. But the other students crowd in front of her, blocking her path. They express their own concerns and drown the girl out. Bro, are you okay? Ijiro refrains from pushing past the collection of students. His arms extend and retract, unsure of whether to reach out and help or stay back. Nod your head if you require CPR. Tenya tries shouting over the concerned crowd as he robotically searches with a stiff neck for some sort of medical practitioner. A vein bulges from Aizawa's forehead before he has enough of the commotion and silences them all in one fell swoop. Everybody just calm down. The class recoils in fear from the scary shout. Meanwhile, Izuku still struggles to get a hold on his breathing. Midoriya, are you feeling alright? Can you tell me what's wrong? Aizawa places a consoling hand on the boy's back as he leans down to the same level. I'm a fine, sensei. Izuku wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. The blood on his lips smears across his cheek from the motion. J just. Another coughing fit stalls the boy's speech. When he finally gets a handle on himself and he comes up with an excuse, his eyes widen with realization as he says, it's just allergies. All the times that his mother had similar hacking habits suddenly set off alarms in his mind. Allergies don't cause internal bleeding. Aizawa pinches the bridge of his nose as an exhibited sign of vexation. When his hand falls away from his face, he doesn't hide his frown either. I think you should go see Recovery Girl. Though the teacher's tone conveys an amount of worry Izuku usually only hears from his mother. Izuku forces himself to stand upright, trying to blow off the incident as casually as he can. 
Really, I'm fine. But his hoarse throat heaves a nasty cough that puts him back down. Izuku covers his mouth with his hand as he gags. When he pulls his hand away, blood dots his palm. Let me rephrase that. You're going to see recovery girl. Aizawa's tone turns stern as he helps Izuku regain some composure. The elaboration of that sentence being an order and not a request forces the boy to numbly nod in agreement with his teacher. Somebody should walk him there. A few of the students part for Kayoka when she speaks up amidst the grouping of them all. When the girl gets a few stares, especially a sly one from the horn pink cat, she blushes profusely. T to make sure he gets there safely. Her ear jacks wriggle with her arms as she tries to conceal her embarrassment. Tenya stiffens into a statued stance. Excellent idea. I volunteer, oblivious to the girl's mortification as he offers himself for the suggested duty. I could take him. The boy with multicolored hair surprisingly proposes himself to perform the task as well, though his demeanor is far more casual than the bespeckled boys. I, I was thinking maybe myself. Kyoka timidly taps the tips of ear jacks together the way one would with their fingers. The shy stature and quiet voice would have gone unnoticed if not for her pink classmate's shit-eating grin. Or I could. The pinkette teases her peer by getting up in Kayoka's personal space and wiggling her eyebrows suggestively. Nobody needs to go with him. But Aizawa puts a stop to the fun with his usual grumpy attitude. The teacher turns towards Izuku and turns down his temper to ask, You're capable of getting to the nurse's office alone? Right. Why yeah, I'll be fine. Izuku shakily nods before facing his class and forcing an assuring smile. Thanks for offering though, everybody. Of course. Tenya returns the smile with one of his own. Just, but Kayoka's having a hard time showing any equal optimism. She quells her worries well enough to look Izuku in the eye and say, you'd better be okay. To which Izuku gives her a single nod in response. Well, first day and someone is already about to croak. The blonde with a lightning streak in his hair whispers to the ball-headed boy beside him. Then he realizes there's a girl that resembles a frog on his other side and awkwardly whistles. Ah, uh, no offense. He scratches his head nervously with a forced laugh in a failed attempt to make the wisecrack slide. As Izuku heads for the facility doors to go back inside, he notices somebody watching from the sidelines of the field, recognizable by the man's extremely gaunt appearance. The boy recalls the skinny blonde as the person he'd bumped into while looking for his class in the halls. Though the odd fellow's eyes are sunken in, bright blue orbs find Izuku's eyes and convey compassion. A breeze brushes through Izuku's green curls as he passes by the man's hiding spot. Then he steps inside Yua and leaves the blonde behind. Though he's curious about the stranger watching the performance of he and his classmates quirks, he's far more concerned about the recent revelation of his mother hiding her bloody cough from him. That is, if his hunch about her using the same excuse as him is true. The boy's thoughts linger on his mom's well-being as he heads for the nurse's office and not his own. Despite a few more wet coughs escaping his mouth on the way there. When Izuku finally reaches the closed entrance to Recovery Girl's small infirmary, he overhears the tail end of a joke muffled by the barrier. Did you hear about the guy who lost his whole left side? He's all right now. The comedian's voice is one that the boy is all too familiar with that he knows exactly who's on the other side of the door before he slides it open. Present Mike sits on the edge of a medical mat where he has the old nurse giggling. The hero notices Izuku before she does. Hey little listener. Don't you know you can't tell a knock-knock joke without knocking first? Izuku blushes in embarrassment before trying to pull the door back closed. I didn't think about it. His tugs on the sliding mechanism work to no avail. Sorry. His face flushes even redder when he hears present Mike laughing along with recovery girl. It's no problem. Dearie, come on in. The school's nurse ushers him to enter her office once she stops giggling. Present Mike nods next to her. It was only a joke, kiddo. Izuku notices the hero's usual hairstyle of a singular spike tuft has been opted for a neatly tied man bun. It's odd seeing the pro during his off hours, an ordinary outfit instead of his uniform making him appear like a civilian. Don't tell me you ain't got a sense of humor. Mike must notice Izuku staring since he takes to twirling his pencil stash like it's a nervous tick. Oh oh, I don't know how I didn't realize. I listen to your podcasts all the time. Izuku jumps to assure his idol that he didn't take any offense before bashfully rubbing the back of his head and admitting his stare was starstrucken instead of solemnity. Hearing that, the hero perks up with a widespread grin. Ho ho, a fan, eh? He snatches a sticky note from a dispenser and steals a pen from Recovery Girl's white coat before asking, What's your name, little listener? I'll give you an autograph and a shout-out the next time I go live. Izuku's head nearly snaps off from the amount of whiplash that goes into his eager lean forward. Really, that'd be amazing. Tiny glimmers of light dance in his eyes like stars twinkling in the sky. Present Mike laughs before gently bopping the boy on the head with his pen. Not without your name, it won't be. Oh oh, right. Izuku slaps his hand against his face when he realizes his mistake. Then he quickly bows in order to properly present himself. My name is Izuku Midoriya, S sir. Recovery girl shakes her head in disbelief. 
No need to be so formal with this goofball. Midoriya the nurse gestures with her specialized cane towards the hero. Hazashi here is probably more childish than you are. Before handing him two small white devices, it's a wonder Nezu ever allowed you to teach. Hey, present Mike defensively whines despite not actually taking any offense to the teasing. His voice reverberates throughout the small medical station, shaking the window's pane and nearly causing the glass to burst. I told you to be cautious about using your quirk when you get too rambunctious which earns the hero a smack on the head from Recovery Girl's walking stick. Due to the cane's abnormal size and depth, it leaves a giant welt on the man's skull. It's shouting like that which led you to needing those hearing aids. She gestures to the two tiny objects that she handed him as though she never walloped him though. Hearing aids. Izuku disregards the nurse's poor bedside manner for the same reason. He's intrigued by the two pawns that the hero sticks into the crevices of his ears. He wouldn't be here if he didn't damage his hearing with his own quirk all the time. Recovery Girl tuts with a wag of her cane. The blunt object's movement puts the hero on edge, making him wince reflexively. One of my drawbacks, kid. Everybody has them. Mike chuckles to calm his own nerves before snapping his fingers together and pointing towards the boy. But don't go telling anybody about it, okay? It's our little secret. Oh of course. I won't tell anybody. Izuku nods like a bobblehead that's been jostled to work to show his allegiance, which earns him the hero's autograph as an award. Now, why are you here, young man? Recovery Girl diverts her attention from present Mike to address Izuku once she's finished finalizing the man's report. The elderly woman adjusts the visor fixed to her face like their glasses to get a good look at her patient as she mumbles. That hard-ass wouldn't have sent one of his students here during class if it wasn't for good reason. Izuku's eyes widen in shock when he hears the way that Recovery Girl refers to his teacher. Oh well, Aizawa-sensei ain't so bad. He feels obligated to defend the man after seeing how concerned Aizawa had been for him. Mike laughs, hard. He laughs so hard that he has to hold his stomach with one hand and slaps his knee with the other. Good to know you've already seen through his tough guy act. The hero even has tears in his eyes that he needs to wipe away with a flick of his finger. Hush, let the boy finish. Recovery girl gets him to quiet down when she threateningly hoists her cane over her head. Mike recluses with his arms defensively shielding himself as he nods to show his surrender. Izuku blinks as he witnesses the odd interaction, but he shakes it off just as quickly as it passes. I, um, I just started coughing up. Be blood. The matter of his health is much too glaring for him to worry about heroes getting abused by old ladies right now. Mike and the nurse share a quick glance before Recovery Girl starts searching through one of her desk's drawers. Really now? Any theories as to why? Izuku shrugs and stares down at the floor. No, that's why he sent me over. Grinding the crook of his shoe into the tile suddenly feels as oddly calming as it did to pet Pachita. All right then, have a seat and I'll run some tests. Recovery Girl finally finds the tool that she was searching for and gestures to have Izuku sit down. In order for the nurse to make room, however, she first shoes her other patient away from the spot. As for you, you're a grown pro hero. Quit your whining and get back out there. She practically chases present Mike out. Oh, but I didn't even get a lollipop. Mike complains like the man-child he is as he's pushed out the door. His heels screech against the floor in protest as he tries to stop the mad woman from forcing him to leave. Shoo, you buffoon. But it's no use when she resorts to violence again by raising her giant walking stick. The massive syringe-styled cane swings like a broadsword that the hero has to dodge with a duck. Nice meeting you, Midoriya. Mike shrieks with a wave goodbye before fleeing the area with speeds that would rival the pro hero and genie. The blonde even manages to kick up dust in his wake like smoke from an engine's exhaust pipes. You too. Izuku calls after Mike in the hopes that the hero can still hear him. Then, recovery girl slides the office door closed. Now, tell me, when did you start coughing up blood? The nurse uses a stethoscope to check the boy's heartbeat first. During our quirk apprehension test, Izuku glances nervously at the other medical equipment she has on standby though. Some of the tools look like they cut more than his chainsaws once he transforms. That man, skipping ceremonies and straight to business. Recovery girl's face tightens like she just sucked on a lemon. She finishes listening to his heartbeat and begins to take his blood pressure while asking, Was it outside? Izuku raises an eyebrow, surprised that the woman guessed correctly. Um, yeah. He wonders where she's going with her analysis so far. You could have just been suffering from nerves or the heat. You seem like the jumpy type that you might get a case of the first day jitters. The nurse shares her theory as she moves on to the next test. A weird bracelet straps itself around each of Izuku's wrists like a pair of handcuffs. Oh oh, you think? That's a relief. Izuku relaxes when he hears that his condition may not be so bad. He has a sliver of hope that his mother may just have seasonal allergies after all. Or, oh dear, until Recovery Girl reads the output on the device attached to Izuku's wrists. The boy stiffens when he hears the tone of her voice. WH what is it? He worries for the worst as he tries to gauge her pensive frown. Recovery Girl removes the device from Izuku's wrists to replace with a wooden mouth stick. 
Let me take a quick swab from your mouth. She instructs him to open wide so that she can place it under his tongue. Ah, Izuku tries not to gag on the stick in his mouth as he lets her move it around to get a sufficient amount of saliva. Once recovery girl is finished, he swallows the remaining amount of spit that she didn't get. Good boy. He's suddenly taken by surprise when she shoves something else into his mouth though. Have a gummy much to his relief. It's just a sweet treat that tastes like cherry once he begins chewing on it. Thanks. He mumbles through a mouthful of the small snack before swallowing it down. Recovery girl sticks the DNA sample into a machine that quickly provides results. The nurse looks through a microscope at the slides. Oh my. Her tone from earlier hasn't changed. Midoriya. Does anyone in your family exhibit similar coughs often? She spins around in her chair to face the boy that she's taken to study. Um, my mom. I think. Izuku begins squirming from his spot now that his worry has ventured from himself to his mother. He finds it hard to sit in place as he waits for recovery girl to deliver his diagnosis. I see. The nurse hums as she cross-references her findings once more. Only after she's certain of the result, she shares with him her discovery. I believe you've inherited a disease through your gene pool. Izuku's fingers curl to make his hands into fists when she adds, quite severe too, I'd say. He finds it hard to believe. The room suddenly seems out of focus. He sits back, trying not to pass out. Really, he breathlessly asks for confirmation that this isn't some elaborate prank set up between her and present Mike. He idly waits in denial of the harsh reality. Yes, I'm surprised you failed to notice or be checked until now. But recovery girl pulls no punches and tells him the truth. She sounds sympathetic but it still hits the boy hard. WH what do I do? What can be done? Izuku sits forward to lay his head in his hands as he tries not to cry. If it were just him, he'd not be so worried. His mother though. He feels himself becoming numb when he realizes that she's been keeping her condition from him all this time. Not much, I'm afraid. Recovery girl gets up from her chair and uses her cane as a crutch to get near the boy. Once she's in his proximity, she places a consoling hand on his knee. First and foremost, I think we should call your mother. She tries to sound as soothing as possible when she sees how rough he's taking the news. Oh oh, yeah. He numbly nods when he thinks about actually talking to her about it. Now that he's inherited her sickness, he can only imagine how she'll take the news herself. She's gonna freak out, he sighs in sorrow. I can imagine. Recovery girl nods in understanding. She gestures to a spare cot for him to lay on before going for the landline phone. In the meantime, you can rest here and take the rest of your classes off. Hearing that he'll be kept in the nurse's office and isn't allowed back to class, Izuku sits up straight with a sudden renewed source of energy. He tries to argue, but, no buts, young man. I don't want you straining yourself any more than you already have, but gets met with a whack on the head like present Mike had. Izuku rubs the throbbing bump that recovery girl leaves behind, but it's the first day. His whine is both a mixture of physical and emotional pain as he surrenders to the nurse. He's led to the bed against his will and plops down in defeat, which means you won't miss much. Recovery girl has the kindness to offer him assurances at the very least before leaving him to wallow in self-pity. I'll write the proper notes for your teachers that you should be fine. Okay. Izuku slumps over to rest his head on the bed's soft pillow with a sigh. Before long, he's closing his eyes and drifting off to sleep. The boy dreams of drowning. He inhales his own blood, left unable to breathe. All that he can see is a deep depth of red. The liquid washes over him as he sinks deeper and deeper. He can't swim no matter how hard he paddles. There's a scream that bubbles up in his throat but it comes out as a silent cough. And then, he looks down at his chest, feeling the warmth of his heart. The string that hangs from his sternum floats in the clouded crimson sea. Izuku grabs the small handle and pulls. The cheetah. Izuku shoots up from his bed in a sweat. His body heaves as he breathes heavily. Every pant as rugged as he looks. The green curls atop his head are matted down, just as drenched as the rest of himself. Izuku looks down to see he has a finger interlocked with the small handle of his chest's pulley string. A strange sound escapes his mouth, a mix between a sob and a choked cough. Then he lets the wire go and falls back down onto the cot. It's not his own. He remembers, he's in the nurse's office. The clock in the corner shows that hours have passed since he fell asleep. His mother should be arriving by now. Izuku climbs off the cot and looks around for recovery girl. When he sees that the nurse is nowhere to be found, he works up the courage to slide open the office door himself. He nearly has a heart attack when he finds someone on the other side. The girl opposite of him jumps in equal alarm, a startled shout escaping her lips. Jiru, Izuku recognizes his friendly classmate but can't conceal his surprise to see her. Kayoka is just as shocked by the sudden removal of the barrier between them, but contains her composure in contrast to the boy. She averts her gaze and twirls a jack absent-mindedly. H. Hey. Izuku adopts her strategy, avoiding looking directly at her while adorning a mild blush. He fidgets in place as he tries to think of something to say back before settling on asking. What are you doing here? Suddenly, Kayoka flares up with her line of sight lifting to glare at him. I came to check on you, stupid. 
She snaps incredulously, realizing her reaction was a bit much. She recoils and simmers down. I mean, I was worried about you. Her gaze falls back to her feet. Izuku blinks after registering her outburst. It takes him a while to process, but he eventually jumpstarts his brain when he scratches the back of his head. Oh, I never did come back to class, huh? A dry laugh escapes his lips when he thinks about his first impression to his peers. Everyone kept asking about you. Kayoka consoles him as though reading his mind. When Izuku hums skeptically, she shrugs. Well, mostly everyone. Her own laugh is just as null and void of humor. Like you said, that wasn't my best impression to make on the first day. Izuku means to sigh but groans instead as he places his head in his hands. Could have been worse. Kayoka tries assuring him again with a shrug but then remembers that he can't see her with his hands covering his eyes. She tries cheering him up another way instead. Um, I took some notes for you. Oh, thanks. Which does manage to make him look up at her. He pauses and asks, so, classes are over? Huh. Kayoka nods in confirmation before tilting her head to the side. Are you able to head home now? I guess. Izuku glances around as though he's searching for the answer. When he finds nobody other than himself and Kayoka still, he shrugs and explains, Recovery girl called my mom and I fell asleep waiting for her. Gotcha. Kayoka nods. A moment of silence passes between the two before she takes to her habit of curling an ear jack on a finger. I was gonna say we could walk together, but... Izuku offers her a smile as he responds, maybe next time. Next time. To which Kayoka agrees and smiles in return. Her lips level out as she looks past Izuku and remembers they're standing outside of a medbay. Hey, can I ask you what that cough was all about? Izuku's mind buffers. The boy caught off guard by the question. He looks away, mulling over his answer in his head. He suddenly understands, to an extent, why his mother had kept her illness hidden from him. It was. Nothing major. He blows off the matter by forcing his smile to come back. I'll be fine. Though, Kayoka doesn't seem so convinced. You know, I can hear a person's heartbeat to tell if somebody is lying to me. Her soft tone sets Izuku on edge and he's suddenly very aware of the pounding organ in his chest that she's speaking of. The girl reaches out, quickening the thrumming before her hand even makes contact with his chest. But yours ever since I met you has always sounded. Her eyes are as alluring as her lingering voice when Izuku looks into them, different. Izuku's lips part, exhaling the breath that he didn't realize he had been holding in. D different. He stutters as he feels the warmth of Kayoka's gentle hand transferring to his tone of voice. The girl nods, leaning in with the movement, her lips also parting to say more. Oh my. But there comes an intrusion to their private moment before things can continue. A woman with green hair like Izuku's glances between them as she coyly asks, Am I interrupting something? Mom. Izuku jumps back at the same time that Kayoka retracts her hand. He stares at his mother like a deer that's been caught in headlights, his face as red as a tomato. Kayoka matches the boy's hue, glowing like a red ruby. She flails about in such discomposure that Inko can't help but be reminded of her son as she squeaks out, Mrs. Midori. I mean, you must be, please, call me Inko, dear. The greenette gives Kayoka a polite smile before shifting her focus to her son and changing her expression to something far from a smile. Izuku hasn't done me the pleasure of telling me your name though. Izuku's panicked reaction and then pleading glance urges the girl to answer, K. Kayoka. Kayoka Jiru. Embarrassed enough for one day, she starts backing away and gestures with a pointed thumb over her shoulder, I I should probably go. Of course, you wouldn't want to keep your parents waiting. And Ko bows to bid her a farewell before waving goodbye, lovely meeting you. Why you too? Kayoka shouts over her shoulder before taking the chance to flee. Ah, be bye. Jiru. Izuku whispers to himself as he lowers the hand he was about to wave with. Abandoned by his friend to his mother's vices, he accepts his fate by bravely facing his mother head on. Well, and here I was worried about my baby the whole way here, just to find you getting all lovey-dovey with a girl. She crosses her arms and gives him a disappointed stare as opposed to an angry rant though. Izuku is caught off guard, but quickly recovers. I wasn't lovey-dovey, mom. She's just a friend. He waves his hands in denial with a matched shake of his head. He winds up casting a look down the hall to make sure Kayoka didn't overhear them. Tracking his gaze, Inko raises a brow. For a friend, she sure did enjoy feeling up your chest, and smirks when she sees the boy's blush return. She laughs at how easy it is to get one over on him. Mom, Izuku whines indignantly to make her stop. When Inko does finish teasing her son, each of their faces level out and they both become serious. Mom, Izuku meets her gaze and takes a tentative step forwards. Wh why didn't you tell me you were sick? Oh, Izuku. Inko's eyes water as she holds her son's stare. I'm not sick. Her response almost relieves the boy even though he knows it's a lie. Although, he can tell by the sad tone of her voice that she's not well. He's not fooled when she pulls him into a hug. It's until Inko says, I'm dying, that he realizes she was just clarifying the severity of the disease and not telling him she'd be okay. Things wouldn't be okay again for a long time. 
A searing sensation of pain pulls at his face, taking the rest of his head with the force. All of the structure to his neck tightens, straining with the arched backwards drag of parabola. No longer can he see anything but the blue sky, colors blotting his vision with the clouds. A thin wire swings in the air, reflected by a dim beam of sunlight. He can't locate his torso or his legs, but he knows they're falling with him thanks to that skinny little string. As he descends, he can feel his chest tightening. The boy's bated breath quickens while he braces for impact. The bright atmosphere above him darkens as it's covered by a cement ceiling. When he touches down with the mixture of gravel and dirt beneath his body, he stares straight upwards at the bottom of a bridge. A canal runs behind him, the flow of the river's resonating sound flooding his ears. Then the cackles of bullies break through his hearing like little popping bubbles. His vision swims and he feels like he's drowning when a warm liquid dribbles down from his right nostril. The same way he had been dragged here against his will, Izuku is manhandled by the group of three other boys to get propped upright. Izuku's view of the overpass belly shifts to his tormentors. Suddenly, his brain registers the reason why his face is laced with so much pain. He had been punched. He thinks his nose is broken but the bullies won't let him check. Overly extended fingers grip the back of Izuku's head to hold it in place, the nails digging into the boy's scalp. The stretched appendages belong to a bully whose school uniform is unbuttoned and disheveled. The delinquent fashion sense topped off by a backwards cap. He goes to alter a junior high the same as Izuku. Ahead of Izuku, side by side with his former friend Katsuki Bakugo, is a plump boy kept afloat by two draconic wings. The flying bully's rounded face grins ear to ear, smile reaching the sideburns of brown shaven hair. He snickers before ceasing the flap of his wings and stepping foot on the earth's soil. Grandpa says you got a quirk now. Katsuki forms a fist and smacks it against the palm of his other hand cracking his knuckles so that the resounding pop sounds like sparks coming from his quirk. Show us what it is, shitty Deku. The spiky-haired blonde spits his demands that literal saliva droplets spray out of his mouth. Izuku struggles in vain against the grip of elongated fingers coming from the bully behind him. The sound of rushing water in the canal reminds the boy of his transformation on the pier. Tears prickle at his eyes and his lip quivers before the rest of his body begins shaking. I I can't. Katsuki's eye twitches, his knee-jerk reaction to the refusal one of anger. Why the fuck not? The blonde glares into the innocent green orbs of his former friend with burning red dots in search of an honest answer. When Izuku doesn't respond right away, Katsuki comes to his own assumed conclusion, you think it's better than mine, nerd. I doubt that. The bully with stretched fingers cackles confidently. A cocky grin stretches across his face as he tilts his head to one side. You sure you heard right, Tsubasa? Maybe your grandpa meant someone else. I know what I heard. The bully with wings bristles before crossing his arms. He holds the pose while pondering to himself in deep contemplation for a bit, then snaps his fingers upon having an epiphany, I know, get his shirt off. What? The boy forcing Izuku to stay still jerks Izuku with him when he recoils in shock. Katsuki doesn't have quite as outward a perturbed reaction other than his face scrunching up in the question, why? Tsubasa flaps his arms at his sides with a beat of his wings, agitated that his friends aren't listening to him. There's supposed to be something attached to his chest. Just do it. He begins stomping towards Izuku to prove his claims himself. However, a grin finds itself on his face when Katsuki comes with him moments later. And no, wait. Izuku's eyes widen when he sees the two bullies reaching for him. He twists and turns his body so that they have a hard time removing his school blazer. The resistance is met with extra force, the third bully's fingers clinging to him tighter. Hold still, fucking Deku. Katsuki complains when Izuku successfully makes the fabric of his shirt slip through the blonde's fingers. The bully's victim only prolongs the inevitable though. Eventually, Tsubasa's and Katsuki's combined efforts rip Izuku's top covering off. A string dangles from the boy's bare chest, earning a sneer from Katsuki. What the fuck is this shit? Whoa, talk about lame. Tsubasa gives the wire an unimpressed look. It had slipped free from Izuku's clothes when he had been punched, but the winged boy and the other bullies had failed to notice it until now due to how small and thin it is. Katsuki turns his head side to side, giving the anatomically incorrect attachment a more analytically critical stare. The blonde's eyes squint until they can't narrow anymore without closing. What are you? A shitty wind-up doll. He sounds disappointed while his face morphs into a deep frown. The bully holding Izuku breaks into a fit of laughter. Yeah, you gonna play us a lullaby if we pull on it. His stretched fingers probe for the thin string's handle with a tiny twiddle. Izuku draws away from the prying hand, panic overtaking his features. No, don't. But his rebellion is easily overpowered and he can only watch with wide eyes as the string attached to his sternum gets pulled on. It's not Izuku's words that sputter, but the ignition of chainsaws that rev themselves to life. Metallic teeth rest away the flesh of the boy's forearms. The mutilated meat making way for the bar that cleaves between his ring finger and middle finger. Blood doesn't just gush out. The liquid bursts forth in violent jets of red. 
Izuku's face is torn down the middle, ripped apart until the mangled flesh caught on the suddenly sprouted saw's chain flings off the sharp bits of steel and splatters into the dirt. Pointed fangs and a yellow glare surfaces from the groom. Holy shit. The boy that had been holding onto Izuku loses his grip immediately. He retreats from the chainsaws to hide behind Katsuki and Tsubasa. What the fuck? Katsuki is aghast by what he sees. Sweat dribbles down his forehead and he pants heavily. Overwhelmed by the heat of what feels like a dangerous fire that's just been lit. Izuku recluses from them, pointing the chainsaws sprouting from his arms downwards so that they do no accidental harm. I I told you not to. His voice holds an echo of how he'd usually sound that matches his mannerisms, but there's a malformed quality to it that still leaves the bullies wary. Don't be scared. I won't hurt you, I swear. Izuku's sharp teeth glisten with his own blood. This is crazy. Tsubasa takes a step back to put some distance between the chainsaw boy and himself. The wings on his back quiver, ready to take flight should he be forced to choose between fight or flight. Izuku's chainsaw-mounted head swivels towards Katsuki. Desperation radiating from the yellow orbs that serve as his set of eyes. The blonde boy flinches back when he meets the stare, but he at least recognizes the pleading shout that comes from the demonic visage, Kakin. Fuck off. I ain't scared. Katsuki snaps when he hears the annoying nickname that the nerd had given him when they were younger. He's reminded of the timid boy that he grew up with as a neighbor and looks past the chainsaw transformation. He's still the same old weakling Deku. Tsubasa shoots Katsuki a look of uncertainty, still iffy about Izuku's metamorphosis. He keeps his feet planted, refusing to go anywhere near the macabre of chainsaws. But Bakugo, now he's got a... The boy pauses to glance over at Izuku before lowering his voice just above that of a whisper, a villain's quirk, still hiding behind Tsubasa. The bully with a backwards baseball cap hears his friend and has an epiphany. No way, I just realized. The delinquent raises one of his shaking stretchy fingers to point at Izuku. You don't think his dad is toxic chainsaw, do you? Hearing that accusation about his absent father, Izuku jumps upright to refute those claims. No, he works overseas. He's not, yeah, right. I bet that was a lie your mom told you to make you feel better. The long-fingered bully yells over Izuku's shouting before cowering behind the boys that he's using as human shields. Your dad's totally a villain. Tsubasa nods in agreement with his friend while trying to swap places to no longer be the one positioned in front. No, he's not. Izuku wails through sharpened teeth as his arm saws carve into the ground soil. The bullet boy would be weeping if his transformation allowed him to. Tell them, Kakin. Izuku pleads to his childhood friend to defend his family's honor with hopeful desperation. Katsuki holds his tongue, staring at the bizarre monstrification of Izuku Midoriya. He studies the blood-soaked school uniform dangling from the boy's body the same as the string attached to the base of Izuku's chest. Brown like the dirt, the sleeves are shredded from where the chainsaws came out. Katsuki knows for a fact, that quirk isn't even your own, is it? Tsubasa twists his head to look towards Katsuki in confusion. Huh, what's that mean? But the blonde ignores his fellow bullying partner. Katsuki's focus is on Izuku even while the boy avoids looking back at him. Is it, D.A.K.U.? Katsuki shouts to regain Izuku's attention. Slowly, Izuku raises his steel-covered head. The chainsaw protruding from the base of the boy's skull is a familiar sight to the blonde even if he hadn't seen it on Izuku before now. Kakin, Pachita is, and Izuku's weak wet voice is all the confirmation that Katsuki needs to finish putting two and two together. Tsubasa shares a quick glance with the boy next to him, not quite getting it himself. Bakugo, what do you mean by that? The shaven-headed bully tries prying for answers again when the baseball hat bully shakes his head. Quiet. Katsuki snaps for the two extras to shut up. Then he looks back at Izuku and asks about the nature of his childhood friend's quirk. It was your shitty dog, wasn't it? Izuku rests his head on his hand, propped up by an arm. The boy's gaze is cast down at the lead of the pencil in his other hand that scribbles back and forth. Instead of taking notes during his classes, he's currently doodling on the paper atop his desk. Today is proving no better a day of school than yesterday despite the regular lessons thus far. He can't focus with his mother's poor health on his mind either. When present Mike urges everyone to participate, alrighty. Everybody get those hands up if you know the answer to the question. Show me some spirit. Izuku keeps his head down like everybody else. The hero does his best to make the lessons as entertaining as possible, but Izuku just isn't in the mood. It's not until the afternoon when hero training is scheduled that the boy becomes more alert. A gust of wind blowing through the door instead of the window raises the hairs on his neck. Heavy footfalls announcing a huge presence catches his ears. The green in his eyes becomes more vibrant when he looks upwards. The number one hero, All Might, enters the classroom. Izuku's favorite idol is enough to lift his spirits, perking him right up. I am here. The symbol of peace announces his arrival with an extravagant flourish of the cape that trails behind his brisk movements, coming through the door like a normal person. The boisterous boom of the massive man's voice travels through the room, getting the class pumped like a crowd at a concert. 
It's all might. Ijiro excitedly exclaims the obvious with an eager lean forward. Stars dance in his eyes, beaming as bright as his pointed grin. Incredible, as expected of Yue. Tenya claps his hands together in an effort to get a standing ovation from the rest of the class. He's the only one that gives a round of applause. Is he really gonna teach us? Hanta smiles a bit more broadly than Ijiro as he glances around the room to gauge everybody else's reactions to All Might as their teacher. The pink girl with horns adorning the top of her head points out the outdated suit that the hero chose to wear. That's his Silver Age costume. It's a uniform that gives nostalgia but a questionable choice during the modern day. A red and yellow mismatch of muscle expands and contracts as the mighty hero gives a hearty guffaw in response to the children's reactions. Izuku marvels as his idol silences them all by sheer laughter alone, commanding respect without throwing around his authoritative position. It's good that you're all so lively. You're going to need the energy for today's activity. All Might reaches behind his back before brandishing two cards in each hand. Kanji reads training on the left and battle on the right. All Might sweat drops before switching the two and correcting his presentation. Battle training. The announcement gets the class hyped enough to completely overlook and dismiss the mistake much to the hero's relief. No time to dally. Basic hero training is a class that will put you through all sorts of exercises to mold you into heroes. He rolls with the crowd's wave of cheers before tossing the labeled cards over his massive shoulders and replacing them with a tiny remote. You were wondering why I wore my old costume. Well, because today you'll be adorning your own outfits. All Might presses a button on the small device and cubicle lockers begin descending from the ceiling over each respective student's desk. A round of awe overcomes the teens when they witness the spectacle of technology. In accordance with the quirk registry and the special request forms that all of you filled out before being admitted, these are. All Might tells them all what's inside each of their private containers before they even have the opportunity to look inside them. Costumes a large margin of the class cheer together while they each begin opening their lockers. Vacuum-sealed bags lay stacked atop the other in the bins. Clothes distributed evenly and any support items stowed away in a separate slot. Izuku clutches his own uniforms bagging closely to his chest. He remembers a time when he was younger that he had fantasized what his hero suit would look like. Being such an All Might fanboy, most of his early designs were just rehashes or cheap replicas of the number one hero. After getting his quirk and maturing with age though, Izuku started to think more practically. Izuku rolls up the sleeves of his white dress shirt, folding them at the cuff and then refolding them until they reach his elbows. It was either a zipper or buttons for him to have easy access to the ripcord fixed to his chest. He went with a button down considering the look could be less conspicuous than a straight-up jumpsuit. To appear a little more formal, Izuku included a black tie. His father had never taught him how to wear one properly that it hangs loosely but it matches the untucked hem of his shirt in a sense of style. When Izuku reconjoins with everybody else, he's relieved to see a variety of peers that went both ways so he doesn't have to worry about feeling like the odd one out. He's especially glad to find out Kayoka's costume is much like his own in terms of appearing like ordinary clothes. The girl wears a black leather jacket despite the sweltering sun's heat, which makes the boy chuckle. Her boots have stereos built into their shafts, no doubt for her quirk's optimization, and Izuku's eyes can't help but be drawn to the choker around her neck. Kayoka gives him a once-over during the same time that he takes in her fashion sense. Plain approach, huh? Her smile turns slightly sly as her eyes travel towards his messy tie. Suits you having had prior experience fixing her father's ties, she adjusts it properly for him. Though this looks a bit better, Izuku blushes only a little bit much to his credit when she invades his space to help him. The boy tries to redirect his gaze elsewhere while he mumbles in his defense. Your clothes are pretty normal too, you know. Kayoka raises a single eyebrow before backing away. That's not very nice her hands go on her hips while she feigns offense. Shouldn't you know that you're always supposed to tell a girl she looks nice? Izuku blinks when he returns his gaze to her. He has to quickly look away again. You do. His next mumble comes with a blush that is Kayoka keeping her brow raised. Izuku shifts from foot to foot before clarifying. Look nice, I mean. Kayoka's blush matches the same hue as her salmon pink shirt. It's her turn to look away, completely embarrassed by the compliment. S.H. shut it. She raises her jacks as a threat when she senses his eyes still on her, not the neck. Izuku covers his throat with his hands to avoid getting jabbed by the weaponized jacks. However, by defending only that part of his body, he leaves his torso exposed. My kidney. He feels a jolt go through him when Kayoka uses her quirk to blast his side with the vibration of her heartbeat. While Izuku cradles in on himself, he completely misses the arrival of another. Whoa, looking fancy. A feminine voice aimed at him is his only way of knowing somebody else has joined him and Kayoka in their conversation. He hadn't anticipated that. Didn't expect that from you, Deku. But nothing could have prepared him for that same girl to use his childhood nickname either. Izuku sits up. The pain in his side from Kayoka's attack long forgotten. WH what did you just call me? 
His voice sounds distant from him while he tries to catch up with what he just heard a classmate address him. It's the girl with a brunette bob, the one that he rescued from the Zero Pointer. She's wearing some sort of skin-tight black and pink space-themed suit that shows off her body's shape. Deku, isn't that your name? But Izuku is more fixated on the words leaving her mouth rather than the rest of her. Why would you think that? He can't help but let some of his frustration slip into his tone when he recalls all the years of bullying he had to endure with that nickname. The girl picks up on his mood and loses her oblivious bubbliness. Joy bursted by nerves. She anxiously wrings her hands together while saying, Beck Hugo was calling you that earlier, so I thought, it's a cruel nickname that means useless, but Izuku hears enough that he stops her mid-sentence. He's not sure if his former friend is spreading rumors or trying to start trouble, but he shoots the blonde a glare regardless. Katsuki returns the look with a glower of his own, noticing the tension between the two boys and realizing that she made a grave mistake. The brunette hastily tries to apologize. She steps towards Izuku to grab his arm. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Shall we begin, zygotes? But All Might crashing down like a comet interrupts any and all conversations that Class 1 is having. An epic pickup of dust sweeps through the small crowd. Anyone with capes or hair exposed having both blown into disarray. All Might shouts over everyone's coughing as they fan away the fine particles onto indoor anti-personnel battle training. But we're outdoors. The girl resembling a frog tentatively raises her hand to gain All Might's attention. She notably wears a green wetsuit to match her theme and overall aesthetic. All Might scratches the top of his head, between the two large tufts of hair that spring up like a set of bunny ears. Er, well, villain battles are most commonly seen outdoors. However, statistically, the most heinous of villains are more likely to hide away indoors. He gestures to the buildings that they'll soon be entering as though that resolves the girl's comment. But all the hero does is pose more potential inquiries. They are. A disembodied voice comes from somewhere amongst the collection of students. It takes All Might a moment to realize the person that spoke is completely invisible. Only a pair of shoes and gloves to prove their existence. How come we never hear anything about that? A boy with a fit physique like his teacher glances around at his peers as though they might know the answer to his question. Black market deals, house arrest, the works, the clever villains lurk in the shadows. Trust me, but All Might beats them to the punch. Before any more interruptions can stall his momentum, the hero carries on with his lesson. You'll now be split into hero teams and villain teams so you can face off in two-on-two -two indoor battles. So no basic training. The frog girl tilts her head to the side inquisitively without raising her hand for permission to speak this time. All Might clenches his fist as though he's crushing a stress ball that nobody else can see while he blows off the question with the answer. Practical experience teaches you the basics, like the robots during the entrance exam. The shortest of the class draws All Might's heightened gaze downwards towards the boy with balls atop his head. All Might flicks his index finger forward to point at the boy, singling him out to state firmly, the distinct difference being that you won't be fighting robots, young man. Izuku finds himself subconsciously nodding thinking about the damage that can be done with his quirk and the intense contrast between machine and human. Fuck the difference, but not everybody in his class shares that same sentiment, especially not Katsuki Bakugo. Izuku frowns when he sees his childhood bully popping off a few sparks via explosive quirk. Can't I just blow everyone away? All Might opens his mouth to respond to the blonde, but gets interrupted by the girl with the pointed ponytail. What determines victory? At least she has the decency to raise her hand. Are you going to threaten to expel someone like Mr. Aizawa did? Not like the brunette girl who keeps her arms tight at her sides. She nervously looks up at All Might, expecting the same treatment as their homeroom teacher. How do we proceed to divide ourselves into teams? Tenya chops in a straight solid line with his hand as though he's splitting the groups himself. He stands at the center of the class, trying to draw All Might's attention from the other questions to have his own answer. How fabulous is my cape? But a boy covered in glitter and sparkling armor outshines Tenya like a living spotlight. The shawl in question flails around with extravagant gestures to draw everybody's eyes. Holy shit. These kids are killing me faster than my injury. All Might grumbles through gritted teeth as he places a heavy hand over his left side. Before anyone else can bombard him with any more questions, he shouts over them all, just a moment, and takes the time to flip through a manual. Everyone is shocked to see the teaching booklet that the number one hero frantically searches for answers. Um, but what shocks them even more is when he snaps it shut to reclaim control of the situation. Listen up. Here's the deal. The villains have a bomb to guard and the heroes have to retrieve it. There's a limited amount of time for either team to successfully capture the other or achieve those objectives. The frog-like girl slowly starts raising her hand from her crouched position. What about, your battle partners will be decided by drawing lots. But All Might cuts her off when he pulls a set of boxes seemingly out of thin air. 
Any other questions before we proceed? The hero is just as quick to end the string of inquiries before anyone else can try interjecting. No. Great. Much to the frog girl's disdain. But, the first team is comprised of Midoriya and Yuraka. All Might draws two balls from the first box to begin creating duos. Izuku looks around his classmates before identifying Yuraka as the brunette girl he's already relatively acquainted with. They will be. All Might reaches into the other small crate before announcing, Villains. Izuku feels a twinge in his chest. He tells himself it's all by chance, not done deliberately. Yet, he can't help but succumb to a mood swing. Any excitement he had felt about technically meeting All Might and engaging with his classmates during hero training dissipate. All he can see is Katsuki's cocky grin aimed his way. All he can hear is the echo in the back of his mind that he's on the villain team. They'll be up against. And the situation only worsens for him when All Might announces his opponent, Bakugo. Izuku almost misses hearing who Katsuki's teammate will be, and Ida. His mind falling further into a spiral of distraught emotions. He doesn't listen to All Might declaring the other teams nor does he fully comprehend going through the motions of preparing for the start of the first round. He vaguely recalls Kayoka's encouragement when he finally comes to at the actual battlegrounds. But by then it's too late to thank her. His partner, Yuraka looks at him with concern as she removes the visor covering her face. Are you okay? She stares at him with auburn eyes that seem sincere enough to Izuku that he relaxes in her company. Though anxiety lingers over him still due to Bakugo. Yeah, Izuku's response is an unconvincing whisper that keeps Yuraka staring. He clears his throat and tries sounding more resolved as he says louder, Thanks for asking. The brunette takes the hint, nodding. So, Bakugo is the one that gave you that mean nickname? Huh. She surprises Izuku when she expresses herself as having a lot of energy with a fist pump. Let's use this as an opportunity to get back at him. The boy blinks back his shock as she explains. I don't like that he tricked me into calling you something you don't like, so I'd like a little payback myself. It won't be so easy. But Izuku diverts his focus from her to the dark hallway ahead of them. He half expects his enemy to come flying out of it already. He'll be coming for me regardless of what Ida says. The boy's gaze flicks back to the fake nuclear weapon that they're supposed to guard. Plus we've got the bomb to protect. So it's like you and Bakugo are fated rivals then. You two will duke it out one on one. Yuraka mimes having a boxing match by jabbing at the air. When she sees Izuku isn't quite as enthused by the prospect of fighting his childhood bully, she simmers down. Does that mean you'll be using your quirk? The girl tries to be as delicate as possible as she treads the topic of his quirk like thin ice. Izuku looks down at himself, placing a hand over his chest. He feels the rise and fall of it as he breathes. Probably not. His voice is distant while his mind wanders to the past. Ka, I mean, Bekugo. He's a jerk, but I can't risk killing him when he's finally finished reflecting. Izuku drops his hand and refocuses on Yuraka to ask, What about you? What's your quirk? At that, the brunette perks right back up. Oh, I can make things float. She lightly taps on the fake nuke to demonstrate. The object lifts into the air and levitates in place just like she said. So long as all five of my fingers touch the item. Each digit twiddles on her hand before she brings them together and deactivates her quirk. Izuku hums as he places his hand to his chin to come up with a strategy. The bomb is made of paper mash, so it's not too heavy already, but that'll help make it a bit more mobile. He thinks aloud so that his partner can follow along. Ida is fast. I recognize his name as part of the Ingenium family. Whoa, really? She interrupts with an exclamation of shock upon discovering her classmate is related to a pro hero. Izuku nods and gestures for her to settle down. Yes, but listen, he's fast, so you're gonna have to stay ahead of him and not sit in one place if we're to split up. He glances over his shoulder to look down the hallway ahead of them. He suddenly wishes they had explored the facility a bit more to know the layout better. Got it. That's a good plan. Hiroraka nods along and gives her teammate a thumbs up in approval of his idea. She doesn't share his concerns about going into the battle ill-prepared, and he doesn't have the chance to change that problem since the buzzing alarm that indicates the match has begun goes off right then and there. I'm glad you think so, cause we just ran out of time to come up with another one. He sighs solemnly as he runs a hand through his hair in worry. Good luck. Hiroraka remains optimistic though. She uses her quirk on the paper mash nuke and starts carrying it upstairs. You too. He responds just loud enough for her to hear before heading in the opposite direction. He figures the least he could do is try luring the enemy team away from her to stall for time. Izuku waits until he's descended a few floors before pausing to remove his shoes. He hopes that this will stop his footfalls from echoing every time he steps on the concrete ground. He also stops to undo his tie, wrapping the cloth around a hand before closing it into a fist. The moment of preparation quells some of his nerves before he continues moving stealthily down the stairs. When Izuku rounds the next corner though, he has only a mere second to react. 
An explosion aimed right at his face blinds him as he ducks down to avoid taking the full brunt of the blast. The force of the detonation drives him back and some of the fire is just too close to avoid that his clothes get singed along with his hair. Through the ash and soot is none other than Katsuki Bakugo, the blonde boy's outfit comprised of grenade gauntlets and tactical military gear. Nice dodging, Deku. Katsuki grinds out a sarcastic snarl through gritted teeth. Izuku spares a look behind the savage boy to see if Tenya is with him but figures the blonde must have gone rogue when finding nobody. I knew you'd come for me alone. Izuku doesn't know whether to smile or sneer back at his old friend turned bully. He settles for a bitter laugh while getting into a fighting stance. Katsuki rears his right arm back, winding up for a punch. I'll fuck you up just enough not to get disqualified. But his cocky approach is intercepted by Izuku grabbing onto the arm and using it against him. The blonde is hoisted over Izuku's shoulder and flipped onto his back. You always lead with a right hook. Izuku explains how he was able to see the boy's move coming from a mile away before raising his fists to continue the fight and fixing his opponent with a glare. I've seen it enough times to know. You fucker. Katsuki angrily gets to his feet to attack again. The rage-fueled charge is something Izuku sees coming in advance too. He pulls his tie through each hand to extend it while bending low to counter Katsuki. Izuku then uses the thin cloth to trip the blonde by wrapping it around his ankle and pulling. Katsuki stumbles, landing on his shoulder before riding himself. The blonde's instinct takes over and he lets off a controlled blast to ward Izuku away. Though small, the explosion takes its toll and blows Izuku into the nearest wall. Smoke billows between both boys as they heave themselves to standing positions. Use your shitty dog's quirk already. Katsuki lashes out with more miniature bursts. Izuku leans away from them, avoiding the full force of the blasts. His clothes continue to get scorched though, along with the blemishes across his skin. A boot plants itself between Izuku's ribs, kicking him into the handrail of the staircase thereby. You don't belong here with that villainous quirk. Katsuki's shouts are louder than the ringing in Izuku's ears as he dodges the next assault. I quote him the villain. Izuku gasps as he staggers back. His face contorts into an angry expression that challenges Katsuki's. You're the one who can create explosions and use them to terrorize me when we were younger. His bitter bite is met by a roar from the blonde before another eruption of flame destroys a wall's foundation. Izuku rolls across the floor, fragments of cement pelting him when he lands on his back. He hardly has the time to turn over before Katsuki pursues him with another assault. I'm gonna bring the villain out of ya and show you. Izuku takes a punch that rattles his jaw before being blown into another room. The explosions coming from Katsuki up till now were deliberate. Each one meant to destroy the cameras recording their battle as much as they had been directed towards Izuku. If you're worried about everyone else seeing, don't worry, I only want you to realize the truth about yourself. Katsuki stomps towards the impact hole he created to yell into it. He hoists the heavy gauntlet attached to his arm upwards to rest in his other hand. The pin to the grenade-shaped device rests on his finger like a trigger. The dark smog wafting from the damaged infrastructure conceals Izuku but Katsuki knows the boy is somewhere in there. Come here, Deku. Let me teach you how we do battle in the hero course. Katsuki yells into the void again to goad his enemy. A grin overcomes the blonde's facial features when he hears vitriolic vengeance reverberating as the sound of a chainsaw's ignition. The flurry of spinning metal teeth that barrels through the smoke yells back. Come on then. Teach me. Izuku's head sinks into a palpable pillow, heavy thoughts weighing heavily on the soft cushion just as much as the boy. Beneath him are equally supple bedsheets, his fatigued form laying still. The only movement made is the slow slide of his fingers along the string attached to his sternum. Izuku's skin feels the wire, his hand running up and down it to keep himself aware of its physical existence. The small cord is the exact same that had operated as Pachita's tail. The boy can tell not just by look, but also by touch. He lays atop his bed, sleepless from how many nightmares made him relive the incident in which he lost the dog. He may have gained a quirk, but the pulley connected to his heart feels like something he could use to pull it out at this point. For all his years that Izuku longed for a quirk, he would have never traded a life for one, human or animal. The cord is coarse, as rough as reality. It's not soft or comforting like Pachita's fuzz had been or the cushioning he lay on now. The dangling of the wire matches the unease of his mind as he thinks about his quirk. He'll always be grateful for Pachita's sacrifice, unwilling to let the dog's death be in vain, but he also feels condemned by his new power. The ridicule Izuku underwent when he was quirkless is no better than the treatment he's received being called a villain. It's just that the boy can't help but feel the quirk isn't his in the first place. When somebody says his quirk is villainous, he feels as though they're saying Pachita is villainous and not himself. He'd rather they just blame him even if that's what they mean. Izuku is drawn from his rumination by the light rap of someone's knuckles on his door. When it pushes open, he's not all that surprised to see his mother on the other side. Neither of them say anything, an ambient noise filling the silence instead. Inko eventually takes the initiative and closes the distance so that she can sit on the edge of her son's bed. 
Once she does, she takes to coddling him as usual. Her hands stroke at his head, fingers coursing through his curly green hair. Wanna talk? Inko speaks in a soft soothing voice that treats her son as delicately as her petting strokes. Izuku responds with a small insipid shake of his head anyways, which leads the mother to sigh and say as coaxingly as possible, you know it's not good to hold it in. Izuku's fingers curl around the string that he's been holding, clinging to it tighter. There's nothing to hold in. He knows what he's saying isn't true when his hand brushes against his chest and he faintly feels the beat of his heart. Sweetie, you barely touched your katsu and you'd normally be in the living room watching the Hero Network about this time. And Ko frets over him as she brushes hair strands away from his eyes to look at him better. Izuku's glossy gaze shifts away from her. Instead, you're in your room sulking. And Ko keeps prodding at her son's inherited green locks in an effort to make him look at her again. I'm not sulking. Izuku pouts as he pulls his head away from her hand. Inko stops petting him so that he can sit up. He shrugs while trying to come up with an excuse. I'm just not hungry. All Inko has to do is look to her left to see a bookshelf of hero merch or her right to see a notebook full of study scribbles for her to counter with the question. And what about your hero analysis? Izuku looks at the book that he put so much time into writing, then falls backwards to flop on his bed. What's the point? He's not sure if he's bitter or sad as he mumbles. Everybody says I'm gonna turn into a villain instead anyways. Inko's eyes expand, flaring like her nostrils as rage consumes her. Who's saying that? She stands up as adrenaline floods her system to go after whoever dared to hurt her son's feelings. Motherly instincts have her clenching her hands into fists. Izuku, tell me who's saying those awful things to you. She wants to know who to direct her anger at as she moves to grab the landline phone off the wall. Is it the boys at your school? Whose mother do I have to call? Mom, it's not. Izuku shoots up to stop her before she can dial any numbers. Inko pauses with the phone in her hand, tone hanging in the air with her fuming breaths as she listens. It's not worth it. Izuku hangs his head and backs away as he tries convincing her to hang up. You should let me decide that. Inko huffs but puts the phone back anyways. Izuku returns to his bed and she follows to sit beside him before asking. Would you like to be homeschooled from now on? Izuku somberly shakes his head. No, it's not just them, Mom. He looks into her eyes so that she understands and doesn't reflexively freak out again. Inko frowns, but doesn't get up or revert back to shouting. What about Katsuki? Does he try sticking up for you? She places a hand over her son's as she tries finding a saving grace in the problem at the very least. Though all she does is make Izuku break their eye contact. He's unable to tell her the truth. That his childhood friend had become his bully and joined in on the teasing. That Katsuki is the ringleader of the squadron. That he no longer has any friends at all. I miss Pachita. Izuku's eyes start to water when he thinks about the one last true friend that he did have. Inko pulls her son into a hug, holding him close. Oh dear, I know you do. She rubs his back in an attempt to console him as he begins crying. The ambience now consists of Izuku's sobs. She doesn't let him go until he finishes letting out his pent-up sorrow. I do too, you know. I owe Pachita a debt for saving my son if what you say is true. She offers her son an encouraging smile in an attempt to cheer him up. Izuku blinks, drying the last of his tears as he registers his mother's words. A debt, like a contract, and he suddenly remembers what Pachita had said to him in their final moments together when being granted his quirk. H.M. Inko squeezes her son's shoulder when she sees his distant stare. He's brought back and meets her gaze. Mom, my dream to become a hero. Izuku nearly chokes on his words and has to pause due to being at the risk of crying again. His hand trembles as he returns it to the string attached to his sternum. Do you think with this quirk that I can do it now? His fingers wrap around the wire and hold it tight. Inko's mouth opens, her response hanging empty in the air. Her son had asked her a variation of this same question before when he had been quirkless. Then, she told him that she was sorry, essentially saying there was no chance for him to make his dream a reality. Now though, yes, Izuku, you can become a hero. She chooses to support her son to show him that he isn't alone. Not even when he breaks down. The two of them will pour their hearts out to the other as much as they have to, crying in a huge embrace as many times as they must. Izuku's string sways on his chest during the hug, wagging like Pachita's tail. Fizzling white noise echoes through the room from where television static overtakes half a giant display of monitors. All of class wanna huddle together to stare at the screens in shock, just behind their hero training teacher who's mutually surprised by the lack of visual feed. The CCTV's glow flickers across their range of expressive faces in the dimly lit confined space as they listen to the crackling hiss of a lost signal. Beck Hugo blew out the cameras. The boy with a lightning streak in his blonde hair breaks the group's awestruck silence first with an obnoxious shout of the obvious. He removes the sunglasses that came with his hero costume to check if his eyes are deceiving him, unable to see in the dark with their blue-tinted lens. We can't even tell what's happening. The short boy who quickly became his friend complains alongside him. Purple balls replace his hair, bobbing with the nodding motion he makes to further emphasize the agreed-upon problem. 
The pink-toned girl throws her arm out, pointing towards the array of monitors that do continue functioning properly. But look, those ones still work so that we can still watch Ida fight Uraraka. She shows them with her finger the cameras that pick up an altercation between those two. Who cares about that? The invisible girl blows off that portion of the live-streaming battle with a wave of her floating sleeves before using them to mime doing a toss-up. Did you see the way Midoriya flipped back Hugo? Beside her, the blonde boy with a tail nods. He's wearing a karate gi that shows he can appreciate the move they all witnessed. Yeah, that was pretty manly. Not like Bakugo's sneak attack. Ijiro's grin flashes his pointed teeth as he too nods in agreement that the counter-attack was impressive. The girl resembling a frog shifts her gaze from the redhead back to the dysfunctional television screen. It looked like they were talking to each other. She croaks as she places a finger to her mouth in contemplative thought. The boy with an avian head hums as he considers his classmate's comment. The cloak wrapped around his body conceals the movement of his arms crossing over his chest. Too bad we couldn't hear what they were saying. His eyes shift from monitor to monitor in search of a screen that may still display the battle between Izuku and Katsuki. The girl with her hair done into a pointed ponytail raises her hand before addressing her teacher. All Might, shouldn't you stop the fight in order to get the cameras fixed? She voices her constructive concern as respectfully as possible. All Might responds with a hefty chuckle, assuring her that everything is under control with a broad grin and a thumbs up. Nonsense. You lot may not be able to listen in on the action. But I've got a special communications channel just for occasions such as this. The hero turns his head so that the group can get a look at the small device in his ear. He points towards the small audio pod before lifting that same finger over his head as a declaration. The match will continue. The ponytail girl slowly lowers her hand, struggling with the movement of her mouth to form an argument to respond with. If you insist, she surrenders to her teacher's logic and returns to watching the soundless screens that show Tenya chasing Izuku's teammate. Aw oh man, I was really looking forward to seeing who won between Bakugo and Midoriya. Hanta sullenly follows suit and settles for the battle that is made available to his viewing pleasure. The ponytail girl glances over at her peers and notices one that oddly has yet to say anything. Considering how close this fellow girl is to Izuku and her current skin pigmentation, this particular student's silence is a cause for concern. Hey Juru, you okay? You look pale. The ponytail girl voices her worries and waves a hand in front of Kayoka's face to break her eye contact with the grainy monitors. The pinquette of the class looks over and notices Kayoka's daze too. Though she doesn't take it as seriously, smirking and taking to teasing per usual, she's probably just worried about her boyfriend Kayoka is too shaken to get flustered this time. Out of the entire class, she's the one most invested in the brawl between Izuku and Katsuki. Oh all might. She finds her voice in order to manage a desperate attempt to gain her teacher's attention. The thing is, the hero had been wrong before about being the only one able to listen in. Thanks to her quirk, Kayoka is capable of hearing the same audio All Might does. HM, yes, All Might turns when he hears himself being called. His eyes scan the crowd of students before landing on Kayoka. The girl timidly, and just as anxiously, taps the tips of her ear jacks together. Maybe you should tell them to take it easy on one another. Their quirks, after all, her voice is just barely a whisper. But All Might hears her loud and clear. The abrasive roar of a chainsaw startup left more up to their imagination than they would have liked to admit. Kanta overhears Kayoka and begins massaging his chin in ponderment as he realizes something. Oh yeah, I guess we never did get the chance to find out what Midoriya's quirk is. His thoughts vocalized resonates with the rest of the class as a chorus of curious agreement. Ijiro connects a fist with the palm of his other hand, getting amped up just thinking about what his classmate's quirk could potentially be. His shark tooth grin is one of excitement as he says, if it's able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bakugos, it must be something strong. When the monitoring room quakes, a distant resounding boom traveling through the air, the class collectively agrees again. All Might grits his teeth together, straining to maintain his broad grin. The hero heard the pin that had been pulled from the support device that created that boom. He listened to Katsuki explain the nature of the explosion's power being one of accumulated nitroglycerin. Yet, he also hears the continuous shrill shriek of sawblades running to know Izuku survived the detonation. Kayoka is in the same state of petrification, intently listening to every detail of the brawl's audio that accompanies that shockwave. All Might places a finger over the comm piece in his ear, pressing the device to activate the built-in mic. Back you go. Do that again and you'll be disqualified. He prevents the brash blonde from endangering Izuku before doing the same with the chainsaw boy, and I'm prohibiting Midoriya from using his quirk any longer. From within the damaged infrastructure of the battle building, Katsuki sneers upon hearing All Might's orders in his ear. The blonde places a finger to the communicator in order to operate his own mic so that he can shout back, Fuck that. I can take him. I want a fair fight. Before Katsuki can get a response refuting him, he plucks the device out of his ear and tosses it down. Opposite of his childhood friend turned lifelong bully, Izuku shifts to do the same. 
if that's what you want. A distorted growl comes through the boy's elongated fangs as he removes his own earpiece. He tosses the miniature pot aside before goading his enemy with a broad spread of his chainsaw-mounted arms. Kaken. Katsuki's heavy boot crushes his discarded earbud. Cutting off All Might's unheard shout, No, kid, I told you not to fucking call me that shit. Katsuki propels himself forward with explosive bursts to close the gap between himself and his opponent. The overlapping detonations drown out All Might's yelling from Izuku's still functional earbud that lays on the floor out from the boy's ear. Izuku swings his arm blades, the sweeping motion just shy of being an arc. Katsuki redirects himself with his explosions midair, performing an aerial maneuver that carries him over Izuku's head. When the blonde shifts his position to be directly behind the chainsaw boy, he lets off another blast from his hand. The detonation burns itself into Izuku's back. Izuku retaliates with a wild swing as he twists his body to turn around, nicking Katsuki's shoulder. The boys back off from one another before Izuku tries moving in again, going for the legs this time. Katsuki reaches down, snatching the attacking arm as it pushes forward. Katsuki's free hand lets off a round of controlled bursts that help him to pivot and spin Izuku while keeping the hole. Deku, the berserker blonde slams his opponent into the ground by using the momentum as his force of strength. You're nothing compared to me. Don't be so sure. Izuku grinds out through his pointed gritted fangs. The saw blade fixed to his skull makes it easy to keep Katsuki at bay as he turns his body around. Then, Izuku sweeps forwards with a mad rush that really forces the blonde to go on the defensive. A frenzy of swipes pushes Katsuki back until he runs out of room and is forced between a wall or a corner. Katsuki hisses when the teeth of a chainsaw come close to splitting the hairs on his head. You're just swinging your chainsaws around, asshole. Katsuki ignores the assault and meets the attack head-on with explosions. The blonde's chest is torn into, a deep gash instantly cauterized by his own burst of flames. Izuku is burned across his own chest fire scorching his flesh. Take me seriously and fucking apply yourself already. Katsuki yells through his pain as he lets off another massive explosion with the combined effort of both hands. Izuku gets blasted across the corridor and collides with the only wall that remains intact. He hardly has any time to grunt, let alone get back up, before Katsuki is flying towards him with a punch rearing to go. The whole floor gets caught in the explosion that had been winding up in that fist, a bombing disguised as a right hook. Debris puts out the fire that erupts from the blast as rubble rains down onto the level underneath. When the dust clears from where Izuku was caught in the explosion, he's on his butt with his arms crossed in a guarded X formation. The chainsaw bars are covered in as much ash and soot as they are blood. You have to understand your quirk better. Katsuki stomps through the wafting smoke as he lets off a few intimidating pops from his palms. The embers flicker and glow in the dark pit that they've created during their battle. Huh. Izuku lowers his arms to peer up at Katsuki. The boy that had bullied him his entire childhood is now trying to give him advice. The innovative skill meshed with the fighting instinct Katsuki has for his quirk proves there's more uses to the power than just creating explosions and he's saying the same applies for the quirk Pachita granted Izuku. You're the last person that I want to hear that from. Izuku's chainsaws rev back to life with his renewed sense of anger and he rushes forward to meet the boy for another round of combat. Katsuki grins, having successfully baited Izuku. Attached to the belt looped around his hip are a collection of actual grenades. The bomber had pulled one of the pins a while ago, long enough for the detonation to be any second now. Katsuki tosses the whole slew of grenades rather than just the one to get a bigger explosion as he says, boom. The blast blows out the windows on the stories above and destroys enough pillars to shake the entire building's foundation. Another massive burst of fire snuffs itself out in a burial of rubble. Debris continues to pepper the pit that consumes where Izuku had been, closing off the space between Katsuki and the boy with darkness. The bombastic blonde keeps his grin on his face as he stares into the void, finding no sign of his opponent. But then, he hears the whir before the belated buzz of a living chainsaw jump started and returned to life. Katsuki's smile drops just before the malformed frenzy of dizzying spinning metallic teeth comes barreling through the black smoke. A monstrous face of fangs and fury roars with the running of an engine. The chainsaw boy's leap is directly over the blonde, descending in a cutting motion unlike any other. The explosive teen has one shot at stopping the attack with one of his own, directing a detonation from his palms upwards. Izuku is directly upon Katsuki when the explosion goes off. Izuku is launched through several layers of cement, breaching ceiling after ceiling. A streak of flame trails with him, following the range of fire. The orange path brightens when Katsuki follows it with a string of more explosions to take flight and pursue Izuku. Katsuki gets ahead of his enemy and extends a leg, raising it to be hoisted over his head. The bomber's kick collides with Izuku's stomach and receives a boost from a collection of explosions to send them rocketing back down. They slam into the ground, a final detonation marking the impact zone. Beneath Katsuki's boots, Izuku squirms as he continues his struggle to keep fighting the explosive force of nature. 
Blood spews from the chainsaw boy's mouth, oozing between his fangs and dripping down his chin, while his injuries squirt bodily fluids as well. Katsuki watches as the marred flesh slowly stretches to grow back muscle fibers at the very least. Regeneration. The blonde huffs in disbelief over the healing factor that proves itself weak but helpful to his enemy. You were revving your engine before I kicked you, eh? Katsuki winds up for another blast to finish the fight, assuming he's got Izuku beat. No matter, an orange glow radiates from his palm before expanding to the rest of his hand. Heat simmers on the surface of the blonde skin. Then, he ignites the spark to take full advantage of the firepower. The blinding light of the explosion doesn't let him see how, but he feels Izuku move out from beneath him. Katsuki curses when his own attack provides a smokescreen for the chainsaw boy to conceal himself. The only indication of his position the constant whirring of his weaponized body. The dust settles at the right moment for Izuku to reveal himself. Your aim really sucks. You're like a damn cockroach. Katsuki barks back as he meets Izuku's attack. Another mashup of explosions and chainsaws leave more burns and scars. The flames lick at both of the boys before they're tossed into tumbling rolls. Katsuki heaves himself upright, straining his body to stand. He falls down, forcing himself to remain positioned by just one knee. Bitterly, he curses. However, this is more than enough. There's still one final trump card of his. His second gauntlet that stored up another bucket load of nitroglycerin sweat. Katsuki grabs the pin and takes aim where he sees Izuku also struggling to stand up. See you in hell, Deku. A damn chainsaw devil. Katsuki spits when a drop of sweat slides down onto his lip to rid himself of the salty taste in his mouth. Just as he's about to pull the trigger and end the battle to prove his point to Izuku, something rough grabs his arm to stop him. I told you not to use that thing again, young man. All Might's radiant dark blue eyes look down on Katsuki with what can only be disappointment. The hero's broad smile is no longer warm or inviting, but cold and shrouded by a shield of shadow that also obscures the rest of his deepened facial features. All Might tears the grenade-shaped gauntlet off of Katsuki's arm and chucks it, Beck Hugo, you're disqualified. Hearing his teacher put a stop to the match, Izuku allows himself to wind down. The chainsaws sprouting from his body retract and his face begins to return to normal, though he isn't let off the hook either. Not just yet. All Might whirls to face Izuku and reprimands him as well. And you. You took this too far by accepting Bakugo's challenge. The hero puts his hands on his hips, shaking his head. It pains me to do this but I'm going to hold you both accountable for your actions here today and tell Aizawa what happened. Though that punishment somehow doesn't feel as bad as their physical pain or shame over having their idol express disappointment in the Izuku lowers his gaze, not able to meet his hero's eyes. I lost. Katsuki has a distant stare that doesn't quite meet All Might's gaze either. The knee that he'd been using to stabilize himself gives out and he topples over at the exact time Class 1 catches up to their teacher. Back you go. Tenya shouts from the head of the pack when he sees his classmate go down. All Might turns around when he hears the call, seeing the unconscious blonde and rushes to his aid. Back you go. Can you hear me? All Might tries shaking the boy awake. When he receives no response, he checks for vitals. When the hero confirms Katsuki is still alive, he breathes a sigh of relief. I need a set of volunteers to bring back Hugo to recovery girl. All Might looks to the class for assistance now that he has his hands full. I can take him. Ijiro steps forward with his hand raised. Students move aside so he can get up front and see the situation better. The redhead isn't expecting to see Katsuki covered in so many lacerations. I'll go too. Tenya is the next to volunteer. He adjusts his glasses as he explains his reasoning. He was my teammate. As such, Bakugo's health as of now should be my responsibility. Well put. All Might hands over Katsuki along with his approval. The two boys take an end of their injured classmate to carry him off to the school nurse. Though the class didn't get to see exactly what Izuku's quirk is or what it does, they now have an idea of what it can do. That alone is enough to horrify them if their expressions are anything to go by. As Katsuki's body is taken away, Everyone recoils at the sight of so much blood. Izuku's teammate stands beside Kayoka, the two girls sharing pitying looks. What the hell is he? Some kind of devil. A member of the class speaks for most of the others as they stare at Izuku in spooked wonderment. Humid air wafts over small spills of murky liquid, precipitating and giving rise to a hissed exhalation of attenuated but serried steam. Each puddle is as dark as the sepulchral surroundings, damp echoes reverberating like fleeting footfalls. Shadows sweep the spacious zone even without a source of dim lighting. The flicker of the black void reflected by each tiny watery pool. Scratches litter the scuffed surface of the floor. The solid stone chipped and darkened like an asphalt road. A faint illumination gives way to the black vacuous abyss. Viscous fluid percolates like a cerulean lava lamp. The hefty shape of a silhouette floating from within the cylinder tank's soft glow casting a shadow in the ever-expansive umbra of darkness that is the room itself. Wires run from the bottom of the container, each cable a different color from the rest but all of them sharing the same haunting hum. 
bobbing up and down to the suzerate tune. The delineated figure residing in the tank stirs with the filtrating fluid. Attached to the purlins and the rafters that loom overhead are a series of steel catwalks. Various metal bridges trail above as equally many cerulean containers. Hanging from the handrails is a young boy, watching with a scarlet stare obscured by long clumps of uneven hair that borders the same hue as the liquid in the tanks below him. Dried patches of skin around his eyes pull into wrinkles. He gnaws on the bottom of his chapped lip with flaxen-tinged teeth. The plain black clothes covering his body helps him to blend into the dark atmosphere. A being directly below the boy is acutely aware of the child's presence anyways. Even with a visual impairment, the lack of eyeballs to be precise, the man knows more than one may assume. Where empty sockets wallow in the marred mesh of disfigurement that is pure evil's face, is also torn tissue where a nose should be. Yet, the seated sinister force is one to be reckoned with, his heightened sense of hearing having him tilt his head to turn an ear and listen. A wicked smile graces the man's lips, presenting pearly white teeth close to ivory. The grin resides behind in his equally crystal clear ventilator mask, the respiratory support whirring with every intake of breath. Machines buzz behind him. Large consoles plug to even bigger modems providing a life support system. The medical equipment kept grouped together produces the sounds of a hospital hall just at a lower decibel to the point of being a quiet ambience. Oxygen pumps through a valve and circuitry connects to even more wiring. Despite all this, the collection of equipment has the presence of powering a super weapon rather than keeping a human alive. The man may have taken severe damage during the battle with his greatest rival, but he still carries a vigorous aura of villainy. Doctor, a terrifying tranquil tone purrs through the parted lips of the man's grin. Like a vast expanse kept still on the surface such as the ocean, a bottomless depth of doom resides below the deceptively delicate decibel of voice. Then, a wave of wrath unbridles the sea until the disturbance becomes an overwhelming force. Status report. An authoritative switch sways all sense of direction and commands whoever gets caught in the tide to succumb to it. Green circular lenses twist to give the man's presence an attentive look. The short-statured scientist sits atop his own chair, albeit with less electronics engineered into its mechanical working. The portly doctor wears a set of customized goggles that provide him with night vision to see in the dark, the usage of his eyes still detrimental to him unlike his master. My liege, the Namu has taken to my trial and testing. The scientist smooths out his bushy mustache with one hand while using the other to operate his chair lift with a joystick. It's finally responsive he lowers himself to be positioned across from his creation that resides within a preservation tank. The doctor's master broadens his grin until it's as deep as the crevices of his scarred face. Excellent. The foreboding reply lingers in the eerie echo of the chamber before he continues. If the nerve damage can be successfully reduced for a plentitude transference of quirks, then the next phase of my plan can commence the bioengineered Namu that the villain speaks of floats in its tank, a pink brain organ exposed atop its head. Gashes where more glaring results of operation cover the creature's body lay dormant with the rest of it. A broad beak full of fangs is slightly parted, the maw making for a mouth that can't speak. It is. The doctor pauses to carefully consider the word he'll use to describe his progress. Significant his mustache furrows with the curl of his lips. However, not enough for. He proceeds with caution as he admits there's still work to be done. Human trials. I see. The smile coming from the scientist's master diminishes at that news. The man taps his index finger on the armrest of his chair, done as impatiently as the movement is done thoughtfully. A moment passes before he asks with a slight leer, what seems to be the delay, doctor. The doctor swallows his own spit, mouth suddenly gone dry. He nearly mistakes the saliva for blood, a copper tinge to the taste startling him. The Namu is primitive in its intelligence. He busies himself with explaining his creation's drawbacks in an attempt to quell his nerves. I made it compliant with orders. It's obedient to a fault the invention stares out at him like a dead fish from its tank, except it requires those tasks in order to function the exposed brain stitched and stapled to the base of the monster's skull is essentially disabled. I'm afraid it's otherwise completely without a mind of its own. Unable to think for itself, the scientist looks away from the malformed beast to gauge his master's reaction. The man hums as he mulls over the doctor's diagnosis of the Namo, a result of my quirk transference. The mind was not able to handle it all. He rests his jaw on the knuckles of his propped arm after inquiring for more information. Partially, the doctor shifts his chair with his joystick to maneuver himself to be in front of a computer station, while I have been working to remedy the extent to which the human body will allow such a strain of quirks. A few taps and clicks of his keyboard pulls up schematics and other scientific jargon. You also asked me to alter the brain to stimulate your quirk's invasion to form a symbiotic relationship. The doctor plays a simulation on the screen to show the metaphorically rotted fruits of his labor, and this is the result of the experiment. The doctor's master turns his head to look away from the monitor, and returns his general gaze to the direction of the Namu. 
even without a set of eyes, he can somehow see. A millennia of accumulating quirks does more than enough to generate other means of sight. Whether echolocation and sonar as a bat perceives things suffices or infrared heat wave detection works. Those are just a few ways to name a few. Trial and error, my lord. The doctor bows as low as he can go from the confines of his chair. After paying his respect, he sits back up and repositions his seat to shift back towards his master. I vow to resolve the issue eventually. We've already begun forcing memories in and out. The malicious man angles his head towards the boy in the rafters above him as he speaks. A smile begins to reshape itself across his faulted features despite his next sentence. I don't believe we have the time necessary to dally in that department anymore, dear doctor. The scientist scrunches up his face with confusion. Unlike his master, he is unaware of the boy's presence to find the open discussion humorous in any way. What would you have me do? He treads carefully as he asks for elaboration. We begin transferring quirks and small dosages to strengthen Tamura's immunity. The boy on the catwalk somehow flinches and freezes at the same time when he hears his name mentioned. A draft overtakes the room as though somebody opened a window, sending shivers down Tamura's spine as he bends down to hear better. The doctor feels as equally cold when his master levels an eyeless gaze with him. I think it's about time we provide the boy with a pet, don't you? The mad scientist sneaks a glance towards one of his other bioengineered creations, one that he kept for himself. It's a small rendition of the Namo, one of the failures. It cocks its head like a curious animal, its exposed brain not fully comprehending its own existence. The harmless creature makes its creator slightly protective as he pleads for it to stay with him, not Johnny. No, not Johnny. The scientist's master smirks with a hint of amusement. He folds his hands together while leaning back in his chair, fingers steepled in a tight interwoven connectivity. I believe a dog would be more sufficient. The scientist nor Tamura are expecting that to be the villain's drawn conclusion. A hey, dog. The doctor makes sure that he's hearing things correctly. There's no better bond than between a boy and his dog. The conniving undertone behind the man's vile grin speaks of more than just getting a child a pet. Consider this a new baseline experiment. One to further supplement the effectiveness of the end goal. And only the villain's mad scientist understands why with eyes as wide as the lens of his goggles. The decision to get Tamura a dog is self-explanatory when the doctor's master says, The only other bond that the boy has is with myself, after all. The stronger the relationship, the more willing to welcome the channeling of quirks. The doctor nods along with his master's thought process before agreeing, that could work. Oh, dear doctor, I know it will. The villainous response is full of malice and yet the boy in the rafters is none the wiser to his current guardian's devious scheme. The child named Tamura is instead too fixated on his own hands. He stares at his open palms and the digits attached to them, twiddling his fingers. Frusted nails have specks of dust under them. He remembers the last time he had a pet dog, and what happened when those hands had touched it. The destructive power of his quirk makes him fold his fingers over, willing them to never brush against his new dog's fur. He refuses to hold the animal that his sensei plans on giving him. He'll never hold the dog. He'll never hug it. Clouds ruffle in ripples like a careening curtain that's been pulled back to let the sunlight shine through. Beyond the congregation of pure white nebulous are acres of bright blue. Izuku can't help but admire the sky that seems to shimmer as wind blows his hair into artistic swirls shaped similarly to the clouds above. Shade sweeps over the rooftop of Yua from where he's seated on its ledge, legs dangling in the breeze. A calm serenity fills the air with the tune of chirping birds. Whole grain bread that's been toasted golden brown crunches with the thick tomato and fresh lettuce that resides between slices as Izuku takes a bite of his sandwich. An aroma wafts from the food and becomes a fragrance that the air itself seems to savor as much as the boy does. Juicy flavors, warm and cold, tangle his taste buds as he chews on the combination of wheat and vegetable. Crumbs chip away and fall into Izuku's open bento box to bounce off Ziploc bagged orange slices and grapes. He'd gone up to the roof to have his packed lunches when he attended Aldera during junior high. Eating on the top of his school feels oddly nostalgic as he munches on a mouthful of toasted bread he bit off from the corner of his sandwich. He watches the cherry blossoms planted below billow with another breeze that blows through, mind in a daze and his eyes entranced as pink petals flutter about in a huge flurry. Birds cease their singing and fly away, frantically flapping their wings that loose feathers float in their wake. I was wondering where you went. A feminine voice draws Izuku from his thoughts and has him turning his attention with his body to the stairwell behind him. He recognizes the girl coming from the roof accessway as his friend and classmate, but still feels his facial muscles pulling into a perturbed expression. Jiru, he wonders why she'd also be occupying the rooftop during their lunch period. Completely oblivious, he has a hard time deducing any valid reasoning. Even after she walks over to his spot to sit beside him with her own food, he can't figure it out. Dumbly, he asks, what are you doing up here? Kayoka flicks him on the forehead as though that'll jog his brain function to start working again. I've been looking for you, stupid. 
Izuku rubs his slightly sore temple as the girl huffs with disbelief. I should be the one asking you that question. A small shake of her head has Izuku lowering his. Oh oh. His neck bends as he sinks his head even lower. He only raises both after so that he can nervously scratch his scalp. I guess that's fair. His fingernails run through his curly green locks, sometimes splitting hairs and sometimes getting caught in the tangled mess. I got worried when I didn't see you in the cafeteria for lunch. We normally eat together, so I thought maybe something was wrong. Kyoka picks at the rice on her tray with a plastic spork but doesn't bother scooping any of it just yet as she side eyes Izuku. Izuku looks away, avoiding her line of sight. I just… His voice catches in his throat like it's his sandwich before he swallows. Slowly, he turns his head to look at Kyoka again. She waits with gentle eyes. I don't like the stares I've been getting recently. Izuku holds the girl's gaze before adding, Nobody wants me there, so I figured I'd go somewhere else. Kayoka winces with her eyes. I'm sure that's not the case, but she can see where the boy is coming from as he sulks with his sandwich, even if it is. And everybody is still freaked out about what happened with Bakugo. Who cares? She tries blowing it off with a wave of her hand to loosen him up a bit. I don't. His shrug is a small one but he does seem to pick up on the carefree vibe. A wry smile is directed towards nobody in particular as Izuku looks up at the sky. I'm used to eating alone. Hey. Kayoka nudges him with her shoulder to remind him that she's still sitting next to him. He looks back at her as she says softly, you're not alone. Izuku's face turns a shade of red and he finds himself redirecting his gaze once again. Thanks. He mumbles his appreciation as his smile turns a bit more genuine. Kayoka blushes too. Hers a tone of pink that matches the petals that have blown their way to the rooftop where she and Izuku reside. Yeah, she mumbles even quieter while looking in any direction but at the boy. A few seconds of silence pass between them before Izuku sighs and says, At least Bakugo's been avoiding me ever since instead of trying to start more trouble the weight of the sandwich in the boy's hand reminds him to take a bite. Kayoka nods, spooning a mouthful of her own food. He hasn't said anything about the fight either. No matter how much Kirishima or the others ask, the flimsy spork in her hand bends as she pokes at her rice again. She recalls the class trying to get answers out of him before the bombastic blonde blew up on them. Literally, a teacher had to come and separate him from the others after setting off the sprinkler system. I'm surprised. Izuku blinks back his shock before pressing his thumb into the toasted bread of his sandwich. Kayoka tilts her head when she hears the crunch of the bun. I didn't think he'd keep my quirk to himself afterwards. The girl listens closely to the boy's whispered words that are unclear whether they're meant for her or himself. She sets her utensil down on her tray, then fixes Izuku with a sad stare. You know you can't keep it hidden from everyone forever, right? Secrets come out eventually. She tries to be as gentle as possible as she warns him of the consequences of hiding his quirk. Izuku nods before putting the remainder of his sandwich back in his bento box. I know that. I'm just not ready. He loses his appetite and closes it. You saw how they reacted by just seeing what it can do. Kayoka reaches out to touch his shoulder consolingly, but pauses mid-movement, her hand hovering in place as she thinks better of it. Her hand lowers as she tries cheering him up with words of assurement alone. Some of our classmates are nice enough that I don't think it'll bother them once they know, at least, the ones I've spoken to. Maybe. Izuku shrugs noncommittally. Quickly, he hides his somber mood with a smile meant to cheer Kayoka up instead. Don't let me stop you from making friends either way though. Kayoka blinks, taken by surprise. She shrugs in return once she recovers. Eh, hey, I really only know Yeyorazu and Ashido so far. The boy's smile is contagious though. Who? He curiously cocks his head to the side as he inquires to know which of his classmates Kayoka is referring to. Kayoka pauses as she tries to think of a way to describe them. A faint blush dusts her face before she mimes holding something invisible, you know. Yeyorazu is the one with the… Her blush deepens when Izuku realizes the positioning of her hands is in front of her chest. Izuku instantaneously turns red and shouts the first other distinguishable quality of the girl that he can think of, the ponytail. Kayoka looks away to hide her embarrassment as she nods. Why yeah, she mentally kicks herself for not choosing Yeyorazu's hairstyle to describe her as Izuku had. Eager to get past the awkward mood, she switches to describing the other girl that she befriended. Ah, and Ashido is the pink one. Kayoka's mind can't help but wander to thinking about the size of Ashido's bust too though. She seems nice. Izuku's reply sets her nerves on fire when she looks down at her boobs and mentally compares the size of them with her female classmate. What's that supposed to mean? Kayoka's ear jacks rays into attack mode to threaten the boy as the girl succumbs to a sudden surge of anger. Ah, what the, I'm just saying she's a nice person. Izuku throws his hands up defensively while reeling back from the menacing display of the girl's quirk. He nearly falls off the roof's ledge as he tries scooting away to avoid getting assaulted by the pulses of her heartbeat vibration. Fortunately for him, Kayoka's attack never comes. She simmers down with a huff. The girl crosses her arms and looks down at the tray in her lap. Her lunch stares lifelessly back at her as she thinks about Ashido, she has a crush on you. 
I think. Oh, Izuku's blush returns just as it was about to leave. He looks down at his own lap where he fiddles with his hands, his own thumbs wrestling themselves. Kayoka shyly raises her eyes to look at him, blushing as deeply as he is. The girl's ear jacks begin to squirm with her body as she sheepishly tries to tell Izuku something else. I also. Um, you know, sirens suddenly screech through the school's speaker system, the blaring noise making the girl stop mid-sentence to instinctively cover her ears with a grimace. Izuku pulls his legs up from the roof sledge so that he can stand and look around. Kayoka slowly gets to her feet to glance towards the stairwell from which the noise is the loudest. The prolonged sound is an alarm that reverberates throughout the entire building as much as it rings outside. Izuku steps towards the ridge of the roof, peering over its ledge. From there, he can see the Yua barrier has been breached by a crowd of paparazzi somehow. Instead of the security system's gate keeping people out, everyone is pouring in through the entrance. It's just a bunch of reporters. Izuku looks to his side to see Kayoka has joined him at the ledge to look over with him. We should be fine so long as we stay up here. He can't help but look past the reporters and still feel a cause for concern though. The barrier doesn't appear to be malfunctioning. It looks damaged. He doesn't voice his thoughts to worry Kayoka but he can't imagine a reporter destroying Yue's gate just to get a scoop should they receive reprimanding for property damage. Izuku's gaze sweeps the grounds from the wall to the line of cherry blossoms. There, breaking off from the pathway and using the paparazzi as a distraction, Izuku spots someone in a black hoodie. I bet everyone in the cafeteria is panicking. Kayoka's own musings break his hyper-focus on the intruder but he doesn't quite lose sight of the trespasser either. He keeps his eye on the direction that the prowler is heading while listening to Kayoka say, We should probably let them know it's a false alarm. Izuku nods as he backs up towards the stairwell to head inside. Yeah, good idea. He turns and begins to pick up his pace when he resolves himself to pursue the intruder that he saw entering the school. You stay here and let me deal with it. There's no need for both of us to get caught up in the chaos, but not without glancing over his shoulder to ensure Kayoka's safety isn't put at risk. Oh, sure. The boy is gone by the time Kayoka blinks back her confusion. She idly glances back down from her rooftop view, seeing her teachers have arrived to hold back the media frenzy and get the situation under control. Present Mike shouts at them to leave, his yelling almost as loud as the emergency siren's shrill shriek. The sound of Izuku's red sneakers slapping the school's tiled floor is barely audible under the mixture of raucous noises. Coupled with the shouts of distant students in the hallway over stampeding on top of one another, the boy is able to move through the corridors undetected. Izuku knows that his unnoticed movements don't bode well for the heroes catching Yue's intruder should they be moving more stealthily than he. It's up to him to find and stop the trespasser somehow in such a case. So when Izuku finds the teacher's lounge left alone with its door ajar, he knows that he has to hurry. The boy frantically enters the room, nearly tripping on the carpet and stumbles into a plush couch. Across the way, between him and a small coffee table, is the hooded intruder. They're not just trespassing and damaging property, but they're stealing. A folder is flipped open, paper contents held oddly with one finger poised from each hand. Hey, Izuku shouts to get the thief's attention. The hooded intruder glances upwards, startled by the callout. A pair of beady red eyes peer out from shadowed and dried patches of skin. Chap lips paired with a scar sneer at the hero student. The man emits a dangerous aura that makes Izuku hesitate and think twice about going any closer or saying anything else. The raised fingers of the hands holding the school's stolen documents slowly lower and touch down with the other digits, as though the paper had been thrown into a fire. They shrivel and rapidly turn to dust. Izuku's eyes broaden with his mind's horrific deduction of what the man's quirk is capable of. All it takes is five fingers to make contact with something for the touched object to decay almost instantaneously. With the paper evidence completely decimated, there will be no evidence as to what documents were viewed. A dark purple wisp of smoke starts to spiral until it creates a whirling vortex. The spinning motion creates a portal behind what Izuku deduces must be a villain. When a hot feeling bubbles up in his throat to make him cough, he almost believes the smog is a form of knockout gas. It's only when the copper taste of blood reaches his mouth that he realizes the bubbles were his own bodily fluids surfacing. He coughs into the crook of his arm, staining his sleeve. Izuku tries to step forward, but his body lurches with the motion and he's held back by his illness attacking him during the worst of times. The hooded villain slowly backs away into the warp gate behind him, red eyes watching Izuku all the while. Unable to chase the intruder due to his disease holding him down, Izuku glares back. The dark fumes close around the villain and gradually shroud him in the vortex until the dissipation of the smoke takes him with it. All of the deep purple shrinks towards the left pupil of his eye. And then, it blinks away. The villain vanishes. Izuku clutches his chest, groaning as he crouches to one knee. For some reason, his heart aches for the mysterious criminal. An olfactory illusion of smell permeates the air. A metallic mixture of copper and iron generating rust. 
The aroma is more delicious than any flavor. A young girl inhales the scent through her nose, her cheeks puffing up from the air flowing in until they turn red. She squeals like the little schoolgirl that she is while she blushes intently, skipping in the direction of the alluring fragrance. Her navy blue skirt flicks and swishes with every hop, swaying in sync with the loose red neckerchief tied around her Kansai collar. Blonde buns bounce atop her tiny head as she prances merrily along the canal that stretches beside the desolate street of her neighborhood. She slides down the empty channel like it's a slide on a playground, giggling on the way down. Once she reaches the bottom, she dusts herself off and springs back to her exaggerated steps. A bridge running over the halfpipe stretches overhead further down the path. The sweet scent pulling her by her nostrils strengthens as she draws closer to it, the source coming from under the overpass. The girl skipping slows to a stop when she finds a group of boys crowding around the smell's origin. Quickly, before they can notice her presence, she runs to hide behind a torn tire tread and some filled up trash bags. From the secret spot, she can see the boys are kicking another boy who's been beaten badly. The boy that's been hurt is slick with blood, and she knows when she breathes in the air that he's the one with such a mouth-watering aroma. A widespread grin stretches across the girl's facial features, tiny fangs glaring in the sunlight. A sharp kick cuts the already battered boy's cheek open, eliciting a spray of blood like the juices of a peeled tangerine. Some of the droplets dot the blonde girl's clothes, but a singular bit of residue lands on her chin. Full of delight, she licks the liquid from her skin and relishes in its tangy flavor. A pair of feline eyes narrow into thin slits as they watch closely. The girl's yellow gaze captivated by the scene in front of her. The boy being kicked around curls in on himself defensively, not even trying to fight back. Every bit of blood they take from him makes her shiver. Only when who the girl supposes is the group's ringleader holds a hand up to signal the end of the boy's misery do they cease the beatdown. Everybody steps back as though they're giving their victim some room for his labored breathing. All but the boss of the bunch, a spiky-haired blonde, who stalks forwards to get closer. The group's leader bends down to grab the bloody boy by his notably green hair, forcing his punching bag to look at him. Learn your lesson yet. The rhetorical question goes unanswered and then the blonde boy slams the other boy's face into the rough cement of the canal to grind it back and forth. Know your place. Blood smears across the ground from the beaten boy's broken nose. A muffled moan expresses the boy's suffering enough to be satisfying for his tormentor to stop. The blonde boy then steps on his victim's back and uses the body as leverage to stand up, stay beneath my foot. When the blonde boy spits on the submissive boy and adds, fucking villain. The blonde girl that has been watching the whole time snaps out of her trance. No longer does she marvel at the scene. Her grin recedes until she loses her smile completely, replaced by a pouty frown. Suddenly, she's no longer entertained by the band of bullies drawing blood from their victim. Yeah, stupid villain. One of the other bullies chimes in with a cackle. The girl balls her pudgy hands into tiny fists as she listens to the rest of the boys join in on the mocking laughter. That same bully who's wearing a backwards baseball cap points towards their victim's feet with an elongated finger. Hey, how come Deku has All Might sneakers if he's a villain? A malicious grin stretches across his face as he suggests, we should take his shoes. The bully's cheering and collective agreement drowns out any weak noises of protest that their prey can muster. They remove the green-haired boy's shoes without much resistance. A final few jeers about the boy being a villain despite their cruel behavior being highly hypocritical is what they leave their victim with after stealing his sneakers. Each of them climb up the canal to ride away on their bikes, leaving the beaten boy to wallow in his own blood. Only after all of the bullies have left does the girl venture out from her hiding place. She stares at the unmoving green-headed boy with something akin to pity in her eyes, looking past his physical injuries and considering the mental abuse he'd just suffered as well. The girl can empathize with the boy, having been called a villain herself. She wonders if the reason why the boy didn't bother fighting back was to try and prove them wrong. He has his eyes sealed shut, completely unaware of her presence. Her shadow looms over him as she tries to figure what about the boy could seem so villainous to warrant such a brutal beating. The boy appears unassuming, almost plain. Then again, nobody would imagine a young schoolgirl like her has such a vile villainous quirk either. The blonde girl frowns and shakes her head to clear out all of the negative thoughts swarming her mind. She instead does what she always does to push down those dark desires and impulses. She smiles, an ear-to-ear -ear grin like earlier returns to her face as she bends down to the injured boy's level. Hi. Her bright and bubbly squeak of a voice doesn't match her mood but it completely fools the boy when his eyes snap open to see her grinning at him. The bun blonde waves to him despite being so close before reaching that same hand out for him to grab. My name's Himiko Toga. What's yours? Timidly, perhaps even cautiously, the boy matches the gesture with a shaky hand before taking hers. Izuku Midoriya. His soft voice blows away with the wind that runs through the canal. Himiko pulls and helps him to slowly sit up. He winces from pain but bites back any complaints. When he's propped upright, he realizes they're still holding hands and quickly pulls his away. 
A blush blends with red splotches of blood on his face. Emiko giggles, a blush of her own fading in when she remembers the reason why she had been drawn to the boy in the first place. Oddly, coupled with a few freckles on his cheeks, she thinks he looks really cute covered in all that blood. A tinge of the taste she got earlier lingers on her tongue, making her mouth water. When her slanted eyes land on his shoeless feet, her smile sobers and she swallows her saliva to temporarily quench her thirst. Himiko's pitying look returns as she thinks about the bullies calling him a villain. Izuku surprises her when he musters some strength to the tone of his weak voice. Why you don't have to pretend to be nice to me, you know. The boy stares at her with eyes as fragile as glass that she can see the cracks in them. She falters as she thinks he's seen through her facade of a grin and discovered the cracks in her own mask. When his shoulders slump and he looks away though, she realizes that he's not reading that deep, that he's simply seeing the surface level of what he's used to. I'm fine. His mumble is back to its delicate decibel as he lowers his head. It's Izuku's turn to be startled when he hears Himiko's tougher tone. You're not fine she stands up from her crouch so that she can broadly gesture at their surroundings. There's rocks and broken bottles down here, so it'll hurt to walk around without shoes. The gesturing of her hands goes to his feet before she grabs at her own. I'll lend you one of mine. If you wear one shoe, only one of your feet will hurt. The girl slips off a red sneaker and holds it out to the boy. It's her favorite, the color of blood, but she offers it with a smile anyways. W what? Izuku's bafflement leaves him in a staring stupor. When he doesn't take the shoe himself, Himiko tosses it towards him. He reflexively catches it, snapping out of his daze. And no, seriously, I'm fi, um, I mean, I don't need it. He holds the red sneaker out for her to take back while frantically shaking his head. The bright color of the shoe matches the blush returning to his bloodied face as he stumbles over whatever other words he fails to muster. Himiko hops back on one foot, her grin growing as she releases a teasing titter. Then give it back to me. She turns and skips a small distance away before turning back and urging him on with a wave to follow. Come on. Come give it back then. They. They. Izuku's brain slowly processes that the girl is running away from him. Hurriedly, he forces himself to his feet to chase after her. W. Wait. Your shoe. What is with? Izuku grunts when he steps on a pebble. Suddenly, the blonde's tactic is clear to him and he's left with no other choice. He begrudgingly pulls on the single sneaker Himiko gave him. You gotta be kidding me. Himiko half limps as she tries to stay ahead of the boy when he pursues her. Oh, oh, oh. The fabric of her sock isn't enough to protect her foot like a shoe sole can as she runs through the empty channel. Behind her, Izuku winces with every step in a similar state of self-inflicted pain as he tries to keep pace with the girl. W wait up. Stop. Izuku begins to close the distance between them when Himiko starts climbing the halfpipe to reach the road above. He clambers to follow her and matches her movements. The incline makes for a concrete hill to slightly hike, one that leaves both of the kids breathing heavily by the time that they reach the top of it. There, Himiko puts her hands on her hips to pose as triumphantly as she sounds. Now we're out of the pit. The sidewalk makes for a more flat surface that the two can stand on evenly with one another. Until Himiko bends down to pull off her other sneaker, here, take my other shoe too. Now both of your feet will be protected on your way home. And no, thank you. Izuku tries pushing the offered shoe away but it winds up in his hands anyways. He looks down at the red sneaker. The one he has on already fits surprisingly well. I, I don't need your shoes. But he still tries to return them. Then throw them away. Himiko waves the shoes away when Izuku tries giving them back. The boy's perturbed expression leads her to respond with an exaggerated shrug and an excusive explanation. They're old anyways. H. Ha. Huh. He takes another look at the red sneakers but sees nothing that would show their age like the girl says they are. Considering how young she is, they should be mudded or scuffed from playing. But there's not a single mark. The shoes are brand new. As though they had been bought just for Izuku to last a lifetime. Himiko looks at the boy closely, still trying to see what kind of path he'll choose to walk. Hey, Izukun. He blushes when she twists the kanji in his name to be affectionate and not Deku. Though he can also hear how serious her tone is. He can see her solid expression. Whether you walk on this side of the divide or that one. He can see the split between her quiet neighborhood and the clamorous city that the canal makes. And he can understand that there's something special about the way that she's addressing him that goes beyond just kindness. The sun becomes the settled heart of the horizon, illuminating the line between villains and heroes, with Izuku's shadow casted in the middle. Himiko squints to see whether the boy's future will be as bright as the sky or as dark as his silhouette as she says. I hope to see you standing proudly. Subdued but otherwise bright light from the morning cascades the classroom through tilted window blinds. It's early in the day that a flaxen sleeping bag still resides out in the open. Hovering above the empty bedroll behind a broad desk are a student, and the man that would ordinarily occupy that yellow sleeping bag. Izuku's overworked and underslept homeroom teacher pinches the skin of his temple in a vain attempt to soothe the headache that threatens to turn into a migraine. 
First your irresponsibility with Bakugo and now this. Aizawa just listened to his student's story of how Yua had been broken into and how the boy had encountered that intruder without alerting. Any staff sooner, I should have you expelled. He has half a mind to avoid dealing with another problem child but thinks better of it when recalling the whole purpose of his job is to help with the kid's development into a reliable hero. If it weren't for Vlad and I scheduling before, I'd have you be the one to miss today's field trip. Aizawa mulls over alternative punishments that he could provide instead but doesn't get very far in his thought process before other students begin filing in. For now, just take your seat. Aizawa sighs while shooing Izuku away. Oh, good morning. It's good to see you arrive early for once, Midoriya. Tenya moves like a robot that hasn't been oiled as he gives his classmate a stiff wave. Perhaps it's much too early in the day even for him to fully function just yet. H. Hey, Mida. I'm just here because I was meeting with Aizawa-sensei beforehand. Izuku's wave is so much softer by comparison that it barely lifts high enough to even register as a wave. He slumps into his desk's chair just as equally exhausted. He hadn't slept much last night. His dreams plagued by nightmares of the villain that he exchanged glares with. Ah, I see, Tenya nods as he sits at his own desk. When he settles in, he sees an unfamiliar face filing in behind everybody else and stands back up. Excuse me, I believe you're in the wrong classroom. He chops with an outstretched arm to stop a girl with vines for hair from going any further. But Aizawa grabs the boy's arm and moves it so that the girl can get through. Actually, class rep, she's supposed to be here. The teacher has her stand off to the side as he explains. I called her to our class today for a reason that I'll explain shortly after everybody is seated. Tenya's eyes widen behind his glasses before he drops into a bow. He bends deep at the waist, my apologies. Bifocals nearly falling off of his face that he has to catch them before they can. Who's the hottie? The shortest student in the class ironically sits in the back that he has to strain in order to see up front. His eyes are as big and round as the purple balls atop his head. As some of you may have noticed, a member of Class 1B will be joining us today in place of Bakugo. Aizawa raises his voice so that the whole class can hear as he introduces the girl. This is Ibarra Shizaki. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you for having me. She humbly places both of her hands together and gives everyone a polite bow. The vines serving as her hair are tied into a neat cross shape that drapes her forehead, showcased as part of her courteous presentation of herself. Not that I'm complaining to have a cutie come by, but I don't get it. The boy with a lightning streak in his hair runs a hand through his blonde locks as he ogles the newcomer. Sparks flicker from his fingertips but they fail to jumpstart his brain as he scratches his head. As part of Midoriya's and Bakugo's punishment, they'll be alternating classes by weekly intervals. Aizawa shoots Izuku a quick glare that makes the boy reflexively duck down. Izuku feels everybody else's eyes on him too but knows better than to add on the detail about additional homework or the formal apologetic essay he's supposed to write if he wishes to make a vain attempt of soothing his situation. It was Nezu's idea to keep them separated this way. So if you don't like it, then take it up with the principal. Aizawa finally moves his glare away from solely Izuku and fixes it on the rest of the class. So Bakugo is going to miss the field trip today. Hiroraka winces sympathetically for the boy. Man, what a bummer that must be for him and Ijiro mimics her expression with a nod. If all of you don't quiet down and get ready, then you'll miss the bus and nobody will go on the trip. Aizawa shuts them up before any other students put in their two cents. He thrusts a thumb over his shoulder to urge them on while saying, hurry to the lockers if you want to wear your hero costume or gym uniform. Right, depending on the sort of activity we'll be doing. Our outfits might be ill-suited and just get in the way. Momo pauses to mull over her own decision while everybody else starts filing out of the room and into the hallway. Where was it that the syllabus said we're going? Something about rescue training. Hanta glances around as he asks his question to nobody in particular. The blonde boy with a tail for his quirk blinks back his surprise due to having an equal lack of information. Rescue training, huh, sounds like another tough day. He scratches the back of his head as he shakes it side to side with dismay. The invisible girl's floating school uniform perks up from beside him before bumping his side to get him as excited as she is. Are you kidding? Come on, this is what being a hero is all about. I'll be right at home in a flood. And the greenette with some resemblance to a frog can't help but agree with her fellow female. Ijiro flashes a pointy-toothed grin as he listens to his classmates and becomes as equally excited about the school trip, though he also notices Ibarra is being awfully quiet in their company. He turns to her in an attempt to get her to join in on the conversation. What about you, new girl? She smiles kindly at him, seeming to appreciate the attempt to get her involved. I'm grateful to be a part of today's trip if it means learning how to help others. The sun beams through a window that they're passing so that Ibarra almost appears to have an angelic halo hovering over her viney head while she answers. So modest. A good number of the class are awestruck by how humble the girl is. When the class reaches the locker rooms, they begin to split based on gender. Rescue training is completely different from battling. 
You know, the boy with a lightning streak in his hair brushes shoulders with Izuku as he passes by. You probably shouldn't use your quirk. Midoriya and mumbles under his breath, whatever it is. Overhearing the comment, Tenya frowns and steps in between them. I told you, Midoriya is our fellow classmate and I won't tolerate any sort of bull. It's not the first time somebody said something ill-minded but he feels the need as class representative to intervene this time. Especially when in the presence of Izuku himself. I it's okay. Ida, I deserve that. Izuku gently pulls Tenya away by the shoulder as he feigns a chuckle to laugh it off. When Izuku's hand falls away, it lingers somewhere in the middle that he finds himself staring at it. I know how destructive my quirk can be. I don't need you or Aizawa reminding me all the time. But then again, I did use it anyways when I fought with Ka back Hugo. So, yeah. The boy that usually hangs around the lightning-themed blonde cocks his ball-covered head to the side. Why did you use your quirk on Bakugo if you knew it would hurt him? Izuku turns his gaze from his hand to his classmate. The same reason he used his quirk on me. Or, at least, I hope for the same reason the reminder that Bakugo fought as equally haphazardly gets some of the boys to look away. We each had something to prove to one another and we'd have just been disrespecting the other had we not used our quirks to go all the way. But Izuku hadn't intended for the equal share of blame to be his justification that he continues with his explanation and elaborates to give them his true reasoning. I guess that makes sense. Hanta pulls on the top of his hero uniform before glancing towards the others to see what they think. Izuku begins getting changed when he realizes the others are nearly ready to leave the lockers too. I don't completely get it, but it sounds like a manly enough reason to me. Ijiro flashes a thumbs up to show his support which gets Hanta to smile and give the same gesture. Midoriya. All eyes suddenly flick to the boy at the back of the locker room. He's usually quiet, keeping mostly to himself. However, from his lone bench, the even split of contrasting colors in his hair stands out as much as his voice now as he asks, Do you regret your decision? Izuku finds his classmate's heterochromic gaze and holds it for a second. The question is one that Izuku would have never considered until now. He breaks eye contact to look at himself. His bare chest exposes the dangling pulley string attached to his sternum. Unlike some of his classmates who are stuck with additional appendages like a tail or who are completely invisible at all times, he can choose whether to activate his quirk or not. Midoriya, Tenya cautiously and gently prods at Izuku when he sees his peer spacing out. It's okay, the heterochromic hero student stands up and hurriedly heads for the exit. You don't have to answer that. Izuku looks after his classmate but doesn't call out or chase after him. Let's not dally. Everyone, especially when Tenya gives him and the other boys a stern reminder that Aizawa is waiting for them to finish getting dressed for the trip. When they all do finally finish changing, they funnel out towards the front of the school where they find a bus waiting. It's good to see you all made it here. Aizawa dramatizes his impatience by checking his wrist for a watch that isn't there. You're only half a minute late. Sorry, sensei. However, we shall make up for time with my seating chart. Everyone line up according to your ID numbers and fill those seats in an orderly fashion. Tenya takes charge with one hand chopping in a directory pattern while the other presents a drawing he made for them to follow. Ada's going full throttle. Your Araka sweat drops as the class rep instructs everyone to load into the bus in an orderly fashion. She's torn between wanting to laugh or cringe. Is he always this diligent? Ibarra follows in line with everyone else but still whispers a question to the pinkette that she's with. That's one way of putting it, Mina grins. She doesn't even try to stifle her giggle. But all of the effort the class rep puts into their seating comes to a crashing halt once they actually begin to board the bus. Gah. Darn. It was this type of bus. Tenya sulks when he sees the layout is completely different from what he had planned. All that work for nothing. Momo shakes her head at the sorry sight before taking her seat. As Izuku finds his own, Kayoka tags along and sits beside him. Hey. She greets him as casually as she can before asking, you holding up okay? Yeah, Izuku schools his expression to hide whatever he was letting show through in case the locker room incident shook him up more than he had thought before replacing it with a smile, thanks for asking. Suddenly, Mina practically falls backwards to shove her way between him and Kayoka. Mind if I squeeze in here, Midori. Her usual grin looks mischievous to Ibarra that the religious girl finds another place to sit. Recalling what Kayoka had told him on Yue's roof, Izuku finds it difficult to quell his anxiety with how close of a proximity she's made for herself with him. Um, a uh, ribbit, the frog-like greenette of the class chimes in from the other side of the boy. Izuku is startled at first, but feels slightly thankful for the distraction when she takes his attention for herself. Midoriya, I generally say what's on my mind, though he's fully aware of how she wedged herself in as well. I is that so? Izuku tilts a curious head to the side as he braces himself for whatever it is that she has to say. Past Mina, Kayoka turns an ear to listen in too. I can't help but wonder why you keep your quirk so secretive. The greenette places a finger on her chin as a thoughtful gesture. It makes me feel like you have something to hide that you don't want us all knowing about. Eavesdropping across the way, Ijiro nods along. 
Yeah, man, I respect privacy. And all but it kinda hurts that you aren't willing to trust us. He tries to be as delicate as he can when broaching the topic after the boy's locker room conversation but voices his own opinion on the matter. Once again, the bi-colored boy in the back of the bus shocks everyone by chiming in. Could you be the secret love child of All Might and you don't want to reveal your relation by displaying a similar strength quirk? That's oddly specific. Yuraka blinks a few times as she processes the boy's theory. Todoroki has a point though. Hanta snaps his fingers as though the conspiracy has just been cracked before pointing towards Izuku for confirmation. Dude, are your parents pro-heroes? Uh, no, sorry to get anybody's hopes up. Izuku quickly shakes his head to debunk the hypothesis and glances at everyone apologetically when he sees some of them becoming sullen with disappointment. What then? Are they villains? The boy with a lightning streak in his blonde hair crosses his arms as he leans back and jokingly presents his own proposition. When he sees Izuku's reaction, he uncrosses them and leans forward. Oh my god. Are they? No, no, they're not. Izuku immediately denies the boy's claim but recoils when he realizes that he may have done so too forcefully. He sees some of his class aren't convinced by his hasty response. I met his mom. Kayoka frowns at the students shying away from Izuku and defends him as best as she can. She's super sweet, so. She's not a villain Izuku casts her a sidelong grateful glance. Mina swivels her head from the girl on her one side to the boy on her other to ask. What about your dad, Midori? Izuku shifts uncomfortably as he nervously scratches the back of his head. He works overseas, so I hardly get to see him. He looks down at his feet to avoid making eye contact with his class, worried that they won't believe him. I bet his dad's a villain. The same blonde from before mutters in a not-so-quiet whisper. The ball-headed boy he normally hangs around with nods in agreement. Izuku closes his eyes, having expected that kind of response. Kayoka frowns, hearing them loud and clear thanks to her quirk. When the bus bounces over a speed bump, she shoots one of her jacks out to jab the blonde in the neck. Whoops, missed my charging port. She feigns the attack as an accident while pumping her heartbeat into the boy in order to give him a shock. Once the class gets the message loud and clear, she returns to her seat. Look everyone, maybe we should talk about something else. No need. But Aizawa stops the class discussion when he stands up from the front of the transportation vehicle. The bus comes to a stop as he announces their arrival. We're here. Well, several students twist in their seats to look out the window and exclaim in awe. Wow, it looks like a giant dome. Aijiro marvels at the massive structure that resides at the top of a stone staircase just outside the bus. Is it an observatory? Mina excitedly hops off the bus as she examines the building's curvaceous shape for herself. Maybe it's a planetarium. The invisible girl bounces beside her while suggesting an alternative reason for the strange design. We're doing rescues in an observatory planetarium. The tailed blonde of the class deadpans as he steps in between them to get a look at the structure too. Okay, maybe not either of those. Mina scratches her head when she realizes her singular brain cell even when combined with another won't be enough to guess what's inside. You'll all see soon enough. Aizawa grumbles more so to himself as he leads his class up the steps of the tall staircase. When he pushes the doors open, he closes his eyes and wishes he could plug his ears as he prepares for the next barrage of overly excitable exclamations. Wow, maybe it's Universal Studios Japan. Uraraka makes her own guess when she sees all sorts of varying environments that look like sections of an amusement park. Aizawa sighs as he tries to correct her and explain to everyone where they're really at. No, it's the USJ it is Universal Studios Japan. But Mina's girlish squeal of joy cuts him off before he can get another word out. It's not. Aizawa's eyes snap open as she shouts for everyone to quiet down. Once the rambunctious bunch settles for occasional murmurs, he tries again. USJ stands for Unforeseen Simulation Joint. This is where you'll be simulating rescues in various unforeseen disaster scenarios. The homeroom teacher tries not to yawn as he gives his tired explanation. That's right. There's a conflagration zone for fires, a landslide zone, a flood zone, and more. I ought to know. I built this facility myself. An astronaut-themed hero climbs a staircase to join everyone at the entrance while piggybacking off of Aizawa's description of the USJ. Whoa, it's 13. To which Uraraka practically glows with delight. The brunette instantly recognizes the rescue hero. Yes, 13 will be overlooking today's trip as a special guest. Aizawa's dull tone is a sharp contrast by comparison but he still tries to wave his arm with a mild flourish anyways. 13, take it away. And away we shall go. But first, some points to make. 13 raises a gloved finger to get everybody's attention. A few students chuckle or snort at the pun. When the tip of the poised finger pops open like a bottle cap, they gasp in shock. I'm sure many of you are aware that my quirk is called Black Hole. It can suck and tear anything apart. A wispy fog edges from the brim of the opening that makes up the hero's quirk to which they are referring. 
You used it to save a ton of people from disasters. Hiroraka enthusiastically nods while raising her arms over her head to be called on should the hero ask them about their quirk. Indeed, 13 gives the girl a single nod of acknowledgement, but takes a serious tone that sobers Hiroraka quickly. However, 13's head swivels to look at everyone. My power can easily kill. Izuku sees his own reflection in the hero's black face visor. I've no doubt there are some of you here with similar abilities. In our superpowered society, the use of quirks is heavily restricted and monitored. It may seem that system is a stable one, but we must never forget that it takes one wrong move with an uncontrollable quirk for someone to die. Izuku listens intently as the hero's words resonate with his beating heart. During Aizawa's physical fitness test, you came to learn of your hidden capabilities and potential. 13 seems to be looking directly at him now. Through All Might's battle training, you discovered the danger your quirks can pose to each other, and Izuku understands why he was allowed to attend this lesson even after his mistakes. Combining those lessons, this session will teach you how to properly regulate your power to save lives. Bravo. Amazing. It all comes full circle, as expected of you. They, Tenya claps with exaggerated movements as he looks around at his peers to get them to join in his applause. I'm not finished yet. But 13 makes him realize his mistake and he ceases the praise abruptly. My apologies. Tenya bows at the waist to hide his fierce blush of embarrassment. A few snickers and giggles surround him. Your powers are not meant to inflict harm. Izuku finds himself staring into the blank space of 13's face mask once again. I hope that you leave here today with the understanding that your quirks are meant to help people and not hurt them. Then, Izuku's eyes are drawn to a whirling vortex of ornate purple, the dense fog flickering and licking at the turbulent air. It's a gateway to danger, and the danger is coming through. At the center of the USJ, the water fountain stops working. So do the lights lining the roof. Every bulb bursts and blows out as the power stops functioning. Get behind me. Aizawa notices now that there's a major shift in the atmosphere and jumps in front of his class with reckless abandon. A pair of yellow goggles cover his eyes as he unfurrows the capture cloth that he usually keeps wrapped around his neck. Izuku and the others see why their teacher is suddenly so defensive when a collection of other costumed people begins pouring in through the winding vortex. It's a gateway reminiscent to a black hole, as ironic as 13's quirk disclosure had been when comparing the two. What the heck is that? More robots like the entrance exam. Ijiro squints his eyes as he tries to get a look at the people coming through the warp gate. Is that class 1B? Mina looks at Ibarra in the hopes that they're being joined by the other hero students. When Ibarra shakes her head, face paling, the pinkette skin tone loses color too. Nobody move. Those are real villains. Aizawa grits his teeth together as he watches the endless march of enemies entering the facility. Wave after wave, the amount of opponents piles up until the hero students are outnumbered. Below, the crowd of villains part as three figures stride out of the portal. First, a slender young man with silvery blue hair, his baggy black articles of clothing clipped tight in clenched hands that seem to hang off and perch across his body. Two of those severed limbs are clasped around his neck like a noose, and one looks almost like a gas mask as it reads his mouth in the purple fog. To his back, a massive form strides out with heavy stomps of large feet, hunched over as it looms around him, black-skinned and clawed hands, with a beak jaw that peeks out from beneath an exposed brain. Across its arms and back, deep gashes and scars are embedded into its skin. None of those valleys of the dark canyon are stitched, stretched apart to show raw muscle fiber. The violet mist that makes up the portal swirls together to form a strange man-shaped silhouette with a layered metal collar. His body is nothing but flickering smoke and shadow, with two gaslight eyes that peer around. As the three villains come to a stop, the leader who's wreathed in severed hands, glances up and around. Even this far away, Kyoka can hear the leader's voice without issue, and judging from the shifting of Izuku's head, he can make it out too. Around them, the class is panicking and shouting about how this isn't possible. But those who can hear the villains are far more focused on the threat at hand. Hum, I was expecting All Might would be here. What a shame. The villain leader hums as he scratches the underside of his neck with a casual yet unsettling demeanor. Aizawa and Thirteen whisper something between one another, hero to hero. Likely, it has to do with strategy. It could also have to do with the intruder during the media leak on school grounds being one and the same as the villain group's leader down below. Try both of those but as well as the true discussion they are having revolving around All Might's absence too. When the villain leader says, maybe some dead kids will bring All Might running, Aizawa snaps his attention back to them. 13. Get them out of here. He leaps into the fray without a second to spare. 13 springs into action too. Heading for the doors to help the class escape as instructed. But they don't get very far. Everything happens so fast. One second, they're running for the exit. The next, they're cut off by a wall of darkness. The purple void is the same as the portal that had allowed the villains to invade the facility. 
Greetings. A chillingly calm tone sweeps over the class the same as the villain's bulked body's shadow. As a representative of the League of Villains, it is my duty to scatter you and request you scream loud enough for All Might to hear. No. 13 is unable to stop the villain from teleporting the hero students in separated groups through their own personalized warp gate. There's no air that pushes against Izuku's face. He's not falling. He's merely suspended in place. The darkness pulls in, swallowing him whole, and there's nothing he can do to stop it as he hovers in what feels like a severe storm cloud. He knows that the entry to this vacuity has closed behind him. Yet, what's in front of him and below him is nothing better. He looks down and sees a deep dark abyss that's staring back. The darkness reaches out for Izuku, its hands trying to wrap around him so that he can be pulled down, it's fighting its own stubbornness of keeping him motionless. The void is beckoning for him to drop. Izuku falls out and lands in a pile of what would be soft sand if not for the small sharp pebbles scattered in it. He's in a construction zone. However, he's not alone. Kayoka and Momo land on either side of him, followed by Ibarra from Class 1B. The girls don't notice him until he notices there are villains here just like there was at the plaza of the building. Jiru, Izuku glances back only momentarily. He whips his head in the direction of sinister cackles. Villains surround them, not allowing him to take his eyes off the opponents. Looks like we've hit the jackpot boys. A serpent-skinned villain runs a slim tongue along his scaly lips. I call dibs on the petite one. Izuku's heart thumps heavily in his chest. This isn't like the times Bakugo and the others dragged him to their usual spot to beat on him. This kind of scum wants to have their way with Kayoka and the other girls. Izuku grabs a handful of his shirt, the clump of material bunched up in his fist. When he pulls, the buttons holding his shirt together pop off. His other hand snatches the cord that's let loose. Surrounded by villains, he has no other choice but to tug on it. Izuku snarls a warning as he stretches the line. Jiru, cover your ears. Then comes the roar. Snowflakes drifting through frigid air sting Izuku's freckled rosy cheeks. Each icy speck a bitter bite when it sticks to his skin. The young boy tugs at the snood scarf wrapped tightly around his neck, pulling the brim just a tad higher to warm his bottom jaw. His mother bundled him up in layers of wintry clothing to protect him against the cold environment while he goes out to play but the cheap material of his coat isn't lined with enough fur to do the trick. Izuku shivers as his feet sink into the frosty floor below him, boots making the ice crunch. Snow rests upon the smooth surface of a park bench, making for a natural feather cushion. That same sheeting covers the playground too. Izuku blinks, batting frost from his eyelashes, before looking around. Tree branches have lost their leaves, brittle bark creaking as wind shakes snow from the renovated foundation. Chain-linked swings sway in the breeze despite being iced over. Slide tubes whistle through their vacant tunnels. More snowflakes drift down to lay atop everything, gradually adding another inch of the white powder. Suddenly, the small specks make way for a collection of them, the compacted shape of a ball whizzing through the air. It bursts open on impact with Izuku's face, showering crystalline fragments as the ice returns to a semi-liquid form. The boy sputters as the snow gets in his mouth and up his nose, forcing him to rub at his face to clear away the residue. He hears a girl's joyous laughter coming from the direction from which the snowball had been thrown. When he peels back his eyes to look at the culprit, he sees the blonde that had lent him her shoes not too long ago. Toga, Izuku whines with a pout over being pelted by a cheap shot. He had somehow not noticed her presence until now, allowing her to get in a good sneak attack. Now though, he can see the girl is bundled in her own winter coat with a bright red scarf draped around her neck. That's not fair. I wasn't ready. Izuku crosses his arms over his chest with a huff that creates a cloud of condensation. Lowering his guard proves to be a mistake. The lack of free arms or hands to defend himself leaving the boy vulnerable. Izuku is wide open for another snowball that nails him in the forehead this time. He flails backwards with a startled shout waving his arms out in front of him to deflect much too late. A mild mark of red glows from where the boy had been struck, snow specking the surrounding area. The girl across the way grins, flashing her pointed teeth. She tosses a spare snowball up and down, catching it each time in one hand. The other hand rests on her hip. I told you to call me Himiko, Izukun. The blonde blushes at the same time as the green-headed boy when she refers to him by her personally chosen nickname for him. Izuku fights the urge to sniffle. He's not sure whether he's catching a cold or if he's having a hard time keeping his emotions in check. The only other nickname he'd been referred to as was Deku, and that had been more of a way to taunt him. To be on a first-name basis with someone who refers to him affectionately, and a girl no less, the boy is at a loss. Izuku panics and reacts by throwing those thoughts away, not sure how to deal with them. He tosses them in the form of a snowball, scooped and hastily crafted to be made on short notice. It's a small projectile compared to the ones Himiko had created. The molding isn't very firm and the boy's throw is pretty weak. So, Izuku's snowball breaks apart midair, missing its mark by several feet. The spray of particles return to packed flakes on the ground. Izuku stands still, 
wide-eyed in reaction to his own stunt, arm kept completely extended. He has trouble processing his attempt at a retaliation just as much as he finds it difficult to process his failure. Himiko is just as surprised, gaze flicking between the boy and the snow on the ground. Her mouth is agape, teeth parted as she exhales in disbelief. He should see it coming this time. He should try to dodge or shield himself. But, Izuku gets pelted in the face yet again. This time by the spare snowball Himiko had kept on reserve. The boy staggers back, unbalanced as he's knocked out of his stiff state of freezer. The red spot on his forehead had made for a perfect target, swelling even brighter now that it has been struck twice. Izuku nearly trips over himself running for cover to avoid any additional fire. Just like that, the snowball fight has officially begun. Himiko hides behind the lower end of a seesaw, ducking down. Izuku does a little hop and then spins himself on a merry-go-round to throw off the girl's aim. He slides to use a thick tree trunk as a shield when the playground equipment completes its rotation. Three snowballs burst on impact with the bark. Izuku digs into the thick frost to begin sculpting his own ammunition. He combs the snow with his fingers until it becomes packed enough to fit in his palm. Compacting the ice into a variety of balls eventually gives him a small supply to work with. Then, he returns fire. His throws have a better range to them this time, even if they don't quite make their mark. Himeko crosses the terrain for a better covering where the jungle gym is as he misses each shot. A laugh escapes the boy's throat when one of his snowballs grazes the blonde's shoulder. He hasn't had this much fun in a long time. When Himeko invited him to play, he wasn't sure what to expect after all the years of playing heroes and villains, but this is a lot better. This is just two friends battling on even terms. Neither keeps track of who hits who anymore as they keep chucking snowballs at one another. It doesn't matter. There's no need to keep score since neither of them is trying to win anymore. There's no losing so long as they have fun. The two chase each other around the playground in a fit of giggles and childish screams. Izuku stumbles to his hands and knees when they climb a hill. He tries to scoop up some snow to craft another snowball while he's down. But the coldness has deep chilled his fingers to the point where they now no longer wish to bend. Izuku drops the ice like it's hot, reflexively flinching before stuffing his hands into the crooks of his armpits. Emiko pauses just as she raises a snowball over her head, ceasing fire. She sees Izuku surrender and drops the artillery before jogging over to him. The girl crouches down to her own knees once she reaches the boy. What's wrong? She looks Izuku up and down for injury before noticing the throbbing hue of red in his fingers. My hands are sea cold. Izuku shivers as he holds his stubby little appendages out in front of him. The dampness from the snow has shriveled the boy's skin. His fingers tremble as they struggle to bend and fail. Emiko's slanted stare studies the red colorization of Izuku's hands. Her gaze has a predatory glow to it. Steadily, she grabs him by the wrist to steer a hand closer to her eyes. I know a way to warm them up. Her voice is a whisper that blows delicate clouds of condensation in the wind. Even though she's done speaking, she doesn't close her mouth. Her fangs glisten as sparkly white as the snow on the ground. T2. Izuku is stunned into silence as he watches the girl guide his hand towards her mouth. He can feel the heat from her breath on the tips of his fingers, right before the gentle nibble on the nail between her teeth and his flesh. Saliva moistens his skin again but this time with warmth. Have you ever had your finger bitten? Her parted mouth speaks with a gentle tone that's barely muffled by the digit. Izuku's face begins to heat up along with his hand when Himiko's teeth sink a little deeper into his finger. It doesn't dig in enough to draw blood or hurt. It's just enough to be felt. Memorize it. The pointed fangs poke his flesh a little harder with an increase of bite force. Know it so well that even if you lost your sight, you'd recognize me by my bite. A sharp sting in his finger startles Izuku, but not enough for him to pull away completely. Himiko pricks him with a fang for a taste of his blood, the softest of puncture wounds. The boy focuses on the sensation that he's feeling with an extreme amount of awe. Though frostbitten merely seconds ago, he's suddenly relieved by a warm bite. I memorized it, Izuku says breathlessly. Seeing Himiko's hands are also uncovered by mittens or gloves, Izuku slowly reaches for them with his unoccupied hand. Her skin is soft when he touches it, as much as a cushion as the snow. Himiko gives him a curious look, shifting to surprise when he returns the favor of putting her fingers in his mouth. Though, she doesn't stop him. The boy follows her example and bites down. He does it too hard. Himiko shouts in pain and retracts her hand from his mouth when he gives her much more than a nibble. She cradles her bloodied fingers in her scarf to hide the crimson leak but the red liquid smearing Izuku's lips is completely evident in the white weather. The boy's eyes expand that they appear as though they're about to bulge out of his head when he realizes his mistake. He blushes in embarrassment while Himiko blushes across from him for a different reason. I am sorry. Izuku stammers through red-stained teeth. His hands reach forward and retract, arms uncertain of what to do with themselves. He leans forward, trying to bow apologetically from his knelt position. He winds up falling over himself, landing palms down in the snow. I am sorry. This time his apology is a desperate cry. 
When Izuku raises his head, his vision is blurred by the tears brimming his eyes. Himiko's blonde hair and red scarf are a smudged shape retreating from him. He lets out a strangled gasp that sounds more like a choked sob when he realizes that she's running away. W wait. He claws at the snow beneath him while trying to crawl after her. I'm sorry. His voice a blubbering wail. But just as suddenly she appeared in his life, she then vanishes. Her presence completely disappears as Izuku lands face first in the snow. He's left a sniveling red-faced mess of snot and tears. Dribbles of blood mixing in to taint the white frost around him. His hands pressed into the ice suddenly feel cold again. Fingers frostbitten and numb. I'm sorry. His voice shakes with the rest of his body. He's sorry that he scared her. That he bit her. That she ran away. Every apology was for a different reason. The next one, I'm sorry. A whisper only audible by the watery croak of his voice is also separate from the other apology. The quiet one that he doesn't want to admit as he swallows his sorrow is that he's sorry for liking the taste of her blood. He never saw Himiko during his childhood after that to tell her anyways. Surely, unless he were to run into her again in the future, he wouldn't even remember. An affliction of gore becomes an inflammatory illness of emotions for the three schoolgirls watching such vehement brutality. Their innards contort like a corkscrew twist in a crude yet shortcoming. Mimicry of the virulent violence that they're viewing. Travailing throws shriek into Kayoka's ear canals no matter how hard her hands are pressed on either side to cover them. Every paroxysm from the villains a sound straight from hell. Ibarra covers her mouth to contain her own scream. Though the girl's state of pale petrification is enough to silence her anyways. Momo wraps her arms around herself, feeling the moist coda. Sweat on her skin. The cold dampness sends a shiver down her spine that makes her shudder. Covered in a crimson coat of his own, consisting of rancid blood as thick and dark as tar, the transformed state of Izuku hacks at the villains that dare come too close to the whirring of his chainsaw limbs. None of the girls that he's defending will be touched by any of the severed arms and hands he removes from his enemies. The tattered and torn remains of Izuku's unbuttoned shirt sways with his wild swings as the ripcord attached to his sternum slaps his exposed chest. A collection of criminals who remain out of reach turn and flee, stumbling over their own footing as they run away with reckless abandon. Others stagger or crawl to hold on to their remaining body parts while also attempting to escape. Serrated and wetted, the teeth of Izuku's chainsaw chains continue buzzing in a dizzying sharp spin. The fangs in his malformed mouth gnash together when his gaslit glare of smoldering gold tracked to chase the villain. An elongated tongue whips out of his maw when his pointed teeth spread apart, sloshing in saliva that flies out in varying directions. The roar from Izuku's throat rivals that of his revving chainsaws. More blood spills to follow the same trajectory as the boy's spit, slapping the dirt below to dampen it a deep shade of red. Wailing continues to create tremors of sickening sound in Kayoka's ears as she tries not to scream with them. Ibarra becomes so numb that her hands fall away from her mouth to make way for a spray of vomit. Momo closes her eyes as she turns her head away, unable to watch the bloodshed any longer. More of the red liquid splatters over drippings as Izuku chops his blade-mounted arms at the villain. Soon, a slick surface pools beneath his and their feet. Criminals slip in the makeshift mud and roll in the muck. The smell of fuel burning wafts over the landscape's stench. Bodies made unconscious from blood loss are strewn across the disaster zone. Collected in piles or heaps surrounding Izuku as he lets out a blood-curdling war cry. His chest rises and falls as he breathes heavily, the dizzying spin of his blade's chain starting to slow, just as moderately measured of a movement. Kayoka uncovers her ears and shifts to blink back the horrific sight ahead of her. A new liquid, blacker than the rest, steadily slides down the motorized muzzle covering Izuku's face. Oil leaks from the corners of his lemon-lit eyes, a form of darkened tears falling. A choked sob escapes his monsterized mouth, H hold me, his desperate tone sounding defeated despite the corpses left in the wake of his battle. The boy's arms hang loosely at his sides, the limp state more lifeless than the severed limbs surrounding him. Kayoka's shoes slosh through the grime beneath her feet as she hurriedly moves towards Izuku. Despite the boy being covered in blood like a layer of fresh paint, she wraps her arms around his torso and pulls him into a hug. The girl presses her ear to his chest, right over the cord dangling at its center. She hears his unique heartbeat leveling itself out. The intense pounding from before beats a little softer as it turns gentle. Izuku leans into Kayoka's touch, chainsaws receding from their extended lengths and metallic face melting into a liquid resembling the rest surrounding them. He has a burning blush once the transformative appearance fades away and he's back to his usual recognizable self. Momo's eyelids part hesitantly to see the aftermath, a sigh of relief escaping with the breath that she had been holding in when she finds Izuku in his regular state. Beside Momo, Ibarra wipes away the vomit that had dribbled down her chin with a shaky hand. Ibarra's trembling fingers curl to make a fist, the forced pressure reducing their tremors. Her white robe has been tainted by the stains of the fallen sinners surrounding her, soaked red and dried to stick to her skin. 
She shakes like a leaf as the vines atop her head writhe with the churning of her intestines. Ibarra sheds some tears, eyes puffing up with her cheeks as she huffs in an effort not to fully sob. The devil, a weak mutter barely manages to slip through Ibarra's trembling lips. Izuku flinches, you're the devil, then fully pulls back from Kayoka's hug when Ibarra suddenly finds the strength to shout. H hey, come on now. Momo hesitantly hovers her hand over Ibarra's shoulder. She glances between the Class 1B student and her fellow classmates, uncertain of who to side with her comfort first. Midoriya saved us. Kayoka is quick to jump to Izuku's defense. A desperation oozes into her tone as she surveys the surrounding sea of blood. I, I can still hear their heartbeats, they're still alive. Her eyes flick from the bodies to Ibarra and Momo. Ibarra shakes her head, gaze still lingering on the mutilated corpses, her eyes refusing to meet Kayoka. The anguished cries for God. I still hear them. The blood-soaked girl goes back to muttering as she counters her peer with the opposing sound that still rings in her ears. Slowly, Momo lowers her hand to settle on Ibarra's shoulder. She gives the girl a gentle squeeze. I think she's just shaken is all. A tremor travels from Ibarra to Momo that makes Momo's voice tremble as she says, W we all are. I don't think any of us were expecting that. Despite the unsteady wobble in Kayoka's voice too. He was just protecting us, she remains resolute in her defense of Izuku. She chances another glance at the dismembered collection of villains by her feet. The serpent-styled one that had called dibs on her lay unconscious with his arms removed. You heard what they were saying. WH what they were gonna do. Her voice shakes even harder and she tears her gaze away. I know. Just. Momo winces when she tracks Kayoka's sight to where it had been. She closes her eyes, willing herself not to look anymore either. It doesn't appear as heroic as it seems. She draws Ibarra closer for her own sake now. It's okay. Izuku's sudden interjection makes Momo skittishly jump a little. She opens her eyes to look at the boy, reminding herself visually that he's no longer a monstrification of chainsaw. I understand how you feel. Izuku tries not to make any sudden movement that might startle her any further and Momo suddenly starts to feel guilty for slightly siding with Ibarra. Reminded of Ibarra, Momo turns her head to see the girl is still on the verge of going into shock if she hasn't already done so. Using the ability that her quirk grants her, Momo creates a blanket from her fat cells to drape over Ibarra. I'm going to stay with Shizaki, get her some place away from here, and internally shames herself further for using the girl's current condition as an excuse to distance herself from Izuku. She could probably use a change of scenery. Izuku nods in agreement. He then looks at Kayoka, you all could. Realizing that he means he'll go off on his own, Kayoka turns on her heel to face him in response. I'm not leaving you by yourself. She plants her feet once turned and places her hands on her hips. I'm willing to bet all the other zones have villains in them too. So our best bet is the plaza. Momo allows Ibarra to lean on her as they steadily begin to move forwards. They try weaving around the bodies in their way as they do so. And we're going there together, Kayoka adds with an authoritative tone. Izuku opens his mouth to retort, but thinks better of it. Neither Momo or Ibarra complain as well. All right then. Izuku sighs as he turns to follow them out of the disaster site. Let's get going. Within the plaza, their homeroom teacher is occupied still fighting off his own armada of villains. The underground hero starts with one, sweeping their legs out in a low crouch so that he can smack their head on the hard floor once they drop. Behind the slits in a yellow pair of goggles, Eraserhead's eyes burn a bright red. The villain he locks his sights on loses their quirk long enough for him to close the distance between them. Aizawa then knees the criminal three times in the gut. A burlier villain grabs a part of the fountain behind Aizawa, yanking out a chunk of the marble. The rock whizzes over the hero's head as he dives out of the way, saved only by instinctive reflex. The fountain piece strikes a support beam, bending the pole inwards as it shatters into debris. Aizawa unfurls the capture cloth wrapped around his neck whipping out the opposite ends to bind themselves around two of the villains rushing him from his left side. Using the force of the pull it takes for him to duck down and dodge a punch, he tugs on the binding line to hoist each criminal over his head so that they collide into one another. Aizawa uses his footwork to pivot and twist his body with a strong right hook to take out the burly villain next. Simultaneously, his now unwound capture cloth snags the ankle of a different opponent in the crowd. The turning motion of the hero's torso switches to go the other way pulling on the scarf to trip the villain it caught. Watching as the mob slowly gets eliminated one by one, the villain group's leader gradually grows agitated. He scratches at his neck as though there were stubble there, red eyes peering through the fingers of the dismembered hand covering his facial features. When a racer head crouches low enough to avoid being skewered by a katana and then retaliates with a kick, the villain leader decides that he's seen enough. Namu, a raspy voice gets the monstrosity with an exposed brain to cock its head to the side. That same raspy voice then gives Namu its order, hurt him, by pointing a finger at Aizawa. 
The hulking black mass of slough and marred muscle lurches to its feet. A heap of unconscious villains lay beneath it, a less than courteous courtesy of a racer head. It moves as though it's unbalanced by its own bulk, the bulging limbs too heavy for its own body. The Namu stomps on the skulls of the villains in its way, the crunch of white bone reminiscent of bloodied snow. It'd be impossible for a racer head to not hear the beast coming with every ground-quaking step it makes as an advancement towards him. The hero uses his erasure quirk, getting into a low crouch, across the plaza. From a perched position on the viewing balcony of the disaster zone he just exited, Izuku witnesses what happens next. The Namu's size is deceptive. It's fast, faster than any of the villains Aizawa was fighting earlier. It catches Aizawa in a grip that clutches the man's entire abdomen. The creature's hefty few lives up to expectations in terms of raw strength. Izuku can hear the sound of his teacher's ribcage shattering despite the distance. When Kayoka makes a horrified gasping noise from beside him, Izuku can only imagine what the bones breaking must have sounded like when amplified. Momo turns her back to the view, simultaneously shielding Ibarra from the sight before the girl can catch even a glimpse of it. Those two have seen enough, each of them reverting back to their trembling dispositions. Their eyes clamp shut, unwilling to replay a visual bloodshed, though they can still hear the awful yells coming from their teacher. They flinch with every agonized shout. Izuku grinds his teeth as he grits them together, trying not to scream too. Aizawa's limbs sling loosely as he's played with like the Namu's ragdoll, with the carelessness of a child slinging its toy around. The mindless beast roughly slams the man into the ground. Red paints the surface that slowly chips away with every grating blow. Aizawa's eyes glare defiantly, the crimson glow as bloody as the rest of him, until he's slammed into the floor face first. The cracked cement cuts his cheek open, splitting like a seam. Aizawa's jaw unhinges to one side, dangling as his mouth rips even further. That's when Izuku reaches his limit. He can't just stand by and watch anymore. His index finger loops through the hole of the handle on his sternum's pulley string. Kayoka hears the rapid beat of the boy's heart begin to create a continuous rhythm. She doesn't need to hear him say, I'm saving Sensei. Stay here with them. To know the revving is that of his chainsaws next. A red sneaker steps onto the guardrail of the balcony to use as a launching pad. When Izuku pushes off, his transformation transpires mid-leap. Wait. Kayoka's cry gets cut off by the whirring of the chain blades that burst forth. The elongated saws screech as they swing with Izuku's aerial movement. Each arm slices through the air when he begins to make his descent down into the plaza. A shrill shriek erupts from the chainsaw mounted atop the running engine in place of his head, the sharpened fangs within it bearing down with him. The hand-covered villain that had ordered the Namu to attack Aizawa raises his head, the swift motion flicking his tousled hair. When he sees the source of the caterwaul coming for him, he reacts immediately. Bladed tips brush by, every metallic tooth spinning on the edge of a long bar. The villain skids back, the heels of his shoes scraping the ground. The air between him and Izuku splits as though severed, further pushing the villain away. That same gust of wind blows away the pale strands of hair hanging over his eyes. The gaslit glow from within the dark slithers in Izuku's metal-mounted face stare back, an amber substitute for eyes burning brightly. The chainsaws attached to the boy continue their rotation, pointed tips a blur. With every intense rise and fall of Izuku's chest, the string attached at the base sways from one side to the other. The thrumming of the chainsaws shift in the direction of Aizawa and the Namu. The creature ceased its torture, awaiting orders from its boss. To the opposite side, one of the villains Aizawa hadn't dispatched takes a broad swing with a steel rod. An emission of sparks glisten across the metallic surface of Izuku's face when it connects. While his head does turn with the blow, the rest of his body remains firm. The engine thrums louder when the yellow orb eyeing the villain intensifies its glow. The chainsaws at Izuku's sides rev louder before one juts up to carve under the villain's armpit from where he holds the metal beam. The bar drops to the ground with a resounding clang per four bounces. A scream from the villain having his underarm torn into follow suit. Izuku jerks the chainsaw out from the villain and swings his other arm's bladed saw at the next one's legs, taken out at the knees. That villain falls beside the one cradling his blood oozing armpit. A mighty step forward carries Izuku's overhead swing of his next attack that cuts down the final bit of cannon fodder in his way. The leader of those grunts raises his finger to point and direct the Namu again. Namu, heard him next. That same finger curls over to scratch under the villain's jaw. Atop the entrance steps of the plaza, Kayoka runs with Momo and Ibarra to rendezvous with a handful of their classmates. The ones fortunate enough to have avoided being caught in the misty villain's warp gate let out varying sounds of relief. Though Thirteen wasn't as lucky, having been torn open from the back in a brief battle with the port ailing villain. Again, Momo has to hide the gruesome sight of a corpse from Ibarra. Even with Hanta at their hero teacher's side taping shut the wounds, it's tough to take in. Ajiro and the blonde with a lighting streak in his hair stand by the door that's now slightly ajar. Mina is closer for Kayoka to talk to. Kayoka is almost too afraid to ask. 
What happened? But she's heard a lot worse today than anything her classmate could tell her. We distracted the villain that warped you and the others away long enough for Ada to get out. He went to get help. Mina summarizes the situation on her end while pulling Kyoka into a hug. Kyoka is so used to the Pinkette being a lighthearted jokester that it's unsettling to see the girl so serious. It's even worse when Kyoka can hear the tremble in Mina's voice that simultaneously felt through their hug. The blonde boy beside Ijiro ventures away from the door into the base of the stairwell towards the plaza. Then that villain turned on his boss all of a sudden. He points in the direction of where Aizawa had been ravaged by the Namo. When Kyoka peels back from Mina's embrace to follow the finger's aim, she recognizes the macabre of chainsaws below. That's not a villain, idiot. That's Midoriya. She tries and fails to keep the feelings of agitation out of her tone when she corrects the blonde boy. Mina turns her head to follow the line of trajectory next, raising her hands to her mouth to muffle her gasp when she sees what the two are talking about. That's Midoriya. Her voice shakes more than it did when Kyoka had rendezvoused with her. Ijiro sidles up next to the pinkette, openly gawking at Izuku's chainsaw state. Holy shit. He lets out a breathless whisper that sounds just as odd as he appears. Behind the redhead, Hanta stands up to get a look at Izuku for himself. The grim expression he had while patching up 13 somehow deepens its intensity. Yeah, his voice sounds as distant as he is from the drop off of the staircase when he repeats what Ijiro said. Holy shit. The metallic teeth brimming the chain constantly looping itself around the bar protruding from Izuku's right arm begin to sink. They bury themselves deeper and deeper into Stygian flesh. An explosive burst of blood a shade darker than any ordinary red splatters in response to the entry of the spinning blade. Izuku continues sawing with his arm bar, willing it to dig deeper as he grinds his arm back and forth. A hulking monstrosity called Namu doesn't flinch. It doesn't even release a semblance of sound to indicate any sort of pain. Izuku yanks the chainsaw free when he sees the creature winding up for an attack of its own. The beast moves with a cumbersome exaggeration that it didn't show when grabbing Aizawa. Izuku seizes that difference in speed to make it bleed as much as he can. The boy's left arm swings upwards so that the chainsaw protruding from it can carve itself into the Namu's abdominal region. The muscle fibers there pulsate as though they're flexing in response to the foreign entry. Again, the Namu reaches for Izuku, unbothered by the stabbing, realizing the Namu can't possibly be human to remain unfazed. Izuku begins sliding the chainsaw across its stomach rather than pulling back. He forgets about restraint, mercilessly twisting the cutting motion so that it rips apart the creature's innards. When Izuku does tear his chainsaw free, a spillage of intestines comes with it. He staggers back, surprised by his own ferocity. Except, the Namu follows those steps with heavy stomps of its own. Still, the lab creation remains unfazed, even after literally having its guts spilled. A massive hand grabs one of Izuku's forearms, the buzzing blade slicing its palm seemingly doing nothing to loosen its hold. The boy is then lifted off of his feet, hoisted into the air as though he's weightless. He gasps when he sees from his aerial view that the Namu's gut has begun reclosing. The monster has a regeneration factor to replace its removal of pain receptors, a dangerously deadly trade-off. Izuku lashes out with his free arm, no longer caring what detrimental damage he does to the beast if that damage won't last forever to be detrimental enough. That arm gets caught in the Namu's grip too, snatched by its other hand. Rip his arms off. Izuku can hear the satisfied smirk in the villain leader's tone. In his peripheral vision, he can see Aizawa using his erasure quirk on the Namu in a vain attempt to prevent the order from being carried out. Izuku tries reaching the creature's exposed brain with the chainsaw mounted to his own head, but falls short by too many inches. His feet dangle in the air from his suspended spot above the ground. Looking down at them, he remembers those are appendages that exist too. With all of the exertion that he can muster, Izuku raises his leg as high as it can go to perform an axe kick. His calf tears itself open, splitting down the middle. A chainsaw shreds its way out of Izuku's leg and embeds itself into the base of the Namu's skull. Brain matter splatters every which way as it's grinded up. Finally, the Namu makes a sound. An awful ear-piercing one too. The grip on Izuku's arms slackens. He twists them so that the chainsaws cut at the creature's fingers, severing the digits from its hands. Izuku hits the ground hard, landing on his ass. Black stubs topple to the floor with him. Namu, the villain leader cries out for his wounded science experiment. The creature hears its master but doesn't have the brain capacity to respond with an organ that's hardly intact. It staggers while grasping at its head with fingerless hands, helpless and pathetic as it nearly trips over itself. A wisp of purple smoke spirals until it creates a cloud. The foggy specter then shapes itself into the villain that had introduced himself to the class earlier. Izuku recognizes him as the one that can create portals. Tamura Shigaraki. I'm afraid we underestimated Yue's golden eggs. The villain addresses his superior as though the turning of tides is a minor inconvenience. Yellow slithers narrow as they meet yellow orbs. The villain gauges Izuku while reporting. One of the students managed to escape. 
Tamura turns towards his comrade with a glare that would kill if it could. Kirijiri, I'd turn you to dust if you weren't my only ticket out of here. The leader of the Fallen League claws at his neck while complaining in a lower tone. Useless. All of you are unreliable. Shall I suggest a tactical retreat? Kirijiri maintains his stoic demeanor despite the threats from his agitated boss. Though Izuku can tell the villain is nervous by the way the smoke wafting from his body fidgets like an open flame. Suddenly, the doors to the USJ that had been opened by just a crack completely fly off their hinges. They're completely blown away, sailing over the plaza, one of which lands beside Izuku. The other crashes into the remains of the center fountain. All heads turn towards the sudden arrival of a presence that can be felt by sheer proximity. None other than All Might, the number one hero in the symbol of peace, stands in the doorway. He sees the kids by the entrance first, all of them crowding around Thirteen's body. The smile he usually has vanishes, have no fear students, especially when he shifts his gaze to the scene within the plaza. All Might rips away the tie around his neck as he announces his arrival, I am here. Tamura stops scratching his neck, chipped fingernails lifting along with his chapped lips as they pull into a smile. No, he gestures with his raised hands towards the Namu as it regenerates its brain and faces All Might. It looks like we'll be getting a continue. The boy's soul bleeds translucent tears, as thick as the snot coursing out his nose, hot like blood but desaturated. His eye streams touch his trembling lips. A sour taste saltier than copper bites his mouth. Reflexively, the boy curls his lips inward so that he runs his tongue along the sore spot, feeling the fresh scar of his busted lip from where his father had hit him. His sobbing increases when the sting intensifies. He pulls the corgi in his arms close to his chest, the dogs for a warm and fuzzy feeling against his heart. Mon, he whines in symphony with his pet. The hug does nothing to soothe the organs itching though. His hands clench as his fingers curl over with a tightening hold, desperate to scratch but still clinging onto the animal for a desperate ulterior solution to gain comfort. I can't take it. The boy hiccups as he strains his voice that's become equally scratchy. He wants to reach for his neck but relents, still longing for his dog's affection to solve the problem instead. I hate. You hear me, Mon? I hate. The corgi tries wriggling itself out of the hug when the boy's nails begin to dig in. I hate everyone. Feeling the dog's resistance, the boy sinks his nails deeper to keep it still. Gripping the corgi with fingers like claws, his hatred carries over into his hold. In that moment, the boy wishes that everyone would just turn to dust and blow away in the wind. His sister who betrayed him. His father who hit him for it and threw him outside. His dog for not even wanting to give up a simple hug. He wants them all gone. All semblance of love rots and decays in seconds. The boy's hands become a destructive catalyst for his hatred. Anything he touches gets destroyed. Mon rapidly decomposes, flesh corroding as fur falls out. The dog crumbles to ash. He stares down at his shaking hands, stained with blood and twitching to scratch at the itch now that he no longer has his pet to hug. His arms wrap themselves over his shoulder and across his abdomen to scratch his back. A self-given hug that gives him more pain than pleasure. His unclipped nails cut and tear into him but still the itch remains. From that day forward, the boy stops relying on others to comfort his skin condition with a soothing touch and starts scraping at it instead. That boy later finds himself presented with a new dog. Not a gift from the abusive father that he killed moments after Mon the Corgi, but the man that had taken him and beyond that point. The boy took that man's name, Shigaraki, and left his old life behind to decompose in the ground. Yet, the orange mutt with a chainsaw poking out of its head reminds the boy too much of Mon that his past life haunts him. He hates it. The dog attempts to clamber up onto his mattress to sleep with him. He punts it off the bed, kicking the mutt so that it sails across the room and lands on the other end. It yelps and then whimpers, annoying the young Shigaraki further. Stay the fuck away from me, he hisses in contempt. It curls itself up in the corner that it inhabits and stays there after that. Satisfied for the time being, the boy lays down and closes his eyes to fall asleep. That night, like every night, he has a nightmare about the awakening of his quirk. He recalls killing his family. The way each and every one of them deteriorated flashes through his mind. He remembers the way Mon died best though. Up close and personal. The touch. The channeling of his anger. Shigaraki snaps awake, eyes flicking open as he shoots forwards. His skin crawls head to toe like his mattress is infested with bed bugs. When he sees the dumb orange mud on his futon with him, he considers that it could be flea infested. If his mind itching more than his body weren't enough to annoy him, the dog pushes him to his limit. It disobeyed and came to curl up next to him in his bed. It hadn't learned its lesson. Shigaraki kicks it off his mattress a second time. This time much rougher than the first. What did I tell you? His hands pause in the air when they reach for the dog. They stop short and he moves them to scratch at his neck instead. The dumb dog cries in pain, retreating to the corner it had been in before. He figures the mutt probably just wants him to feed it. He's supposed to give it kibble and pour water in a bowl but he turns over and covers himself with his blanket instead. He leaves that sort of caretaking for Kirijiri to handle. 
If the dog dies of neglect, he doesn't care. But the annoying whimpers all night long keep him up. He can't go to sleep no matter how much he tosses and turns or tells it to shut up. Shigaraki tosses his covers off and jumps to his feet. Despite his age, he towers over the dog, completely casting it under his shadow. It's smaller than Mon was, though the breed is lost to him. He considers dusting it but then worries his new guardian might be upset with him if he were to do so. If he lets it out of his room, it might scratch against the door to be let back in, and that'd be as equally aggravating. If he lets it out, Shigaraki chews the mended scar on his bottom lip, carefully, with his pinky raised so he doesn't accidentally eradicate the door. He turns its knob to let the dog out of his room first, follow me, and then he heads for the front of the building where Kirajiri usually tends a bar. It's vacant at this hour with zero patrons, allowing for him to be rid of his pest without being caught. When he opens the next door, a much larger metallic one with a screech instead of a squeak that leads into an alley rather than a decorative hallway, the dog looks back at him. What are you waiting for? Go. Shigaraki shoos the animal away with an aggressive wave of his hand. It flinches but doesn't budge. Shigaraki looks back to make sure nobody is watching before forcing it out with a kick. I said go. The dog shies away, just short of getting shoved but still lands outside. Shigaraki scoffs and slams the door to the bar shut. He leaves the dog outside by itself. He breathes in the same breath of condensation that he had let out, that vapor vanishing among flickering wafts of steam generated by the warmth of his body. Crystallization with a diamond glow stretches across in a vast expanse ahead of him, a dazzling sparkling community of dancing lights born to reflect sunlight glimmering on each jagged end of a curvaceously spired frozen landscape. The spiked terrain of ice had been a large body of water, the remainants of his form having been soaked completely evaporated now. The combination of cold and heat that the boy regulates keeps him focused on the sudden use of those quirks and not the other occupants of his surrounding. Todoroki, over here. So the hero student has to blink back his initial surprise at the sudden realization that he's not alone upon hearing his name being called. His heterochromic eyes shift from the ship that he's on to the ice-sheeted surface below. Within the flood zone of the facility, it seems almost uncanny to be aboard what may as well be the Titanic in a self-imposed iceberg setting. The greenette at the bottom waving her arms to be seen is easier to spot in that sense. With a single wave of his arm, he expels another flash-frozen creation of sloped ice. This structure is slicker than the sharp twists at the bottom so that he slides down it like a ramp. Once he reaches the end, he performs a graceful leap and lands beside his classmate. Upon closer inspection, the girl appears to be uncomfortable. The greenette is shaking uncontrollably. Todoroki raises a brow as he inquires, Are you injured? She shakes her head, no, but wraps her arms around her shivering frame to say, I'm just not good in the cold. I should be fine once we reach the shore though her eyelids droop so low that Drowsy doesn't even begin to describe her disposition. Todoroki frowns when he realizes the effect of the ice aspect of the power bestowed to him can only be counteracted by the hot part of his body. I'll keep you warm. He switches sides so that the greenette can be next to the part of him she needs to stay awake. The heat radiating from his body immediately relieves her vulnerable condition, her slouched demeanor shifting to stand upright. Let's go. Todoroki leads the way to the shore and leaves villains frozen below the footsteps he leaves in his way. Meanwhile, the footfalls of Yuraraka slap puddles, every uptake of water splashing her ankles. The rest of her is just as drenched, caught in the simulated monsoon of the downpour zone, trying to keep up behind the brunette with legs that have a much shorter reach as a classmate that made the odd uniform choice to wear a diaper. Ahead of them both is the bird-headed boy whose shadow somehow goes even a step further than that. The mass of darkness swats villains aside to clear their path. Where the heck is everybody else? Diaper boy wails like the baby he appears to be as a villain gets tossed over him. When Yuraka glances over her shoulder, she sees that the lines of water trimming her classmate's mask are from tears and not the rain. I'm sure they just got separated into other disaster sites like us. She tries to sound assuring but there's a grim undertone that doesn't allow either of them to forget their surroundings. We need to reach the atrium. I'm sure that's where everybody will go to meet up. Another villain rolls across the ground, making the hero students hop to avoid getting tripped up. I hope you're right. The boy's lip quivers with the urge to whine and complain some more but keeps it at that. Yeah, me too. Yoraka's whisper is just as silent and heavy as the raindrops that descend upon her. Only the raven-faced boy hears her, his hum at an equally low decibel. A cacophony of spinning steel cycling through thick layers of flesh erupts within the facility's plaza. Savage swings from the revving chainsaws mounted to Izuku's arms release a resin into the air before the blood is calcified. The bladed teeth on his left bar extension skate off the Namu's chest and leave another laceration. Slowly, the thick hide mends itself with more muscle tissue. A secondary swipe leaves a gouge across the Namu's torso to replace the first Izuku created. This one coming from his right chainsaw arm. The brain he had torn into earlier has also repaired itself. Though Izuku remembers how long that took and the state of disarray the creature had been left in. 
One eye pops out with a splurt of blood when he chops down on its head. The Namu screeches, lashing out with a swipe of its heavy hand. Izuku is caught across the chest, the beast's bare knuckles battering him hard. The force makes the boy hiss in pain as he's sent bouncing and rolling along the concrete floor. His eyes blink, the darkness shifting every time that he closes them. What he does see through blurry vision swirls and shakes like he's still tumbling across the ground. Izuku shifts to stagger himself upright, each breath exaggerated as he tries to regain his equilibrium. The cord that usually dangles from his chest is stuck in place by the blood that's been caked there. His legs wobble and he nearly falls backward. But then, he's braced by an arm as thick as the Namus. All might. Izuku looks up at his idol and nearly loses consciousness. He's not sure whether he's about to faint from excitement or exhaustion. But when Izuku sees his homeroom teacher's battered body in the hero's other arm, he fights to remain awake. Young Midoriya, can you take Aizawa away from here and evacuate with the other students? All Might's words barely register to Izuku despite the hero's booming voice. When Izuku realizes that Aizawa is being handed over to him, only then does he process the order disguised as a request. He's about to protest with his arms extended but then sees the absence of chainsaw. They can retract. He mumbles his revelation more so to himself as Aizawa is transferred over into his open arms. When Izuku hears his own voice and not the modified filter that comes from a motorized mouth, he puts two and two together and figures he must have reverted back to his regular form. It now makes sense to him why All Might was able to recognize him, and why he's now feeling the pain from his battle with the Namu. What's a hero versus villain battle without a little collateral damage? All Might. The villain covered in hands spreads his own like some sort of gentlemanly gesture before using one to snap his fingers. Namu. In a flash of light, followed by the crack of what sounds like thunder, the Namu and All Might are clashing with one another. Only after Izuku is knocked to the ground with his homeroom teacher does he realize the air force was caused by a sonic boom. The hero is locked in a wrestling match with the bioengineered monster. All Might presses with all his weight, giving it his all in an effort to tackle the larger black-skinned villain, grunting as the massive figure barely steps back. All Might's fist lands dead center with a solid smack against the Namu's chest. But again, the beast doesn't budge. Only the darkened flesh of its torso dents inwards from the impact, seemingly like a leather or rubber coating of skin. All Might drives another fist into the same spot, doubling up on the damage. But still, the monster's abs don't cave in like they should. All Might barely has the time to raise an eyebrow before a clawed hand reaches for his face. Izuku tries pulling Aizawa away when another shockwave ripples through the air. The amount of times that he's knocked down is more than countable on two hands. The boy resorts to practically dragging his teacher's body. But even that becomes a challenge when the ground shifts with cracks. The floor starts to give and sink in when the wrestling goliaths slam one another into it. Kirajiri and Shigaraki have a difficult time standing straight from all the uptakes of wind as well. The Namu absorbs the shock of every strike from its combatant. Every blow bounces off its regenerative flesh, and each of those punches thrown gradually grow weaker as All Might burns through his energy. The Namu roars, charging forwards to meet All Might in another clash. The two become locked together, fighting for dominance. All Might's hands grip tight to the creature's knuckles as it presses into him. The larger beast leans further forwards to apply more crushing force to the symbol of peace. All Might groans through grating teeth as he begins to feel the stress of being overwhelmed. His muscles tense and quiver under the intense strain. Inch by inch, the creature pushes to its advantage. There's a wince from the hero as he staggers just a step. But then he's sliding back, gasping for air while steam slowly drifts off his form. All Might pushes back with his own show of strength, finally overpowering the monster and throwing it off of himself. Witnessing the number one hero take a knee, Shigaraki begins to cackle with elated glee. So the rumors are true. You've gotten weaker. He then starts to clap at the performance his Namu is giving him by pushing All Might's limit. We created the anti-symbol of peace just for you, after all. When Izuku gasps, there's a gust of condensation in the air. The temperature drops. A spread of ice rises. Half of the Namu's body is completely encased by the attack from Todoroki. He and the Greenette he's with standing by the equally frozen bay of water behind him. You came here to kill All Might. Trash like you could never. He shifts his heterochromic gaze from the villains to Izuku and his teacher. His eyes widen when he sees the state that they're in. Midoriya. Sensei. The frog girl bounds to them with two hops. She takes Aizawa from Izuku while looking them both over, concern written all over her usually expressionless face. Rats. Shigaraki growls with animosity as he stares them all down. His glare only breaks away when the ice trapping his pet science project shatters. The cause of the smash comes from the living shadow protruding from the raven-headed hero student of class 1A. They just keep coming. Yuraka and the shortest of their peers arrive as well. Although, how? The bird-headed boy gasps through his beak in shock when he sees his attack on the Namu didn't disable it as planned. Instead, the monster begins to regrow the lost portion of its body. 
pink fleshy fibers stitch themselves together in a grotesque tentacle-like twist until the hyper-regenerative process is complete. Doesn't matter. Namu will kill them all. Shigaraki grins behind his facial covering while the others blanch in horror. The beast responds once it's finished recovering by charging towards the children. But All Might intercepts it before it can make contact. No restraint whatsoever. Truly, you're the pinnacle of evil. He grits out his frustration through grunts of effort as the monster uses its full strength to oppose him. Very well then. I won't hold back either. The hero pushes past the pressure and inflicts his own on his enemy with all that he has left in him. A series of blows to the monster's abdomen are followed by an uppercut and a jab to its head. Every punch is barely perceptible, only conceived as existing by the quick blurs of every grating strike and the Namus recoil from them. There's a power behind every attack much greater than before that drives the beast back. Wind channels as it's pounded it like a punching bag, each shockwave gathering more and more pressure. Plus Ultra, All Might goes beyond his limit while shouting the hero school's motto and delivers his final most fatal blow to the Namu. All of the Air Force gathered releases in that crucial punch and blows the monster away with a tornado's power. The Namu gets blasted through the ceiling and breaks a cloud as it launches into the atmosphere. At that same time, the ground that had been weakened with every blast of pressure as well also loses its hold. Every crack expands and the surface crumbles into a mixture of rubble and debris. Izuku slides down a cement slab that sinks inwards with the rest of the collapsing floor. Midoriya, the greenette girl that had taken Aizawa from him tries lassoing him with her elongated tongue but he falls too far out of reach. An updraft of dust and smoke creates a cloud of thick brown and gray. Izuku chokes on what he inhales, trying to wave it away with one hand while covering his mouth with the other. He finds himself at the bottom of a sinkhole once the dust settles and clears. Sewer pipes protrude from uprooted dirt and gravel, spilling murky liquid. Across the way, he spots the villain that had been covered in hands trying to reattach some that fell off during his own fall down. When the villain turns his hate-filled gaze towards Izuku and also notices that he isn't alone, each of them hurry to gain their footing. Izuku grasps the cord attached to his sternum and frees it from the patch of dried-up blood that's glued it to his chest. The sputtering startup almost makes him pull on it again, but the sudden flare of searing pain in his forehead stops him. His vision splotches red and his face is slick with wet liquid that is in his sweat. Izuku chokes out an agonized gasp and wipes at his eyes with the back of his hand. When his palm nicks the brim of a razor-tipped chainsaw blade, he realizes that his transformation was only partially done. The sharpened bar protruding from his skull sticks only halfway out and the usually motorized muzzle that accompanies it provides no metallic facial shell. Not to mention there's a lack of chainsaws running on his arms. Izuku rationalizes that he's lost too much blood to be able to fully transform since his chainsaws run on blood instead of gasoline. Still, there's a villain in front of him. Izuku raises his arms and makes fists. He holds a stance that's neither defensive or offensive since he lacks the combat training needed to tell the difference. And still, the villain makes no move for him. Rather, Shigaraki tilts his head to the side and he gauges Izuku. He raises his finger, pointing as he tries to place his touch. Say, your power looks familiar, boy. The appearance reminds Shigaraki of a similar sight. Izuku falters from moving forward, backpedaling instead. Slowly, one of his fists unravel and he places his hand over the string attached to his heart. The cord feels like a live wire, pulsating with a sort of charge that gives him what may as well be an electric shock. It aches. I had a pet named Pachita. Izuku notes the way that the villain's eyes narrow at that bit of information. I can't ever hug or hold him again. The villain's stare lingers, something in the red of the gaze burning brighter than his hatred. Izuku curls his fingers over what used to be Pachita's tail, clinging to it with a reclosed fist. But he's right here inside of me. Shigaraki's lips turn over into a sneer, his tongue running over the scar striking through the top and bottom of them. That means Pachita is dead, doesn't it? The villain's response sounds more like a statement than a question. The tone suggests that Izuku doesn't answer, at least, Shigaraki continues. That there in my heart shit is a pathetic consolation, his hand hovering over his chest. He then bends down and picks up a chunk of rock with that same hand. All five of his fingers touch the small bit of rubble and it begins to decay, the dead have no life. A swirl of the shadows behind Shigaraki suddenly creates the recognizable warp gate of Kirijiri. Izuku has half the thought to stop the villain from backing into it, but thinks better of himself in his current condition. As Shigaraki slowly slinks into the portal, but don't worry, you'll see Pachita again one day soon. He gives a few parting words. Then, the warp gate closes. A moment passes where Izuku holds his breath, wary of whether or not he's truly been left alone. Then, he gives out. His legs stop holding him upright and his hands fall to his sides. In a slouched disposition, he releases a heavy sigh of relief. The thick atmosphere suddenly feels not as dense. It's more breathable now. The ache in his chest gradually begins to fade. The sound of a shoe scraping gravel makes him tense up again. He turns to follow the noise but loses his balance and falls over so that he has to prop himself up on one elbow. 
It's the error he made of showing his weakness currently that makes him worry that he's about to be exploited by another villain. But instead, he finds himself staring up at an equally fatigued individual. Huh, you're the guy I bumped into on my first day. Izuku recognizes the sickly skeletal figure as the gaunt blonde who had helped him find his class when first coming to Yue. He momentarily wonders what the man could possibly be doing there before coming to a conclusion. Izuku's eyes widen in shock before he pushes himself upright and forces his body to get up. You must have been a part of the reason for the break-in. You're with the villains, aren't you? He accuses the strange person while raising his fists again in case he has to fight. The blonde's sunken eyes widen too, along with a gaping mouth. He raises his own hands but holds them up palm open, waving both rapidly. No, 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 you've got it all wrong. His pointed chin touches his chest when he lowers his head in a further effort to show his submissiveness. I'm no threat. Izuku eyes the man warily, sizing him up. The blonde's appearance seems decrepit. However, looks can be deceiving. What the hell are you doing here then? He presses for an alternative reasoning instead of trusting the stranger just yet. The blonde draws back, his expression a grimace. His squirming in place is suspicious, especially with the way he keeps casting glances over his shoulder. But eventually, the man recides with a sigh, agreeing to explain his presence. Take a closer look at me, young Midoriya. What am I wearing? The question puzzles Izuku at first but then he recognizes the colorful torn fabric hanging off of the man's frail form. All might. Izuku can't contain his reaction when he discovers the identity of the seemingly puny person he had first met in the halls of Yua. Whatever expression he has on his face must match the tone of his voice judging by the deflated hero's wince that, shortly followed by a timid nod of confirmation. I'll explain everything later, I promise. All Might lowers his thin arms, the limbs noticeably absent of any muscle whatsoever that Izuku wonders if there's any meat to the bones at all. But I need a favor from you, young man. Please, don't tell anyone about my true form. Please. Izuku's green gaze meets the righteous blue of the hero he had always idolized as a kid and he suddenly sees the vulnerable humanity in them that he never had before. Izuku is suddenly aware of how hard each of his heartbeats are. The heavy thumps make the string attached to his sternum sway ever so slightly. The chainsaw in his head begins to recede as he nods. He knows what it's like wanting to keep that same type of secret. If All Might isn't ready for the world to know about his true form yet, then Izuku won't let it be exposed by villains like his had been. Don't worry, Izuku offers All Might an assuring smile, your secret is safe with me. A silken surface brushes against Izuku's fingertips, starting with his thumb and pinky. All five digits fold and his hand grasps at an empty space, still somnolent. The boy sluggishly stirs in his bed with a groggy groan before reaching for the spot beside him again. Izuku's hand passes through air a second time before slapping the sheets. Though soft, there isn't the usual fuzz that he's familiar with. His eyes blink open, and though bleary, he has a visual confirmation. But Cheetah is missing. Izuku springs up straight, his mattress straining under the sudden movement. The fogginess clears from his head and his eyes. Now fully awake, the boy scours the room with his gaze for his dog, double-checking his bed. When he doesn't catch even a glimpse of orange, he tosses the All Might-themed blankets that cover him onto the floor and darts from his bed. He fumbles with the doorknob only momentarily before throwing it open and sprinting down the hall. Mom, Mom, Izuku calls for his mother as he stumbles over his own stubby legs. He finds Inko in the kitchen cooking breakfast for him. She greets him with a smile but the expression quickly evaporates when she sees the face her son is making. But Cheetah is missing. Izuku explains his state of panic before she can even ask. Inko glances over her son's shoulder, half expecting the dog to be there despite his exclamation. When her eyes shift back downwards and land on Izuku's watery ones, she bends down to console him. Oh dear, let's not panic. I'm sure he didn't go very far. She tries soothing him by running a hand through his green curls but the young boy is already sniffling. Do you think he ran away? What if a villain got him? There's no holding back the waterworks and Inko has to hold him close so that he can dry his tears on her apron. She shushes him assuredly and rocks him side to side like she would when he was an infant to calm him down. When his whines revert back to snivels, she lets him have some space to breathe. Pachita loves you too much to run away, and he's got that chainsaw of his to fend off villains. And Ko's words must do the trick since Izuku nods along with that line of reasoning. She stands up to grab the phone off the wall and dials Mitsuki's number. I'll ask the neighbors if they saw anything and we'll walk around to see if he wandered off. And Ko already starts formulating a plan to find the family pet and prevent a relapse of her son's sobbing. We can then print flyers if Pachita still doesn't turn up. Oh okay, Izuku wipes away the tears streaming down his freckled cheeks before puffing them up and getting a determined glint in his glossy gaze. I'll get us started then. Before Inko can even respond, he's flying into the backyard to begin his search. Shut the fuck up, brat. Inko jumps when the line clicks and she hears Mitsuki screaming at the top of her lungs. Faintly, Katsuki shouts something back that doesn't quite reach the phone. You're lucky I didn't get an abortion. 
The yelling match continues for a bit before Mitsuki suddenly switches her tone to be as polite as possible. Hi Inko. I saw your caller ID. How's Izuku? Inko sweat drops before wiping the side of her forehead with the back of her hand. He's doing well. Sorta. There's a pause in her speech pattern when the boy hurriedly flies past her to search the living room. You haven't happened to see Pachito round, have you? That stray you took in. Can't say I have. There's a rustle of movement before Mitsuki adds. Let me ask Masaru and Katsuki. Inko patiently waits as she listens to the short interaction between wife and husband before wincing when it comes to the son's turn. Oi, shithead. Have you seen Izuku's mutt? Mitsuki and Katsuki exchange some rude words before she shifts back to Inko and says, Sorry but it doesn't look like anyone saw him. Th that's fine. Izuku and I are going to have a look around the neighborhood but please let us know if Pachita turns up at your house somehow. Inko sighs and shakes her head when Izuku pops his head in to check for an update on the phone call. Izuku pouts a little but doesn't cry. He goes back to searching the house. Of course, Inko. We'll be on the lookout. Mitsuki's assurance puts a small smile on Inko's face before she hangs up the phone. Though just a glimmer, there's some hope that her friend can help. She repeats that rise and fall of faith with each phone call that she makes after that. Nobody saw him. Izuku squeaks with disappointment when his mother reports the progress she made. Tears threaten to spill again but he holds them back as best as he can. He's a small dog. That makes him easy to go unnoticed. Inko does her best to rationalize the situation for her son while making sure that she has all the right content she needs in her purse in order to go out. But now everyone knows to keep an eye out. Izuku remembers the time that his mom dressed up as a pirate for Halloween and let him try on her eye patch. Without both of his eyes, Pachita was very difficult to keep track of. The small dog would weave between his legs and trip him up. Comparing that memory with now, he can understand her reasoning. And plus we're gonna look for him. He adds, that's right, Inko nods with a smile. She slides her arms into the sleeves of her coat before helping Izuku with his. I'm sure he'll come running if he hears us calling his name. Except, that doesn't happen. The two search the entire neighborhood for the whole day, retracing their steps a few times just to be sure. They call Pachita's name but he doesn't come running like Inko thought he would. Izuku becomes discouraged and starts sobbing. Eventually, he cries himself out and Inko has to carry him home. When she lays Izuku down in his bed, he absentmindedly grasps at the air during his slumber. Inko realizes that her son is reaching for his lost dog and has to fight back her own tears. My poor boy. She contemplates giving him a pillow to fill the void but knows that he'd probably notice the difference and wake up. All she can do for him is let him sleep and hope that Pachita turns up in the morning. Suddenly, Inko hears a whimper. For a moment, she worries that it's her son. But then she feels something soft brushing against her ankles and looks down. There, crawling out from underneath the bed, is Pachita. The short dog's eyes wobble and she can tell that the animal has been crying too. This whole time, Pachita was at home hiding and waiting for them to get back. You goofballs. Inko chokes back a laugh. She helps the dog up onto the bed so that it can curl up with her son. The boy and his pet worried one another sick over nothing. What am I gonna do with you two? She keeps her voice low to a whisper so that she doesn't wake them up. The two cuddle and Izuku's face forms a smile when he's able to wrap his arms around Pachita. The rapid beating of Izuku's panicked heart settles into a mellow tune when he feels Pachita's warmth against his chest. 